Marrying the Beast. Written by Bree Livingston. Copyright 2023. Chapter 1. With a slight turn to the mirror, Isabeau Daniels glanced once more at her reflection. Sunlight glinted off the corner, making it look as if she had a yellow ball of light pinned in her strawberry blonde hair. This skirt makes me look, I don't know. The light blue blouse complemented the heather gray skirt, and she had to admit, it did show off her legs. Which was something she'd avoided the last eight months. Showing off anything was too scary. Izzy, you look fine. This job will be good for you, and it'll give you peace of mind to know you're working behind a huge fence with a gated entrance, her best friend, Kelsey Harris, said. The bed where she perched squeaked as she shifted from bracing with one hand to the other. What if he gets out? What if they can't hold him again? It's happened before. Kelsey's eyebrows drew together, and she gave Izzy the same sad look as she had the last five months since Izzy had moved in with her in Dallas. This time is different. He's going away for good. Isn't that what the DA told you? They've got solid proof this time. Izzy's hand moved to the scar hidden behind her button-up blouse. He did, but Stephen has a great lawyer. Pushing off the bed, Kelsey stood behind Izzy, her lithe frame filling the rest of the small over-the-door mirror. I'm not trying to push you before you're ready, goodness knows I'm not, but this man has taken too much from you for too long. She smoothed the shoulders of Izzy's blouse and smiled. I want to see you full of life again. You are one of the kindest, most loving people I know, but, you're just a shell now. Isabeau turned to Kelsey as tears pooled in her eyes. I know. It's just hard. Kelsey pulled her into a hug. I know, Izzy, but think of this as starting small. The only way to move past what happened is to stand up and walk. You just have to make it through today. Not tomorrow or the next. Just today. One foot in front of the other. Just one step. That was easy to say when a monster wasn't hiding under your bed, in the shadows, and behind every door you opened. But Izzy also knew she was right. She couldn't keep giving Stephen power over her. All it took was one step and then another, that's what she used to tell her physical therapy patients before her license expired. I know. Izzy pulled back. I can do this, and you're right. What better job than cleaning a mansion behind a gated stone fence? Exactly. Kelsey smiled. Thank you for letting me stay here. Well, of course, and you're welcome to stay as long as you like. I enjoy having you around. Kelsey laughed, and while she tried to hide the strain in her voice, Izzy could hear it. The kind of sound that said her friend was getting tired of dealing with her basket case best friend and sharing her apartment, even though she'd flatly deny it. Five months was long enough to live with someone, even if she had no choice. When Stephen attacked her, he'd left her hospitalized and needing help just to walk to the bathroom. Leaving Oregon and moving in with Kelsey in Texas was supposed to be temporary. As soon as Izzy was back on her feet, she was supposed to have moved out. Izzy needed to get this job so she could bring in a paycheck and find her own place before Kelsey decided she'd worn out her welcome. Her gaze drifted to the clock on her nightstand. Oh. I need to go. It's nine, and my interview is in thirty minutes. She pulled away and took another glance at herself in the mirror. You're going to knock their socks off. Would you like me to check the car with you? I think I can do it. It'll be fine. Kelsey narrowed her eyes. You know what? I think I left something in my car, so why don't I just walk down with you? Okay. Izzy smiled, appreciating her friend's kindness. They walked out of the apartment, took the elevator down, and stepped off. For a split second, Izzy froze as little beads of sweat lined her forehead. Are you okay? Izzy nodded. Yeah, it's just that first step that gets me. It'll get better. You're already so much stronger than you were just a few weeks ago. Thanks. 
Izzy wiped her brow with the back of her hand and continued on. When they reached her little black Volkswagen Beetle, she checked the car. I can do this. I really can, she said, even as the little voice in the back of her mind screamed run and hide, but she wasn't going to let that voice win today. Now that her savings were depleted, she had to do something to help pay for the apartment, utilities, and groceries. He's really locked up this time, huh? Izzy asked, more to herself than looking for an answer. With a smile, Kelsey nodded. He's really locked up this time. No more bail, second chances, or any of that. He nearly killed you, and there were witnesses. He's not getting out. Taking a deep breath, Izzy slipped into the driver's seat. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks for everything. I don't know what I would have done if you... Kelsey touched her shoulder. I love you, Isabeau Daniels, and you would have done the same for me. I would. Izzy smiled and nodded. Okay, wish me luck. Her friend shot her two thumbs up, and Izzy shut the car door and turned on the engine. As she pulled out of the underground parking garage, she took one last look in the rearview mirror and then focused her gaze on the road in front of her. It felt so strange to be on her own after so long, but it also felt empowering. Stephen Welch was in prison. She could come and go as she pleased, without worry or fear that he'd jump out at any second. His hold on her life was done, and she was done cowering. Thirty minutes outside of Dallas, she pulled up to the keyed gate entry to the Masters' estate. Now that Izzy was seeing it in person, it looked more like a castle with its two-story stone exterior with turrets on all four corners. It was larger than any home she'd ever seen before. She rolled down her window and touched the call button on the keypad. Ah, uh, hello? My name is Isabeau Daniels. I have an interview today with Rowan Masters. Another one of the reasons she'd felt comfortable taking the job was that Rowan Masters was an attorney with an excellent reputation. No one ever saw him, but everything she'd read online about him pointed to a good man. After a minute, a male voice filtered out. Proceed through the gate. Park to the south of the Doublewood doors. I'll be there to greet you when you arrive. Okay, she said as the heavy iron gate rolled open just enough for her car to fit through. As directed, she drove the quarter-mile driveway, parked where she was told, and approached the door. It was summer, and the warm mid-July breeze kissed her skin. A short, portly man stood with his hands clasped in front of him. His gray hair was thick and combed back, and he wore dark slacks with a white dress shirt and a sports coat. He looked like a butler, but she didn't think he stuck his pinky out when he drank tea. Ms. Daniels? he asked. Yes. He smiled and held the door open for her. Come this way. It was a little dark, but given that, it was okay. There was enough light streaming through the windows that as long as she didn't have to work too late, she'd be fine. It didn't smell moldy, musty or dank, just, largely unused. And the silence made her ears ring. Is Mr. Masters the only one who lives here? she asked. And is it always this quiet? Yes, he lives alone, and he likes it quiet while he works. Okay. I guess it's a good thing there aren't a lot of rugs to vacuum. She smiled. The man cut his gaze to her. Very true. He stopped and took her hand, shaking it. I apologize for my manners. It's been a while since we hired someone new. I'm Ulysses Masters. Rowan is my nephew. Do me a favor and please use my first name. He smiled. She got the impression he was a sweet man, and she returned his smile. Thank you. Will you be interviewing me? No, ma'am. Mr. Masters will be doing that, but I do need to warn you. Izzy's heart skipped a beat. Warn her? Her thoughts immediately went to Stephen. About? Twelve years ago, my nephew was involved in a car accident which left him scarred. 
He can be incredibly sensitive, so please try not to stare. Oh, she felt horrible, thinking the man might be like Stephen. Oh, well, I think I can handle that. As a physical therapist, she'd seen many accident victims. Her heart went out to them, and after her own ordeal, she understood them even better. Ulysses stopped in front of a large door and paused. He was almost 17 when it happened, and since then, he's become, shall we say, less than hospitable at times. He's a good man with a kind heart and gentle soul, but years of interaction with certain people have left him withdrawn and hurt. I understand that, she said softly. The man eyed her a moment and then knocked on the door. Come, a voice barked. And make it quick. Ulysses opened the door and let her enter first. Izzy's gaze roamed the exquisite room. Dark wood, shelves from floor to ceiling filled with books of all kinds with a ladder, like something out of a movie, and muted colors that gave it a warm feel. It felt powerful and welcoming at the same time. Rowan, the new hire is here for her interview. The cleaning position, remember? Ulysses asked, ushering Izzy to a seat in front of the desk. The man's lips curled into a frown, or what Izzy could see of them. With the curtains drawn and the way the lighting in the room was set up, three-quarters of the man was hidden in shadows. She could partially make out that he had a strong jaw and dark wavy hair that touched his broad shoulders and hit the left side of his face, and he was impeccably dressed in gray linen slacks and a tailor-made dress shirt. Right, he said and swore under his breath. I forgot it was today. She'll have to come back tomorrow. Ulysses smiled and walked to him. It has been put off long enough. The house needs to be cleaned. I hate this. I hate change. Can we trust her? Did you do a background check as I asked? After the last few, I don't want to take any chances. Izzy watched the exchange like a tennis match. They were talking about her as though she wasn't even there. And she knew they saw her. Mr. Masters looked right at her. Still, she needed the job, so she'd sit quietly while they verbally duped it out. Ulysses nodded. Yes, but instead of using just a background check, I think this time you need to stretch yourself and get to know someone. A background check doesn't tell you everything. Boy, did she know that. Stephen Welch was a prominent Portland lawyer. He was from a good family. When the police got involved, nothing about his past had screamed danger. Mr. Masters groaned. Why must you push me like this? Because your father asked me to. The younger man turned away, but Izzy could feel the mood shift. Sorrow filled the room, and tension as well. Do you approve of her? He asked as he turned and leveled his gaze at Izzy. Her first thought was that if his bite was anywhere close to his bark, he would leave teeth marks. But as she watched him, she realized he was hurting, and she understood that. What she really wished was that he'd step into the light so she could really see him, but having been hurt herself, she could understand his reluctance to allow himself to be vulnerable to someone he didn't know. Ulysses nodded. Why, yes, I wouldn't have asked her in for an interview if I didn't. Mr. Masters nodded. Fine, then she's hired. Now, leave me alone. I have documents that need drafted and delivered before five. But, you really should interview. With a wave of his hand, he stopped Ulysses from speaking. She's hired. Give her a gate code and her hours. Keep her out of here and off the east wing of the second floor. He turned and busied himself with something behind him. Ulysses looked defeated as he sighed. All right. He walked back to Izzy. Come this way. Let me take you on a tour and get you started. No interview? I got the job? Izzy asked as she stood. Yes, you've got the job. Relief of something finally fulfilled washed over Izzy, and she touched her fingers to her mouth. As she turned to leave, she paused and looked over her shoulder. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Masters ignored her as he continued with his work. He was gruff, but he didn't come across as scary, just hurt. She'd certainly dealt with worse while being a physical therapist, and being ignored was nothing she couldn't handle. Ulysses shook his head. Let me give you a tour of the house, the gate code, and introduce you to Retta. They walked out of the office, and Izzy felt accomplished, like she'd walked a runway and not tripped. Stephen had stolen so much of what made her, her, but she'd taken the first step to collect the pieces and put herself back together. Chapter 2 A knock came at the door, and Rowan kept his gaze on the file he was reading. Come. The door slowly opened, and the clattering of a cup jerked his attention from the file in front of him. His heart picked up speed as the woman Ulysses had hired almost two weeks ago walked in with a tray. What are you doing in here? Where's Retta? He didn't mean for his tone to come out so harsh, but change often threw him, and the result was usually him yelling. And this change, he'd been completely underprepared for it. Retta said you might be hungry and that I should bring you lunch. She was in the middle of, she stopped mid-sentence, hurried to the coffee table, and set down the tray. Enjoy your lunch, she said and rushed to the door. Wait, Rowan clipped. The woman stopped, keeping her back to him and her hand on the doorknob. Yes, sir? Her voice was delicate and musical. Can I help you with something? She slowly turned and faced him, hands flattened against her thighs. He tilted his head as he studied her, making sure he stayed in the shadows to keep her from becoming even more frightened than she already seemed. I apologize for the harshness in my tone. I don't, changes, I don't like it, especially when I'm not prepared for it. Her lips curved into a small smile, and it was so bright it was as if he'd thrown open the curtains in his office. I understand that. She cast her gaze to the floor and curled her fingers in her t-shirt, clearly still nervous. I don't like unexpected things either. They make me jumpy. Yes, jumpy. That's a good word for it. He stepped a little farther from the safety of the shadows. Have you liked working here? Not that he cared. Well, he did care, but mostly, he wanted to keep her talking. To keep her standing there. Something had changed about her since he'd last seen her. He didn't remember feeling so much joy pouring off of her. Then again, he had tried not to pay attention to her then. Rowan was certain she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. So petite with strawberry blonde hair, freckles that blanketed her cheeks, and the most incredible green eyes. And he had zero chance with her. Even without his scars, she was well out of his league. Either way, it didn't matter. No woman in their right mind would want him. Actually, I've loved it. I feel safe here. Such a strange answer. He was even more curious about her now. Do you not feel safe elsewhere? Izzy, no, not Izzy. It wasn't befitting her. Isabeau caught her bottom lip between her teeth. I, I just like that you have a nice home, and it's quiet. That's all I meant. She'd hedged the question, which amped his curiosity even higher. He again stepped farther from the shadows, a fish being pulled out of the dark ocean depths by a hook. It was built by my father. Oh, well, it's incredible, but this room is just, well, I can see a lot of thought went into it. It's lovely. She lifted her head, and her jaw dropped. It was then that he realized he'd stepped too far into the light. She'd seen his face, the scars, the mangled flesh. Why had he done that? Anger burned in him. He pinched his lips together and balled his fist. She'd be no different from any of the rest. Go ahead. Run screaming from the room. I'll just hire someone else. For a moment, she stood there, a puzzled look spreading across her features. Why would I run screaming, she asked. My face. I know what it looks like. 
I have mirrors, and I'm not a vampire, he growled as he put his back to her. Light laughter filled the office, and he whirled around. What's so funny? She took three steps forward, and those amazing green eyes found his. That's, well, that's just ridiculous. It's not. I'm hideous. Do you know how many times I've been called a monster? His voice rose an octave. Just go. Isabeau continued to hold his gaze. I've seen monsters, and none of them look like you. I doubt that, he grumbled. This time she smiled in such a way that his lungs felt squeezed of all their air. It would be statistically impossible for two monsters to be in the same place at the same time. What would you know? He barked the question. She turned, walked to the door, and set her hand on the knob again. Glancing over her shoulder, she said, your scars might be visible, but they aren't the only type of scars. Just because you can't see mine doesn't mean I don't have any. With that, she walked out and shut the door. For a moment, Rowan gaped after her. That had never happened before. What did she mean that he couldn't see her scars? Hadn't Ulysses run a background check on her? Surely he would have told Rowan if there was anything. She was probably just putting on a brave front so she didn't lose her job. He crossed the room and flopped down on the couch, throwing himself against the back and slouching down as his thoughts wandered. What was it with people who tried to pretend they understood? A beautiful woman like Isabeau couldn't possibly know what it was like nor have any inkling of the cruelty he'd faced since his car accident some twelve years ago. Just the thought made his skin burn and his scars itch. He touched his melted ear and ran his hand down the leathery skin of his neck. He could barely handle looking at his own reflection. No, there was no way she could ever understand him or what he'd been through. He eyed the food on the coffee table, grumbled, and then pushed off the couch and went back to his desk. He'd eat later, if at all. At the moment, his most pressing issue was his father's will and the provision that called for marriage in order to keep his home. His 30th birthday was in two weeks, and if he wasn't married prior to it, he'd be forced to sell the home his father had designed and built just before Rowan's mother passed away. Two weeks to find a woman willing to look at him long enough to say I do. A woman mentally capable enough of agreeing, whose marriage to him would stand up in court. It was laughable. Rowan's father, Jared Masters, was a brilliant lawyer, but there had to be a way out of getting married. After all, wasn't it Rowan's happiness they were so concerned with? Well, he was happy. Marginally. Okay, so not at all. He was miserable, but he couldn't force someone to fall in love with him, especially not in two weeks. He set his elbow on the desk and put his head in his hand, turning his attention back to his father's will. Hours later, long after dark, he still sat hunched over his father's will and still felt just as trapped as ever. Ulysses walked into his office. Rowan, we need to talk. I'm not talking right now. I'm busy. We need to discuss what will happen to the estate in two weeks. His uncle took a seat across from him and crossed his ankle over his knee. Rowan exhaled heavily and lifted his gaze. I know. I need to marry, or I'll be forced to sell. I've been poring over the will, looking for a loophole. There is no loophole, son. Your father drafted that will personally. He was the finest lawyer I've ever known. Why do you think you're so good at it? It's in your genes. Ulysses smiled. You were his brother and partner. Why did you let him do this to me? Rowan stood and raked his hand through his hair. You say you care about me, but forcing me to marry? That's not caring for me. Ulysses sighed. He wanted you to find love. The accident doesn't define who you are. It only reshaped your skin. Not who you were on the inside. Even as a teenager, you were special. You have a kind heart and a generous soul. No woman in their right mind would ever consider marrying me. Never. 
Rowan slammed his fist onto the desk and swore. Ulysses remained seated and calm, letting Rowan deliver his outbursts as though they were nothing. Are you finished with your temper tantrum? No, Rowan said and dropped down onto his seat. If I throw myself on the floor and scream, will you do away with this stupid provision? I can't lose this house. I don't, I can't live anywhere else. His uncle crossed his arms over his chest. Then what do you want to do? What can I do? I'm trapped. There are less than two weeks. Who could I find in that short of time who's crazy enough to actually marry me? Even if I hadn't been in an accident, it would be difficult. But look at me. I'm, I'm not worth having. He leaned back in his chair. No one is going to want me or even pretend to want me. They sat in companionable silence as if playing chess and studying the board, looking for their next move. His uncle sucked in a sharp breath. The maid we just hired. The what? Is a Beau Daniels. We could ask her. A marriage of convenience. It's been done all throughout history. We offer her money and a place to live in exchange for marrying you and staying married for a year. Once the year is up, you both go your separate ways. Of course. Rowan nearly swallowed his tongue. Is a bow? He wasn't delusional enough to think she'd even consider it and add the embarrassment of asking her. It was too much. Have you lost your mind? I don't know that woman. And today she acted as if she knew what it was like to be disfigured when she's quite possibly the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Was there something in her background check that you failed to bring to my attention? Ulysses shook his head. All her check returned was that she was 28 as of a month ago, used to be a physical therapist, and she's from Oregon. That's it. Physical therapist to maid? Something didn't add up. I knew she couldn't understand. I knew it. So, if she isn't a possibility and you have no desire to marry, then we need to plan on clearing the home and selling it. Two weeks isn't much time. Rowan pinched the bridge of his nose. Uncle, please. Please help me. His uncle set his foot on the floor and leaned forward, his face full of soft pleading. I am loving you the best way I know how, and so was your father. Jared knew you couldn't spend the rest of your life alone. Yes, son, you have a horrible scar marring your face and body, but that is not all that you are. He knew, just like I do, that you can't stay like this. Hidden away from the world like you have the plague. I may as well. What will it be, Rowan? If we're selling the house, we need to schedule someone who can sell off most of the furniture and antiques, and we'll need time to find you somewhere to live. I can't move, he whispered as a lump formed in his throat. I can't. Then should I ask her, or will you? Rowan spun the chair around, putting his back to his uncle. It had been a long time since he'd let his emotions get the best of him, but this rock in a hard place was more like falling down a hole one that had spikes at the bottom. He could almost see the incredulous look on Isobo's face as his uncle asked. Hear her laughter as she rejected the offer. There was no amount of money printed that would propel her into such an arrangement. Just the thought of rejection buried a knife in his heart. We'll both be there, Rowan finally said. He'd stand in the room and witness her reaction. You'll be in there when I speak to her? Yes. If she says no, I'll make the arrangements to take care of the house. If you wouldn't mind, please begin the search for a new home. His voice broke. Make sure it's far out of town and gated. I'll take nothing, so you'll need to find furniture as well. You won't take anything? The shock in his uncle's voice nearly made him turn around. Rowan shook his head. I don't want to be reminded of it. If it's gone, it's gone. Better a clean break than trying to move on while pieces of the old place float around in the new home. He turned to face his uncle. But. 
Rowan held up his hand and caught his uncle's gaze. It was either marry or move. I'm obeying the will. If you wanted my joy, you should have included that in the provisions as well. He stood and walked to the door. If you don't mind, I'm going to bed. When would you like me to ask her? Are there any special requests you want in the contract? It doesn't matter what I want. Do what needs to be done and tell me when to show up. Rowan. Without another word, Rowan walked out of his office and took the steps to his room two at a time. He felt like a man on death row. All he needed was a last meal and a prayer. Except the prayer would be wasted. Everything he'd ever known was going away, and he felt hopeless. Chapter 3 As Izzy dusted the large wooden buffets in the dining room, she let her thoughts wander over the last two weeks. Cleaning Rowan Master's mansion was the best thing to happen to her in a while. Granted, she wasn't working as a physical therapist and she wasn't making much money, but she felt better than she had since the whole ordeal with Stephen started. She loved Retta, the woman who cooked for Mr. Masters. She'd been his nanny when he was a toddler, and the Masters had found a way to keep her on because of how much she and Mr. Masters loved each other. It was sweet, and she could see why he loved her. Izzy enjoyed their lunchtime talks. The only thing that made her sad was that she was cleaning instead of helping people. She loved being a physical therapist. People would come to her with the light gone out of their eyes, and she'd work to help them find it again. By the time their course of treatment was over, there was a spring in their step and a belief that their new normal wasn't so horrible. Still, something about being at the Masters' estate made her feel like a whole new person. Getting out of the apartment and going to work every day had given her something she didn't know she was missing. It felt as if her cup had been righted and was being filled. The joy she used to feel had returned, and it seemed crazy that it had only taken two weeks of dusting knickknacks. Part of her wished she could see Mr. Masters more. He looked so, sad and lost. Of course, she couldn't imagine living with the scars he had, because, unlike her, he couldn't hide his, but he had to know that wasn't the measure of his worth. The day before when she'd brought lunch to him and he'd stepped into the light, she couldn't believe he'd actually expected her to run from him. Sure, the left side of his face and neck were covered with scars, but she'd been too mesmerized by his eyes, so dark and soulful, to really care about that. Plus, he was so fit, with broad shoulders that tapered to a slim waist. How could anyone see him and only focus on his scars? And truth be told, she thought he was good-looking, which was a big deal for her. Since Stephen, she'd kept her head down and made sure she didn't make eye contact with anyone of the opposite sex. But Mr. Masters? For some reason, it felt as though his soul was speaking to hers. That their scars were different, but the impact was much the same. Suddenly, Izzy felt the presence of someone in the room, and her breath caught. Her thoughts immediately went to Stephen. Wait, no, he was in jail. He couldn't be in the room. But, he'd been in jail before. No, the house was safe and secure. But she'd felt safe before. In her mind, she knew the truth, but those fears bubbled to the surface. She whirled around, bounced off a body, and screamed as she fell back. Isabeau, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you, Mr. Masters said, his voice so deep and soothing. She curled her legs under her and touched her shaky fingers to her lips as her heart fluttered. She tried to catch her breath. I, 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 it's okay. Here, let me help you up, but don't look at my face. He held his hand out to her. I just need a moment. She tried to put strength in her voice but failed. I'm sorry. Mr. Masters squatted beside her. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I just, she fought to hold back tears. It was so stupid. There was no reason to be so scared all the time, especially when she knew Stephen couldn't get to her. And she'd just been thinking she was doing so much better. When was she ever going to be free? I'm okay. You're very sweet to ask. 
Uh, well, uh, I was coming to ask if you'd mind stepping into my office for a bit before you leave work today. Ulysses and I need to speak with you. She jerked her gaze to his. Oh, you're firing me. Please don't. I love coming here. He seemed taken aback with her outburst, and she felt pathetic. There were other jobs, and if anything, the past two weeks had shown her she was stronger than she'd given herself credit for. If she lost this job, she could find another, but she would miss it. No, I'm not firing you. He kept the scarred side of his face from her. Not at all. Thank goodness. Relief washed over her, and she threw her arms around his neck and said, Oh, thank you. You don't know what this job means to me, Mr. Masters. When she realized what she'd done, she jerked back. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Her cheeks burned. What was she thinking? If she didn't get herself back together soon, she'd be booking a one-way ticket to Misfit Island. I didn't mean to do that. It's okay. The side of his lips that she could see turned up. And please, call me Rowan. I'm so embarrassed. I promise I don't go around indiscriminately hugging people. He laughed, and it was better than a hug. The warm, sultry sound of it lit a swarm of butterflies in her stomach. I don't suspect you do. She so wanted to tell him what a great laugh he had, but she'd already made a fool of herself. That would just be the cherry on top. Pushing off the floor, her legs wobbled. She bumped into him, and he wrapped his large hands around her arms to steady her. I think I'm determined to humiliate myself today. She pulled free and hugged herself. Oh, well, then you'd have competition, I assure you. He smiled. Izzy laughed and tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. You're very kind, but I doubt that. Yes, well, you'd be wrong. Uh, if you'll follow me, we'll go ahead to my office. Oh, sure. They walked out of the cavernous dining room and into the darkened hall, and it felt like a mile before they reached his office. Ulysses was already there and sitting on the couch with a stack of papers in front of him on the coffee table. Rowan shut the door and motioned for her to take a seat in the same chair she'd sat in before. As she sat down, he strode to the curtained window behind his desk and put his back to the room. Miss Daniels, Rowan and I have somewhat of an unusual request. Izzy's eyebrows furrowed. What kind of request? Taking a deep breath, Ulysses glanced at Rowan a second and then returned his gaze to hers. Before Rowan's father died five years ago, he put a provision in his will that stated Rowan must marry by the time he's thirty or he has to sell the house, this house. She blinked as she tried to wrap her mind around what the man had said. I'm sorry. What? Ulysses sagged. Ms. Daniels. Izzy. She corrected him. Izzy, if Rowan doesn't marry within the next two weeks, he'll be forced to sell this home. It's the only home he's ever known. As you can tell, he's not much for socializing, so finding a wife has been difficult. What we're asking you is, the man sighed and will to the little more. Rowan turned partially. I would like to know if you will marry me so that I may keep my home. This will only be a marriage on paper. A marriage of convenience, so to speak. Nothing marital will be expected of you at all and it would only be for a year. Just long enough to fulfill the requirements to keep my home. Surely, she'd heard wrong. He couldn't possibly be saying what she thought he was saying. Marry you? He hung his head as he turned to the curtain again. Yes, he whispered before speaking normally again. It's not ideal for you, I know, but in exchange, I'm offering you a place to live and a million dollars. And while you live here, your needs will be taken care of, clothing, food, entertainment, anything you could think of. A mill, that was a lot of dollars. Rowan continued. I wouldn't ask, but as you can see, I've run out of time. She had no idea what to think. 
Maybe her time as a physical therapist had shaped her view on beauty. He was scarred but certainly not unattractive. At least, not to her. Surely he'd had opportunities with women in the past. His circle of friends couldn't all be that shallow, could they? People could be cruel, but there had to have been at least someone who saw beyond the scars on his face. Of course, we'll give you time to think about it. That is, if you are willing to think about it, Ulysses said. We know it's a tall order involving a lot of thought and deliberation. Your job is secure, even if you say no, Rowan added, still facing the window. I want you to know that. So, make your decision, knowing there will be no repercussions. Only, I'll be moving in the coming weeks, so you'd have a few days off, paid of course. She sat quietly as the conversation sank in. Marriage? A contract? All the money? It was a lot to consider. Rowan turned to his uncle. I told you this was a crazy idea. No one in their right mind will agree to this. Izzy moved to the edge of the chair. No, I'm not, it is a lot to take in. I'm not saying no, but I do need to think about it. When would you need my answer? She heard a slight gasp from Rowan, but if he was thinking anything, he kept it to himself. Ulysses blinked a few times like he was shocked. Uh, well, as soon as you have one. The sooner the better would be ideal so we can make the arrangements. He picked up the thick stack of papers in front of him and handed them to her. This is the contract. It gives all the details and expectations. Read it over as you consider our proposal. Okay, wow, this is a lot, but I'll read them and give you my answer as soon as I can. She stood. I promise I won't take too long. I can't imagine the stress you're under. Rowan turned his head slightly. Thank you, he said and paused. Why don't you take tomorrow off? That way, you have time to consider it where you're most comfortable. His voice was so somber and resigned. What would Rowan say if she told him she felt most comfortable at his home? She'd never felt drawn to someone as much as she did Rowan. Of course, part of it was her crazy need to fix the wounded, but there was also a part of her that felt a kinship with him. He also gave her butterflies, and it had been a long time since she'd felt that way about anyone. What would it be like to get to know him? All right, I will. Ulysses pushed off the couch and shook her hand. Izzy, thank you for considering it. We appreciate it. Sure, she said as glanced at Rowan, who stood with his shoulders sagging and his head hung down. His sadness tugged at her heart. She understood all too well the feeling of hopelessness. She left the office and walked to her car, setting the papers on the passenger seat. The entire drive to the apartment had her in a mental debate worthy of a tennis championship. Saying no would break Rowan's heart and force him to move, but maybe it would be good for him. Then again, it was the home his father had built. A place he felt safe and secure, and she understood the need to feel that, more so than anyone. On top of that, Izzy thought of her own needs. The need to move out of Kelsey's apartment. With a million dollars, she could have her pick of places to live when the year was over. She chuckled. There was no way she could accept a million dollars from Rowan Masters. It felt loathsome thinking about it. Maybe she could have them donate the money to a women's shelter. That had a great ring to it, and it was definitely something Izzy could get behind. At the apartment, she changed into some comfortable clothes and settled on the couch with a cup of hot tea and the contract balanced on her knees. It was detailed with clauses about where she'd stay, what was expected of her, which was exactly what Rowan said, that she wouldn't be expected to actually be his wife, and how much she'd be paid at the end of the year. The door to the apartment opened, and Kelsey stepped in. Hey. Hey, how was your day? asked Izzy. It was good. She walked to the chair adjacent to the couch and Saturday, what's that you're reading? Izzy slid the contract off her knees and stretched her legs. 
Rowan Masters has asked me to marry him. Kelsey blinked. Wait. What? I was dusting in the dining room, and after nearly scaring me to death because I didn't hear him, he asked me to follow him to his office. His uncle was there too. And he just asked you to marry him? You two just met. Izzy chuckled. It did sound crazy. It's a marriage of convenience. He was in a car accident when he was younger, and his face is covered in scars. From what his nanny and uncle said, his friends treated him horribly, and he's been a recluse since. When his father died, he wanted to make sure Rowan would have a life, so he put a requirement in his will. If Rowan turns 30 and he isn't married, he'll lose his home. Kelsey's eyes widened and then narrowed. Are you joking with me? Izzy shook her head. No. It would only be a marriage on paper. In return, I'd get to live there, and after a year, he'd pay me a million dollars. And you're actually considering it? Izzy, this is a big deal. Just two weeks ago, you could barely make it to your car, and now you're thinking about marrying someone? That's crazy. It is. It's absurdly crazy, but, I don't know. I feel like I'm supposed to do this. There's something about him, Kelsey. I don't know what it is, but... Kelsey's jaw dropped as she gasped. You like him. You do. You like him. Izzy rolled her eyes. I don't know him. I've barely spoken to him. Besides, I'm not ready for that. So, then, what's the draw? I feel like a completely different person since I began working there. It's like I've found myself again. The thing that makes me, me. She shrugged. You know, I still think about what happened, and it's still hard at times. I'm jumpy. I continue to have nightmares, and I'm not sure I'll ever feel normal again. But I feel like maybe if I throw myself into thinking about someone else, it'll help. Kelsey chuckled. Still finding defective toys and tinkering with them, huh? Izzy threw her head back and laughed. I guess I am. She'd keep the fact that she thought he was attractive to herself. Now, that's normal Isabo. You said you haven't spent any time with him. How do you know you'll be happy? How do you know you can tinker with this toy? Izzy took a deep breath and let it out slowly. I can't put my finger on it. There's just something about him. He's special, and I'm drawn to him. I have absolutely no other explanation. I think you should tell him what happened so he knows. I don't think it's fair to keep that from him. No, he doesn't need to know. Stephen's in jail. That's all over. This worries me. Izzy smiled. Don't worry. It'll be fine. Kelsey took a deep breath. So, you're really going to do this? Yeah, I think I knew I was going to do it the moment he asked. The sorrow in his voice broke my heart. I think he needs a friend, and I'd like to be that friend. Kelsey put her arm across Izzy's shoulders. I haven't seen you this peaceful in months. I think you're right. I think this is a project that's right up your alley. Yeah, it was. Not only could she help Rowan, but she could help a lot of women getting out of bad situations and give Kelsey back her apartment. Izzy smiled to herself. She wasn't all the way back to being herself yet, but she was getting closer. Chapter 4 Pacing his office, Rowan raked his hand through his hair. She's an intelligent woman, which means she has probably quit. She's only a few minutes late, Ulysses said. Stop fretting. I'm not fretting. I'm being realistic. I need to face the facts. I'm losing my home because my father loved me so much. You know your father loved you. He loved you enough to push you. 
You are a brilliant lawyer who should be representing high-profile clients, pleading cases in front of the Supreme Court. Instead, you hide in this house, and while you're paid well, your talent is wasted on things that make no difference in the world. Rowan clenched his jaw. Uncle Ulysses. No, his uncle stood. For once, you're going to listen. You are not the only one who lost something that night. I lost London, but you don't see me flinching away from you, do you? Rowan shook his head, recalling the night of the accident. He picked up his uncle's girlfriend from the airport, and on the ride home, he swerved to avoid a deer and ran off the road into a tree. He'd long since dealt with the guilt of London's death. It was an accident, and there was nothing he could do to change it. I thought I'd never find love again after Madison, but London, London was my everything. We were going to build a life together. So, yes, I love you. I love you so much that I want you to have what I had. Rowan sat down hard on the couch. I'm sorry, Uncle Ulysses. I just, the thought of losing my home kills me. I know, and I understand. Miss Daniels is just late. I'm telling you, she'll show up. I just have a feeling that she's very different from anyone we've met before. Maybe. His uncle sat beside him and leaned back. If she happens to not show. I made calls yesterday. You made calls? Rowan nodded. I don't see where I have a choice. It's a week and a half until I turn 30. I'm trying to come to terms with what I have to do. I'm shocked. Rowan grunted. I am too, but I can't fight it anymore. My time is up. He let his gaze roam the shelf-lined wall. All the books. Some were his father's favorites, some his mother's. Pieces of his parents tucked away all around him. If he moved, there was no way he could bring himself to take them with him, to be reminded every day of what he'd lost, beyond his face and body, the memories. It was agonizing. A knock came at the door, and Rowan glanced at it. Come. It slowly opened, and Isabeau poked her head in. Hi. Hi. Rowan sprang off the couch and walked around his desk, keeping his back to the room. He couldn't believe she'd shown up. His pulse raced as he held his breath. No. That's all she had to say, and his whole world would change. I'm so sorry I'm late. I had trouble, she smiled. Anyway, I'm sorry. Ulysses stood to greet her. Well, I'm glad you're here. Late or otherwise. Rowan half turned to her, catching her out of the corner of his eye. Today, she'd worn white slacks and a loose-fitting turquoise blouse, with her hair pulled into a ponytail. Stunning would be a poor word for how incredible she looked. His uncle motioned to the chair she'd previously used. Come on in and sit down. Isabeau perched on the edge. Have you come to a decision? Ulysses asked. I have, she said softly. I'll marry Rowan, but I have a few changes I'd like to make. What? He couldn't have heard that right. Rowan spun around, facing her and pulling back his hair to reveal his full scar, not caring a whit if she saw him. You're agreeing to this? He caught his uncle's gaze and held it. She's insane. This won't stand up in a court of law. They'll declare her mentally unfit. She tilted her head and smiled. You didn't think that when you asked me. Because I thought you were intelligent enough to say no, Rowan ground out. You can't be seriously accepting this proposal. Isabeau caught his gaze and held it, those green eyes gluing his feet to the floor and his tongue to the roof of his mouth. I thought you wanted to stay in your home. I do, I just, why? I gave this a lot of thought, she said as she cast her gaze to the floor. I know what it's like to feel desperate and alone and scared. I don't want you to lose your home. She lifted her gaze to his again. 
To be honest, the only thing that kept me from saying yes from the beginning was the money being thrown at me. I don't want all that money. It's too much. Rowan's chest tightened. You don't want money? He didn't understand. Why would she be willing to marry him if she didn't want money? If you're insisting on giving out money, there's a women's shelter in Portland that could use it. And I really don't need a lot of things like clothes or entertainment as long as you'll let me borrow books from your library. I'd like to save that money so I can have it to find an apartment when the year is up. She smiled. If that's okay. Ulysses smiled as he caught Rowan's gaze. I think we can accommodate those changes. I was hoping you could, she said. I don't mind continuing to clean either. You won't have to do that anymore. We'll hire someone else, his uncle said. Isabeau touched Ulysses's arm. No, don't do that. It'll be fine. Rowan slowly eased into his chair as he struggled to understand her motivation. Taking no money, wanting no large monthly stipend, why would she care if he lost his home? She didn't have any reason to care. Are you sure? Ulysses asked. You're helping us, and I want to make sure your stay here is as comfortable as we can make it. She smiled. I appreciate that, but, really, it's fine. Okay. His uncle exhaled heavily. Izzy, I want to thank you for agreeing to do this. I'll get the changes made to the contract for you, and we'll get an account set up with monthly deposits so you have spending money. I'll make sure it's more than generous. Isabo chuckled. I don't doubt you will. His uncle smiled at Isabo and then turned his attention to Rowan. You know this means you'll have to leave the house. Both of you will have to go to the clerk to pick up the license. There's no getting around that. Will you be able to handle it? No, he hadn't thought of that. He gulped air as a panic attack struck. It had been years since he had one. His heart was pounding. The blood was rushing in his ears. He held his midsection as he fought to regulate his breathing. Rowan felt cool, delicate fingers cover his hand. Rowan. He lifted his gaze to Isabo, but there were no words. And this close, he knew she could see his face. All of it. There was no hiding the marred red skin covering his cheek, neck, and throat. He closed his eyes. In the months after the car accident, he begged to die. Cried out for it because of the pain. Even after the pain subsided, he still wished he could die, and more than once, he'd more than contemplated it. Now the feeling was returning so swiftly and so intensely that he nearly doubled over. Isabeau took his face in her hands. Rowan, look at me. He tried to pull away, but she held him. Look at me. Slowly, he opened his eyes, and those green eyes were piercing his. Please, he pleaded. Just breathe. I'm trying. I haven't been in public in years. How can I go out, looking like this? How could he make her understand? Her lips curved up, and her eyes sparkled. Looking like what? A successful, well-dressed lawyer with gorgeous chocolate eyes and an incredible smile? What was she talking about? Gorgeous eyes and incredible smile? Then her previous employment came rushing back to his memory. This had to be coming from her years as a physical therapist. There was no way she really believed what she was saying. This was how she dealt with her patients to get them to cooperate with her. Tell them what they wanted to hear to make them easier to work with. Patronizing them without them even realizing it. Well, he wasn't a patient, and he knew what she was doing. He wrenched his face away from her and turned his chair. I'm fine, he barked. And, please, don't lie to me. I can handle just about anything, but lying? I hate it. But I'm not. Izzy, his uncle said. 
How about we go find Retta and have her fix us some tea while we chat about what changes need to be made to the contract? Okay, she said softly. But I swear I wasn't lying. Rowan stood, keeping his back to her with his fists clenched at his side. Get the contract fixed. I'll figure out how to deal with the outing to the clerk's office. Make sure you add no lying into that contract. I don't need to be handled, Ms. Daniels. I'm a grown man. I had a momentary lapse. It won't happen again, Rowan growled. Of course not, she said barely above a whisper. Did her voice tremble? He glanced over his shoulder ever so slightly. Isabo hugged herself and walked back to his uncle. Ulysses rested his hand on the small of her back as he guided her to the door. I'll get the contract corrected and get it to you tonight, Rowan. Please do. Isabeau turned and dropped her arms to her sides. I'm sorry if I hurt you. That wasn't my intent. I'll make sure I don't do it again. Rowan nodded. See that you don't. He turned far enough to catch his uncle's gaze. Her room will be in the West Wing. This house is big enough that there is no reason Ms. Daniels and I have to see each other over the next year. Her mouth dropped open. But. I appreciate your helping me keep my home. For that, I cannot express my gratitude enough, but I am not looking for a friend, a girlfriend, or a wife. You will be free to come and go as you please, and with that in mind, we do not have to communicate once the marriage is made official. The day this home is signed over to my name, our marriage will be over. Do you understand? Izzy, his uncle said. Could you give me a moment with Rowan? She nodded and stepped out of the room. Rowan whirled around. She was patronizing me. She was being kind to you. Which is more than I can say for you. She hasn't signed the contract yet. You two aren't married. Do you really want to risk her leaving and losing this home? It's better that she knows where I stand now than to think this will be anything more than a business deal. I don't need friends, especially friends who will move out in a year and never speak to me again. His uncle walked to him and set his hands flat against the desktop. Rowan, you hurt her. I realize you are used to being the king in this castle, but you'll be sharing it now. It might be to your benefit if you don't treat her like an enemy. Rowan pinched the bridge of his nose as he closed his eyes. Please leave me alone. My head hurts. Ulysses straightened. Fine, but if you plan on living a live version of Beauty and the Beast, you should remember that he falls in love with her by the end. Rowan jerked his head up. What? I'm not going to fall in love with her or anyone else. His uncle smiled. I think what you're trying to say is that you can see yourself falling in love with her, and you're terrified she won't feel the same. You're wrong. I'll stay on my side of the house, and she'll stay on hers. The year will end, and it will be like she never existed. Ulysses sauntered to the door. If you'll recall, the beast thought much the same as you. The only difference between you and him is that he actually believed it. Your problem is that you don't want to. With that, his uncle walked out of his office. Rowan folded into his chair. His uncle was certifiable if he thought for one second that there was any chance of him falling in love with his elbow. He laughed and leaned back. It was crazy. That she could ever fall in love with him. It wasn't happening, and it was ridiculous to entertain such thoughts. But she had looked shocked and hurt after his outburst. Even if the idea of love was completely ludicrous, it didn't mean he had to be cruel to her. His uncle was right. He'd hurt her, and she'd done nothing to warrant it. She'd complimented him, and he'd angrily thrown it back in her face, calling her a liar. He hung his head as his shoulders rounded, feeling more shame than he had in a long time. Even if she was just being nice to him, she was trying to help. He was having a panic attack, and that was her way of helping him get through it. 
Taking a deep breath, Rowan scrubbed his face with his hands. He needed to find her and apologize. But he still wanted them in separate wings of the house. The less interaction he had with her, the better. It was the best thing for both of them. She wouldn't have to deal with him, and he wouldn't get his heart broken. Chapter 5 As Izzy hugged herself tighter, she wondered why Rowan had lost his temper with her. She hadn't been patronizing him. He was struggling to breathe, and she wanted to help. That was all. Izzy, if you'll take a seat here at the bar, we can talk, Ulysses said. Retta turned from the stove. Izzy, what's wrong? His uncle set the papers on the counter and sat in the seat beside Izzy. Rowan lost his temper. Oh, that boy. When will he learn? Retta patted Izzy's hand. I'm sorry. He thought I was patronizing him, but I swear I wasn't. He was having a panic attack, Izzy said. Ulysses took a deep breath. Izzy has agreed to marry Rowan so he can keep the house. When he realized he'd have to make a public appearance to get the marriage license, he panicked. Retta leaned her hip against the counter and sighed. I can see that happening. Izzy leaned forward with her arms on the counter. How long has it been since he's left the house? Ulysses and Retta locked gazes a moment. It's been roughly eleven years, when he came home from the hospital. The last time he was around other people was just after he'd recovered from the accident, his uncle said. Eleven years? Izzy couldn't wrap her brain around that. How was that possible? He hasn't left this property in all that time? Retta nodded. His recovery after the accident took quite a long time. It was months before he came home from the hospital, and we had a homecoming party for him here at the house. I had convinced him to put himself out there. I told him his friends would love him enough to accept him as he was, only I was wrong. Those kids were cruel. Very cruel. And his father and I shoulder that blame as well. Rowan was popular, and I would never have believed our circle of friends could be shallow. But they were. They couldn't see beyond Rowan's scars. Ulysses's voice was soft and low. It was a horrible realization. Izzy couldn't imagine how that must have affected Rowan. I can't believe they treated him like that. It was hard on Rowan, Retta said. And hard on me to see him go through it. I bet it was. Izzy understood. The only friend she had left was Kelsey. All her other friends thought she was making everything up about Stephen. It was hard to know that the people you thought you could trust didn't want you anymore. She chewed her lip. Not that I think he needs it, but has Rowan ever considered plastic surgery? Retta nodded. Once, but there was no guarantee he'd look the same, and he'd already been in so much pain that going through surgery and more pain, he just couldn't do it. Izzy nodded. I can see that. A moment of silence passed until Ulysses took a deep breath. Anyway, let's talk details. You want the money to go to a women's shelter? Yes, please. She smiled. And, really, as long as I have enough to get an apartment when the year is up, I'm fine. His uncle's lips parted like he was surprised. You really are doing this just so he can keep the house, aren't you? She nodded. Yes, I really am. There's something about him, and I find myself wanting to help him. Retta smiled. He's a sweet, charming man. When he isn't being a complete jerk, Rowan said as he partially stepped into the kitchen. Izzy jumped and pressed her hand to her chest. The man needed a bell or something. How long had he been standing there? Had he heard them talking about him? Her cheeks burned, and the heat raced to her ears. I really am sorry. I won't do that to you again. You were trying to help me, and I bit your head off. I'm the one who needs to apologize. Izzy swiveled on the stool to face him. Apology accepted. 
Do you accept mine? Yes, and thank you. I'll be in my office if anyone needs me. Rettel walked to him and cupped his cheek. Perhaps you could show Izzy where she'll be staying while Ulysses gets the contract updated. Butterflies stirred in Izzy's stomach, and nervous jitters made her shiver. She liked the idea of spending time with him. I'd love that. Retta, Rowan shook his head. Rowan, she'll be living here for the next year. The least you can do is show her a little hospitality. Retta's voice was firm. He sighed. Yes, ma'am. Rowan nodded and motioned for Izzy to walk with him. Stay to my right, please. Okay. Izzy slid her hands into her pockets and cast her gaze to the floor as she walked next to him. The tension felt like weights pressing down on her shoulders. She'd apologized and so had he, so why did it still feel so uncomfortable? They took the stairs and at the top, he motioned to the right. They passed several rooms, took a left, and when they got to the end, he stopped in front of an open door on the right. This will be your room. Her heart stopped. It felt so far away from the rest of the house, and it was only on the second floor. What if? Where's your room? I live in the East Wing. This is the West. You'll have complete access to any room on the side of the house. Just stay out of the East Wing. Rowan stepped inside and waved her in. This room looks over part of the garden. She walked to the bed and sank down. But it's so, what was she going to say? She already come across as a flake the other day when he'd surprised her in the dining room. Perhaps it was for the best that she was so far away, especially since she was still having nightmares. Actually, this will be fine. You don't look fine. She lifted her gaze and found him eyeing her. You're pale. He narrowed his eyes. And you're shaking. Oh, because I was already running late, I didn't eat this morning. That's all. I'm fine. Rowan narrowed his eyes. Are you sure that's it? Izzy swallowed down her fear and said, yes, I'm sure. Now that she took the time to look around, she did like the room. It was big enough for the king-size bed with enough room left over for a sitting area by the window. Dark damask curtains hung from the top of the high ceiling to the floor. The large rug on which the bed sat looked old and expensive. Do you visit this room often? She asked. No, I think my father envisioned having a lot of children and grandchildren, which is why he built such a large home. After I was born, though, my mother became ill, and she was no longer able to have children. How old were you when she passed away? I was seven. Izzy looked down at her hands in her lap. Yeah, I lost my dad just after I graduated from high school. He was in an accident before I was born, and it made him medically fragile. My mom passed away right after I turned 20. I'm sorry. I know how that feels. Some days are better than others. Lifting her gaze to his, she said, there are times I find myself desperate to talk to her or him to ask for advice or just hear their voice. Rowan smiled. My mother recorded videos for me, and I have the last message my father ever sent me. Sometimes, I'll hide away and spend time with them. I had a message from my mom on my phone, but it was broken. I tried to find a company that could retrieve it, but they said the phone was too damaged. Then he did something that shocked her. He walked to the bed and sat next to her. I don't know what I'd do if I lost those things. Part of the reason I struggled with losing this home was losing my connection to them. It seems stupid, but it's all I have left of them. She covered his hands with hers and locked gazes with him. It's not stupid at all. If I could have stayed in Portland, I would have. My childhood home is there, but I had to sell it. I had some unexpected expenses come up and didn't have a choice. Why had she said that? He didn't need to know about her problems. His eyebrows furrowed. What sort of expenses? 
I was, what could she say? She didn't want to lie, but she also didn't want to fillet herself open to a man she just met. I was in an accident, and I had medical expenses to pay. Accident? She pulled her hand from his and tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. Yeah, but I'm fine now. Good. What made you decide to move to Dallas? Then it struck her. They were having an honest-to-goodness conversation. She was enjoying herself too. Beyond thinking he was good-looking, she liked the sound of his voice, and now that he was so close, she couldn't help but notice how great he smelled. She braced her hand on the bed and set her chin on her shoulder as she looked up at him. How long had it been since she felt this at ease with a man? But she was. She trusted him. Something she never thought she'd feel again. My best friend, Kelsey, moved here for work. She was letting me stay with her while I got back on my feet. That was nice of her. My uncle said you were a physical therapist. Why aren't you still doing that? Izzy sucked in a sharp breath. My license renewal came up while I was still hurt, and I wasn't physically able to do it. That was true, but Stephen, well, his father, also had friends in high places, and he'd reported her to the board for misconduct. Rowan narrowed his eyes. I've told you I don't like being lied to. I'm a lawyer. It's my job to know when someone is lying. Pulling her gaze from his, tears pooled in her eyes. She didn't know Rowan that well. What if, what if she told him and he wanted nothing to do with her? How would he save his house then? Would you like to tell me all your deep, dark secrets? She asked just above a whisper. Point taken. He stood and held his hand out to her. If you'd like, we can go back to the kitchen and maybe have some hot tea? She took his hand and let him help her up. That sounds wonderful. Inwardly, she cheered. She really liked him, and the prospect of becoming his friend sent a thrill through her. They'd had a rocky start to the morning, but they'd been able to move past it pretty quickly. If they were able to tackle all their challenges as easily, the next year would work out just fine. Chapter 6 In Through His Nose, Out Through His Mouth Rowan had put the phrase, an action, on repeat since leaving his home. His uncle had updated the terms of the contract the day before, and Isabeau had signed it. Afterward, they'd applied online for the license, and now all they had to do was pick it up. We don't have to do this today, Rowan. Isabeau's voice broke through his thoughts. We can wait a day or two. She'd sat next to him, and she'd even been considerate enough to stay to his right. He called for a car that morning, and now they sat in a limo, not ten minutes from the courthouse. I need to get it over with. The faster I do that, the quicker I can get back home and stay there. Besides, there's the 72-hour waiting period I have to consider. I know we have a little over a week until my birthday, but I think I'll sleep better at night knowing I'm not going to be forced out of my home. She nodded. I can understand that. Her smile only accentuated how beautiful she looked. He wasn't sure how it was possible that she grew even more stunning by the day. She'd worn an off-the-shoulder light pink blouse with a black skirt that made her legs look long and lean. I didn't think to ask. Do I need to call movers for your things? He asked. Most of my things are in storage in Portland. All I have are my clothes and a few belongings. I suspect they'll fit in my car, and I'll only need to make one trip. Rowan twisted to look at her. I can have your things in Portland sent for if you'd like. I don't mind. It would be nice to have my things, but you don't have to do that. You're already doing so much. He choked. I'm doing so much. I'm not doing anything in comparison. You're giving up a year of your life to help me save my home. You're going to be stuck living with me. Which, you're free to date if you'd like. The will said nothing about infidelity. Her face fell. I don't, I don't date. 
It's been more than a year since I've dated anyone. A beautiful woman like you hasn't dated? I find that hard to believe. When she lifted her gaze to his, a glassy sheen coated her eyes. Please don't call me beautiful. I don't like that word. Why? Let's just say the last person who used it wasn't very nice to me. He took that word and twisted it. Without thinking, he put his arm around her shoulders and pulled her close. Before he realized what he'd done, she curled into him and put her hand flat against his chest. It was the strangest sensation to have a woman so close to him. He couldn't remember the last time he'd felt someone warm against him, and now that he had, he wanted more. Would it be okay if I called you lovely? She nodded. Yes, that's okay. Okay, then that other word is banned. Will stunning work too? Is a bow chuckled. Yes, that's okay too. How about incredible? She pulled back, and a wide smile greeted him. Thank you. He may not be able to say beautiful, but she couldn't stop him from thinking it. Although, it didn't seem to convey just how amazing she was. Unlike last time when she was this close, he wasn't having a panic attack, and all his attention was directly on the softness of her skin and curve of her lips. There was no hope of a future with her, and yet, he couldn't stop himself from staring. The glass partition slid open, and the driver said, Sir, we're here. It was just the thing Rowan needed to break the spell. Another second, and he might have been crazy enough to think he could kiss her. That would have been worse than embarrassing. He could picture her leaning back, wondering what on earth he was thinking. Thank you, Henry, Rowan said. I guess this is it. Isabeau leaned in with her eyebrows knitted together. He'd never seen such a fierce look in her eyes. I won't let anyone hurt you. Do you understand? And if anyone does say anything, you don't listen. Their unqualified, unsolicited opinion means nothing. And it especially means nothing to me. As much as he wanted to argue, he could see by the set of her jaw that she wasn't backing down. All right. Whatever he was about to face was worth it, just to see the smile she awarded him. It's not going to be as bad as you think, and it's probably not going to be as great as I hope. It'll be somewhere in the middle, and we'll handle it together, okay? How was so much sunshine packed into a woman so petite? But there she was, blazing like a ball of light, burning away years of loneliness. I'm ready if you are. They exited the car, and Rowan instinctively tried to hide his face behind his hair as they walked into the courthouse. Once they were through security, they continued to the clerk's office and got in line. With it being a Tuesday, it didn't feel as crowded as he'd pictured. People are staring at me, Rowan said. I know, and I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Rowan felt a tug on his shirt and looked down. A little girl, maybe six years old, was staring up at him. Mister, what happened to you? A woman dashed to the little girl. I'm so sorry. Normally, she'd be in school now, but it was a teacher's work day. Wait, Isabeau said and squatted down. What's your name? Vanessa. Isabeau took Rowan's hand and pulled on him. Come down here, she said. Rowan squatted down next to her. What are you doing? This is Vanessa. How old are you, Vanessa? I'll be seven tomorrow. The little girl grinned. Isabeau gasped. Oh, well, happy early birthday. Thank you. Is he your friend? What happened to his face? Isabeau, Rowan quietly growled as his heart raced. She ignored him and continued. He is my friend, and he'll be my husband in a few days. He was in a car accident, and he was hurt very badly. The little girl nodded and looked at Rowan. Oh, was it scary? Rowan's pulse felt like it was humming. He hated questions about himself, but she was an innocent little girl. 
It was, he said. You have pretty hair, Vanessa said. Is a beau snickered. He does have pretty hair, doesn't he? She slid her fingers through it. It's so soft and long. That was a first. He'd never had that sort of comment directed at him before. It was also a strange sensation to have someone combing their fingers through his hair, especially when that someone was Izobo. Thank you, he said as he shot Izobo a glance. Is, is his skin okay? Vanessa asked. It sure is, see? Izobo brushed the back of her hand down the side of his face. He would have flinched away, taken her hand and pulled it from his face, but it would have made an even bigger scene. I like his face. Rowan wanted to scream. Isabeau was drawing too much attention to him. And aside from that, there was no way she really thought that. He'd begged her not to lie. Isabeau, please. Vanessa, people have hurt him in the past, but you aren't going to do that, are you? Isabeau directed the question to the little girl as she caught his gaze. No, my friend at school was burned too. His mommy and daddy were having a cookout, and he got too close to the fire. That's why I asked if his skin was okay. Isaiah's accident wasn't very long ago, and sometimes it still hurts. Rowan swallowed hard, trying to dislodge the lump in his throat. I'm sorry your friend was burned. It's okay. I like his face too. Some of the other kids are mean to him, but I tell them they're jerks. When I moved to my new school, he was the only one who was nice to me. She smiled and took her mom's hand. I'll tell him I met you so he doesn't feel so bad anymore. Isabeau and Rowan straightened. You have a sweet little girl, Isabeau said. Thank you for talking to her. Her friend Isaiah will appreciate it, her mom said. I hope her friend is better soon. Isabeau smiled. Before Rowan could say anything, the clerk called their names. Once they had the license, they quickly went back to the car. The second the door shut and Rowan was alone with her, he faced her. What was all that? How could she do that to him? Talk about him like he was normal when there was nothing normal about him. All what? She was a curious little girl. By talking to her, you showed her that you were a person with feelings. You've helped someone. There is a little boy somewhere in Dallas who is hurt, scared, and wondering if he'll ever be okay, and that little girl is going to go back to him with hope. Hope that just because something awful happened doesn't mean it'll always be like that. You did that, Rowan, and it was a wonderful thing you did. But telling her you liked my face? Touching my face like it was nothing? Isabeau looked at him like he'd grown four heads. And Vanessa liked her friend's face too. Do you think she was lying about that? I think she was being nice because he was nice to her and he was her friend. But you and I aren't friends. We're barely acquaintances. I need you to stop, stop saying things like that. Especially when I know they aren't true. She leaned back as though he'd slapped her. You don't get to decide for me how I think of you. What I see when I see you. I decide that. Me. Not you. She scooted closer to the door. I won't let your behavior dictate what kind of person I am or how I behave in return. I was upfront from the beginning about what you should expect. I'm not looking to make any friends. Isabeau angled herself away from him. After a moment, she whispered, did it ever occur to you that I might need a friend? She needed a friend? Right. I'm sure you have plenty of friends. You don't need me. They rode the rest of the way to the house in silence, for which Rowan was glad. He knew he'd upset her, but she'd upset him too. Lying to not only him, but a little girl as well. No one in their right mind liked his face. He was burned, and there was no fixing it. Of course, he'd looked into plastic surgery and decided against it. What was the point, when he knew he'd never look the same? 
When they reached the house, Isabeau hopped out of the car, and just as he exited, she pointed her face up at him. I do not have plenty of friends. Beauty doesn't get you friends or happiness or peace. It gets you attention. My so-called friends who said I could call any time, day or night, and they'd be there. Weren't there. I called. I screamed. I begged. But I was alone, except for Kelsey, and she was here in Dallas. It was me against him. She slapped her hand over her mouth as tears streamed down her cheeks. Rowan blinked. Her against him? What did she mean by that? You against who? Her bottom lip trembled. You don't want to be my friend, so why should I tell you? She spun on her heels, dashed to her car, and sped off. He gaped after her, trying to put together what had just happened. How could she have no friends? What could have happened to her to make her friends abandon her? She begged? What did all of it mean? Whatever happened, clearly the background check had not been as thorough as it should have been. But what really gripped his heart were her tears. The hurt in her eyes, like she'd been wounded. And that was a feeling he was familiar with. And he was the one who'd done the wounding, which didn't sit well with him. He'd never thought he'd be the one inflicting the same hurt he'd experienced right after his accident. His so-called friends had been there for him until he'd been hurt. Then one by one, they'd all disappeared because it was too difficult for them to look at him. Difficult for them. They weren't the ones living with the memories of being trapped in the car, the flames eating his skin, and the equally painful aftermath. His friends had abandoned him too, and he treated her the same way they treated him. Again, he found himself needing to apologize to her. His only fear was that he was going to run out of chances to apologize. Chapter 7 Three Days It had been three days, and the only reason Issy hadn't taken longer before she faced Rowan was because she didn't want Ulysses asking why. She'd talked to Kelsey about what happened. Kelsey tried to talk her out of going through with it, but Izzy couldn't do that now that she'd signed the contract. There wasn't a clause that allowed her to get out of the marriage just because the husband-to-be was mean. They'd also agreed that Kelsey wouldn't come with her when she returned since Izzy wasn't sure how he'd react. Well, that wasn't true. She knew how he'd react, poorly. It was hard to say goodbye to the little apartment she'd called home for the last five months. Even harder was knowing she wouldn't see Kelsey every day, but they promised to talk as much as they could. Plus, it wasn't like Izzy was being held captive. She could come and go as she pleased. As she pulled her car into the garage, she swallowed down the building awkwardness she felt. What was Rowan going to say to her? Would he speak to her? She had blown up and fled the scene of the crime. Plus, she'd ignored the few times he'd called. She didn't know what to say to him. Before she could fully get out of the car, Rowan stepped inside the garage, and she froze as her heart pounded. What she couldn't deny was that she liked him. She did like his face, and he wouldn't change her mind. Isabeau, I know you're upset with me, and you have every right to be, but I want to apologize for my behavior, even if it seems to be a pattern at this point. I was wrong to speak to you that way. Wrong to assume things about you that I had no right to assume. I promised myself I'd never treat anyone the way I was treated, and I broke my own promise. She'd told herself that whatever apology he might offer, she'd accept it and keep her distance. The butterflies in her stomach vehemently disagreed, and she couldn't ignore how giddy she felt. He'd apologized, and it was sweet. I do like your face, and you have to stop telling me I'm lying when I'm not. It's illogical, and I'm struggling to comprehend it. Izzy shut the car door and walked to him. You're assuming that beauty is logical. That the way we see things is the same. We don't even see the colors the same way. But this isn't a color. This, this is ugly, and that is universally known. Says who? He hung his head. 
Me, he whispered. How could she get through to him? Maybe she could show him one of her scars. She unbuttoned the top two buttons of her blouse. What are you doing? he asked as he averted his eyes. She pulled her shirt aside just enough to show him the gnarly red gash right above her heart. Does this look lovely and stunning to you? His jaw dropped, and as his shock faded, his eyebrows drew together. How did you get that? It doesn't matter how I got it. I have it. But you can hide it. She swallowed hard as she recalled the first time she stood in the mirror after being attacked. All the jagged cuts and bruises. Just because I can cover it with my shirt doesn't mean it goes away. I know it's there. I know it's ugly. And a little over a year ago, it wasn't there. She buttoned her shirt. Hidden doesn't mean gone. It means you carry it alone until you share it. Being brave enough to share your hurt with someone else is lovely too. What do you mean, it wasn't there a little over a year ago? Was it the him you were fighting against that did it? She lowered her gaze. Maybe if you stop calling me a liar long enough, I might tell you. All I can do is try. I'm not exactly what you call a people person. Izzy laughed. That's funny, but it's not true, and you know it. He smiled. So, we're okay for now? You still want to go through with this? She nodded. I considered running, but I believe I signed a contract. I don't recall reading a clause that said if the groom acts like a jerk, you're free to quit. His incredibly dark eyes held hers. I wouldn't force you to marry me, no matter what contract you signed. I know, which is why I'm going through with it. Do you need help getting your things to your room? He asked as he stepped around her, walking to the trunk of her car. Yes, if you don't mind, she said as she walked to the passenger side and pulled out two garment bags. Is it set in stone that I have to stay in that room so far away from everyone? He pulled out her luggage and closed the trunk. It'll give you the most privacy. It's one of the nicer rooms on the second floor. Oh, well, thank you. There went the hope that maybe she could move closer to him. I'm sure it'll be fine. As Rowan passed by her, going to the door, he took one of the garment bags from her. My uncle has a minister coming this evening at sundown. He and Retta have set up a small ceremony spot in the gardens. You're free to dress however you want. Okay. I brought a few dresses, just in case. I had no idea what or how it would be like. I'm sure whatever you wear will be lovely. At this point, I'm certain you could pull off a potato sack. Izzy snorted. Thank you for the compliment, but it wasn't nice to make me laugh like that. He chuckled. It was fun for me. She bumped him with her shoulder. Mimi. Once they reached her room, Dread pulled in her stomach as she set her garment bag down on the bed. So far away. So big and open, and there were doors and places for things to hide. A shiver ran down her spine. Maybe we could turn the heat up a little on the side. I'll make sure that happens. Thank you. If there's anything you need, let us know. Anything at all. He paused as he stopped by the bed. I'd really like to get your things in Oregon out of storage. Even if you don't think you want to unbox anything, I'd like you to have them. Oh, to have her things. But could she handle seeing them? Kelsey said she'd had everything cleaned, but what if they missed something? She fingered the collar of her blouse. It's you store it. It's right off the 205 near Happy Valley. Okay, he smiled. Think of it as a wedding present. But I didn't get you anything. You're giving me this house, and that's more than enough. She shook her head. No, I'll have to think of something. He stepped closer to her. I'm fine, really. I just want you to be comfortable. That's all. 
Taking a step toward him, she hugged him around the waist. Thank you for offering to get my things. Slowly, he wrapped his arms around her. He smelled good, he felt good, and she felt so safe with him. Yes, he'd been grumpy and had yelled, pushing her away, but not because he had an ugly heart. He had a hurt, rejected heart, and he wasn't used to someone caring about him. Before she was ready, he pulled away and walked to the door. Thank you for doing this. I'll never be able to thank you enough. She followed him and took his hand in hers. You're not as unlikable as you think. I'll see you in a few hours, he said, a smile curving his lips. Lips that she was noticing more and more. Wondering how soft they were and how they'd feel on hers. Something she thought she'd never want again. Okay. The door clicked shut. Now that she was alone, the room felt even more cavernous than before. But it was okay. The house was far off the street. A code was needed to get through the gate, and she was safe because Rowan wasn't that far away. She had her cell phone too. Everything would be okay, and being this far away from him meant that if she did have a nightmare, she wouldn't wake him up. No telling what he'd think if he found her screaming her head off. Walking to the bed, she pulled out her phone and dialed Kelsey. She'd promised to call when she got to the house. Hey! Kelsey said. Is everything okay? Do I need to beat anyone up? Izzy flopped down and sank into the plush covers. She might have nightmares, but she'd be having them in comfort. Everything's fine, and, no, you don't need to beat anyone up. He was actually waiting to apologize to me. Did you tell him to stuff it? She laughed. No, he thinks he's ugly and that I'm lying when I say I like his face. Kelsey, I like him. Kelsey gasped. Even just saying that is a big deal for you. I know, but right now, I just want to be friends with him. Well, is, I guess it's a good a thing you actually like your soon-to-be husband. I would like to be friends with him. I feel safe around him, which is so weird because I don't know him that well. I can't explain it, there's this. Pull? If that's the case, you really need to tell him what happened. Now, so that he understands if you suddenly shy away. I'm not. Izzy, you need to be careful. Not just for him, but for your sake too. It sounds like you could fall for this guy, and I don't want to see you get hurt. Kelsey was right again. If Izzy hurt him, he'd never trust anyone again. Not after being tossed away by his friends. But telling him everything right now? She didn't know him well enough to do that. I won't. And I'll be careful not to hurt him either. I promise. You know I'll need to meet him one day. I know, but give me time to get through to him. Kelsey took a deep breath. Well, if anyone can, it's you. Izzy drew a circle in the covers with her finger. She understood where Kelsey was coming from, and as soon as Izzy was comfortable telling Rowan, she would. I'll be careful. I'm in a room as far away from him as humanly possible too. Are you going to be okay alone like that? She nodded. I guess I'll have to be. I can't bring myself to tell him about what happened to me. Not yet. I'll sound like some sad, pathetic woman who couldn't defend herself. That's not true, and you know it. You took self-defense classes. You did all you could to protect yourself. You can't help that he found a way into your home. The alarm company didn't even know he was in there. I should have known. She choked. No, this wasn't your fault. It was his fault. I flew in the second the hospital called. You, I've never cried so hard in my life. You were barely recognizable. Izzy fought back tears. The last thing she needed was to show up at her wedding with puffy red eyes. Well, it's over now, and he's going to prison. 
In the end, I won. Exactly. But I know you, and you just don't want to cry before your wedding. Kelsey laughed. Izzy laughed with her. You're right. I don't. They talked for a while longer and then said their goodbyes. By the end of their talk, Izzy was pretty sure of the dress she would wear. It had been a while since she'd wanted to look nice for someone, and even if this wasn't a real wedding, she still wanted to look good for Rowan. Those butterflies flitted in her stomach again. She wasn't sure what he'd wear, but so far he'd looked amazing every time she saw him. Of course, he was always in slacks and a button-up, but he looked good in them. Maybe he'd wear that crazy good cologne too. Would they dance or celebrate after? It wasn't a real wedding, but that didn't mean they couldn't have fun. She wondered if she asked if he'd dance with her. She had a few danceable songs on her phone. The worst he could say was no. Well, that wasn't exactly true. He could growl, and that would be worse. More butterflies buzzed in her stomach as she thought of being in his arms again. What was she doing, and why was she reacting this way? How could she be so drawn to someone she barely knew? But it didn't feel like she barely knew him. It was as though they were puzzle pieces and they fit. Kelsey was right. She was going to have to be careful. She didn't know if she was ready for butterflies and soft lips yet. What if she let him on and then couldn't handle it? She couldn't hurt him like that. No, she'd settle herself down and approach him like she would a friend. That's what she'd asked of him, and that's all she'd offer. A good-looking, soft-haired, and terrific-smelling man could be her friend. Only, she wasn't so sure she could sell herself on that. Then why are you nervous? A lone delicate shoulder shrugged as she cast her gaze down. After, after my accident, I didn't think I'd ever find myself getting married. I could barely function for a while. It felt as if darkness was going to swallow me. She slowly lifted her gaze. Wide eyes locked with his, and her hand came to her mouth as though she was shocked she'd let that slip. Rowan stepped forward and took her hand. Over the next year, I hope to gain your trust enough that you'll tell me what happened. I'm afraid to tell you. Afraid? Why? She chewed her bottom lip and then hung her head as she whispered, What if you decide I'm the monster? What could he say to that? How could she think that was possible? He hooked his finger under her chin and tipped her face up. That's not possible. A smile spread on her lips, and if he hadn't known better, he would have thought she just found out she won the lottery. I hope that's true. The door to the garden opened, and Rowan stepped back. What was strange was how cold he felt even being a foot away from her. What was even stranger was that he was trying to figure out how to stay close to her when he knew she'd never want to stay with him. Ulysses clapped his hands together as he stopped on the bottom step with the minister and Retta following. Who's ready for a wedding? Isabeau slipped her fingers in Rowan's. I'm ready. He was ready too. More so than he ever thought he'd be. Ulysses was right. Over the last few days, she'd invaded his life and his thoughts. Just thinking about her made him smile. Preparing the garden for her made him feel alive. Being around her, her sunshine, it had been years since he'd felt so good. We're both ready. They each took their place in front of the archway. Exchanging rings and vows with Isabeau wasn't scary. At least not in a horror type of scary way. But maybe a little scary in the realization that there was a good chance that at the end of the year, he wouldn't be able to let her go. It wasn't until the minister said, you may kiss the bride, that Rowan froze. He'd personally told the minister that they didn't need to kiss. Not that he was wanting to avoid it. Far from it. More so, he was looking out for Isabeau, trying to keep her from being put in an uncomfortable position. His uncle must have told the minister otherwise. They'd be having a talk about that at a later time. Rowan caught her gaze, hoping she could see that he hadn't planned on it either. We don't. 
She lifted on her toes, her lips touched his, and if heaven really was a place, he was standing in the middle of a gold line street. Zaps of electricity rushed through him, and it took effort not to wrap his arms around her and crush her to him. It wasn't because she was the first woman he'd been around since his accident. Other maids who were beautiful had worked at the house before, and he hadn't felt the same connection to them that he felt with his elbow. With one last brush of her lips across his, she pulled back. That wasn't so bad, was it? Hardly. He only thought he felt alive minutes ago when she'd been surprised by the garden. That was nothing. Now he was alive. He felt as if his heart had been hit with electricity and was beating for the first time in twelve years. No, that wasn't bad at all. Ulysses and Retta clapped, breaking the spell. The minister touched him on the shoulder and said, Congratulations. Thank you, Rowan said. Retta hugged his elbow, a table has been set up just a few feet beyond the archway. I thought you'd like to have dinner out here tonight. I'd love that, but you didn't have to go to all that trouble. No trouble, dear, Retta said, catching Rowan's gaze. No trouble at all. Rowan didn't know what to do. He'd started this whole thing to save his home, but now it felt as though he were being saved along with it. It was a crazy notion, and he couldn't let himself get caught up in all of this. There was a contract, and it was only for a year. If he was going to survive this, he needed to remember to keep his distance. Chapter 9 In awe That's how Izzy had felt since she'd first stepped outside. The garden was unbelievable, the ceremony was sweet, and now having dinner outside with Rowan was more than she could have imagined. As much as she was surprised by the garden, she'd been equally surprised by how the butterflies in her stomach took flight when she said I do. She'd married this handsome man, and while it was pretend, her attraction to him wasn't fake at all. It felt as though she were coming alive, and the more time she spent with him, the more alive she felt. At first, part of why she wanted to spend time with him was what Kelsey had said, that she liked fixing broken people, but it seemed she was the one being pieced back together. She could picture herself sitting across from him for years to come, and while the thought terrified her because her feelings had shifted so quickly, it also excited her. For the first time in forever, she felt a calm she thought she'd never feel again. This is delicious. I've never had this type of mushroom pasta before, she said, hoping to get him talking. So far, he'd been quiet and almost withdrawn. It's Retta's own recipe. There are times I crave it for every meal. The food wasn't the only delicious part of her meal. Rowan was heart-stopping gorgeous in his dark gray linen slacks and dark blue dress shirt. He trimmed his hair just a little to where it just barely touched his shoulders, something he must have done after she saw him earlier that day. Burns or no burns, Rowan Masters was incredibly attractive. And she'd kissed that incredibly attractive man too. Kelsey would have been shocked. She'd also be shocked to know Izzy had liked it. Her lips had tingled, and even just thinking about it made her feel the same sensation all over again. I can see why. I've never tasted anything so good. He smiled. That's Retta. How long has she worked for you? Since I was a toddler. Maybe a few months over that, but a long time. My mother's health was declining, and Retta was hired as my nanny. She's more like a second mom to me. I loved my mother, but her illness made it difficult for her to be active. Isabeau debated asking him about his mother's illness. You don't have to tell me, but what? She had cancer, but she died because of an infection from surgery. It was routine, but because she was weak, her body couldn't fight it. I can't imagine how hard that must have been. You said you were you seven? Yes, almost eight. It was never easy to lose a parent, but being so young, that must have been awful for him. I'm so sorry. He waved her off. Thank you, but I dealt with it long ago. You said your parents both passed away. Do you have any other family? No. I am an only child too, but I have Kelsey. 
What made you decide to be a physical therapist? He asked as he took a bite of food. Izzy shrugged. I wanted to be a nurse at first, but Needles and I aren't friends. I wanted to help people, though, because it makes me happy, so I looked into other things, and it appealed to me. Maybe someday I'll do it again. I can see you being very good at it. He smiled. And you? She took a sip of water as she finished her meal and wiped her mouth. Was it hard to get your law degree? Rowan nodded. Only because I didn't like being in public, but my father knew many of the teachers who taught at the college level, so they accommodated me. That was nice of them. She also wondered if it had been a double-edged sword. He'd needed to be out in the world. To know that not everyone would treat him like his friends had treated him. Substantial donations to the schools helped as well. She chuckled. I can see that helping. Rowan finished his last bite and washed it down with a bit of water. My father wanted the best for me, and most of the plans for my future were already set when my accident occurred. It took months to recover from the burns, but as soon as I could, I began getting caught up. As successful as you are, I can see you being a hard worker. When you put your mind to something, you don't quit until it's done. He chuckled. I can be. Stubborn? Hard-headed? Pig-headed? His lips stretched into a wide smile, and her heart skipped a beat. That smile was swoon-worthy. Persistent, focused, and determined. I like mine better. She laughed. He shook his head and looked away, but the smile stayed just as wide. Now, who's being mean? A snort popped out, and she slapped a hand over her mouth. You are. Rowan tipped his head back and roared with laughter. And you can make it up to me by dancing with me. She straightened her shoulders and lifted her chin. There's no music. She slipped her hand into the pocket of her dress and pulled out her phone. I brought music. I'm not a dancer. I don't believe that for a second. She set the phone on the table, tapped the play button, and then stood. Come on, dance with me. Rowan shook his head. No, I can't dance. Izzy took his hand. Please? You owe it to me for making me snort so unladylike twice in one day. Is a bow. This garden is illuminated with thousands of lights. The breeze blowing is warm and wonderful, and the fragrance of all these flowers is unlike anything I've ever known. This is the perfect spot to dance. Please? She blinked, giving him her best sad puppy dog eyes. His mouth dropped open. Oh, that's not fair. She shrugged. You're forcing my hand. He stood, and she pointed her face up at him as he loomed over her. He shook his head. It's been ages since I danced with anyone. And next time, that look won't work on me. Yes, it will. She grinned. The amusement playing on his features made her pulse race. There's a chance you might be right. He took her hand and pulled her close, and it was the most right feeling she'd had in longer than she could remember. She'd only really gotten to know him in the last few days, and already she was growing so attached to him. As they began to dance, it hit her that Kelsey was right. He was someone she could fall for. How long had it been since she felt such peace? He made her laugh and feel safe, but more than that she enjoyed being with him. Have I told you how lovely you look tonight? When you walked onto the veranda, I could have sworn there was an angel standing in front of me. Her cheeks warmed. If you call me a liar, I'll stomp on your feet. Fair warning. Rowan laughed. What? I think you look great. You're so handsome. Is a bow. We're married now. You can call me Izzy. He shook his head. No, I can't. Why? Because it's unbefitting of your grace and poise. Is a bow suits you. 
I can't bring myself to call you by the other. If her cheeks were warm before, they were a five-alarm fire now. No one. No one has ever said anything like that to me before. Well, they should have. He smiled. Thank you. You know, you're very sweet. We both know that's not true, he said and twirled her. She gasped. I knew you could dance. He laughed as he caught her gaze. I may have downplayed my abilities. Downplayed. She popped him on the chest. Why did you say you couldn't dance? For someone who doesn't like lying, you sure do it a lot and rather effortlessly. He pulled his gaze from hers and shrugged. I'm not used to anyone being this close to me. Ulysses and Retta are familiar, but I'm... Worried that I'll change my mind about liking your face? Yes. I'm not, and you have to quit lying to me. If I can't lie to you, you can't lie to me. He nodded, avoiding eye contact. I won't lie anymore. Good. She stopped him. You're interesting, funny, and sweet. I enjoy spending time with you. I was serious when I said I wanted to be your friend. The only friend I have is Kelsey. He locked eyes with her. Why is she your only friend? You are a walking bottle of sunshine. It makes no sense to me. Pulling her close, he started their dance again. Because Stephen made them think she was crazy and blamed her for everything. I had several people I called friends, but they couldn't handle my accident. Kelsey is the only one who stuck with me. She's part of the reason I agreed to marry you. Why? She shrugged. I lived with her in a tiny apartment for five months, and I didn't want her getting sick of me. I figured this house is big enough that if you get tired of me, you can just draw a line and tell me to stay on my side, on top of avoiding the east wing. I don't see that happening. I can't see your friend getting sick of you either. I bet she was glad to have you staying with her. Maybe, but I'm not as easy to deal with as you think. Is that why you said you were afraid I'd think you were a monster? How could she explain it without just telling him everything at once? She couldn't dump that on him. What if he did decide she was the monster? Kelsey told her it wasn't her fault, but that didn't change how she felt. Izzy nodded and cast her gaze down. I'm trying to be better, but when I wasn't feeling good, I had a hard time dealing with it. It made me a different person, and it's taking longer to be me again than I thought it would. With one finger, he tipped her chin up. I understand that more than you know. It's hard to be the person you were when you no longer see that person in the mirror. Exactly, she said as tears suddenly pooled in her eyes. I see cracks in the mirror, and all I want is to fill in those cracks so I can be whole again. I know. She hugged him around the waist. I think that's why I like being around you. No one understands. They think I should be okay, but they don't see all my wounds. If I was wearing a cast, a bandage, or something like that, they'd get it. But because all of my hurt is on the inside, it's not valid. He wrapped his arms around her, and it was more than just a hug to her. It was his way of not just saying he understood but showing it. She tipped her face up to him. Thank you. For what? Not patronizing me. Believe me, I understand that even more. Izzy smiled. One more dance? Sure, but only one. I do have to get caught up on work tomorrow. No rest for the weary? He laughed and shot her a smile that made her pulse race. You could say that. He'd said only one, but she managed to talk him into another. She wanted to try for a third, but she also didn't want to push her luck. Once they finished the last dance, Rowan walked her to her room. As awkward and weird as this was, it was also the most fun I've had in ages. Thank you again for making the garden so pretty and for dancing with me, Izzy said. Rowan smiled. 
I actually had fun as well, which surprised me. Oh, well, that's a compliment, she teased. No, I. She giggled. I know what you meant. Good night, Isabo. Good night, she said as she slipped inside her room and leaned her back against the door. She was married, she danced with Rowan, and it seemed they'd taken a few steps toward being friends. That, she could handle. As much as she liked him, and she did like him a lot, she wasn't ready for anything else. She could handle being friends, but the butterflies she'd experienced all night said the potential for so much more was there. The thought should have terrified her, but it didn't. It excited her, and it had been a long time since she'd been excited about someone. Chapter 10 A knock came at Rowan's office door, and it opened slightly. Uh, Rowan, it's lunchtime. I thought you might be hungry, Isabeau said as she peeked in. I thought maybe we could have lunch together since you've been so busy lately. His heart skipped a beat and then pounded at the sight of her. Uh, sure. With her shoulder, she pushed through the door carrying a tray with a book tucked under her arm and smiled. I was hoping you could. It wasn't surprising that she carried a book with her. One of the things he'd noticed about her was her voracious reading habit. He stood and walked to the couch. I'm sorry I've been so busy. You've been hiding in here for a week. A girl starts to wonder if she's being avoided. She set the tray down and sat on the couch. There was a little truth to that. She made him nervous. No, I haven't been avoiding you. There's a merger I'm working on, and both parties are being difficult. Oh. Do you often have cases like that? He nodded. Typically, I'm the one that comes in and gets people on the same page. Like a mediator? You could say that. Only, it involves lots of money and jobs. He sat beside her and instantly wanted to breathe in whatever fruity scent she'd worn. Add to it the soft purple blouse and jeans she wore, and it was hard to take his eyes off of her. Well, all that brain activity needs a little fuel, wouldn't you say? You've been talking to Retta, I see. She laughed. I have, and I like her. And Ulysses. He's a very sweet man. I depend on them. Maybe a little too much. You have me now too. I mean, just because this is only for a year doesn't mean we have to stop talking at the end, right? Continue to have a relationship with her? It sounded like a heartbreak waiting to happen. He was already wondering how he was going to keep his distance enough to make it through the year. Falling in love with her would be easy. He was drawn to her, more so than anyone he'd ever met. She bumped him with her shoulder. Right? You're right. Good. I like talking to you. She shot him a smile. Now, there's grilled tomato and cheese with caramelized onions and tomato soup. Another of my favorites. That's what Retta said. She chewed her lip. By the way, I'm a horrible cook. It's a good thing you have Retta, or your choices would be limited to cold-cut sandwiches and peanut butter and jelly. Can you cook? He laughed. I do okay. Retta is a good teacher. I know. She's been teaching me. I'm just not confident enough to say I've graduated to anything more complicated than sandwiches. This is a sandwich. A complicated sandwich. Caramelized onions are tricky. I burned the first pan. Did you make this one? She nodded. With a little extra supervision. Retta didn't believe when I told her I was a menace in the kitchen. I'm sure that with her guidance, you'll be a pro in no time. It wasn't until he took a bite that he realized just how hungry he was. Isabeau pulled hers apart and nibbled a bite. Oh, this is good. I was suspicious of the onions, she said and took a larger bite. He chuckled. You're very funny. And you look lovely today. 
You say that every time you see me. Because it's true, and it applies even when I don't see you. A light blush of pink blanketed her cheeks. Thank you. You can't tell me you don't know that. She laid her hands in her lap. I've been told that, but I like the way you say it. I don't feel like a mouse when it comes from you. What a curious thing to say. A mouse? You aren't a predator. I don't feel like a mouse caught by a cat. The way you say it, it's sweet, and I like it. It means more to me coming from you. She lifted her gaze, and those green eyes of hers locked with his, causing every ounce of air in his lungs to suddenly feel squeezed out. Even when he dated before the accident, he never remembered feeling such a strong desire to hold a woman or kiss her. Then I will remember to say it every time I see you. Her wide smile was his reward. Those soft, luscious lips curved in such an alluring way that it was torture not to bend down and taste them. He cleared his throat and looked away before he did something insane like actually kiss her. Thank you for lunch, by the way. You're welcome. I've been missing you, so it was really for selfish reasons. I never thought I'd be thankful for selfishness. She shot him a glance. Do you know how charming you are? I'm not charming. I'm grouchy, standoffish, and pig-headed. Isabo lifted an eyebrow. You can shovel that somewhere else. You use that as a way to push people away. I'm not buying it anymore. He laughed, and it came from such a deep place that it threw him. You aren't, huh? She shook her head. Nope. You are a big softy with a loud bark. I'm so glad you have me figured out. He was flirting with her. When was the last time he'd flirted with a woman? And it felt as if she was flirting back, but she was sweet, and he was probably reading too much into it. It wasn't like he was an expert on flirting. With a one-shoulder shrug, she said, someone had to. May as well be me. Yeah, he was thinking the same thing. And he had to admit, since she popped into his life, he'd seen the world a little differently. Even just something as simple as quietly eating lunch together made him feel lighter. Even with the temptation to kiss her ever-present, he liked how she made him feel. Normally, he'd be terrified, but she was so easy to be with. He also didn't feel he needed to hide from her, which was another shock. It wasn't until then that he realized he hadn't been hiding from her since they went to the courthouse. I'm glad it was you, he said. See? Charming. Rowan laughed. I think you might bring out the best in me, so I'll give you credit for that. Okay, Mr. Charming, I guess I should let you get back to work, she said and stood. Thank you for thinking of me. He moved to the edge of the couch to stand, and she turned. As she looked down at him, the world faded. She combed her fingers through his hair. You're wrong. What? You are gorgeous. Isabeau, he said and tried to turn away. She caught his face in her hands, lowered her lips to the mottled, burned skin on his left cheek, and pressed them to it. When she leaned back, she locked eyes with him. You are. Every inch of you is gorgeous. And those scars are the loveliest part. What? His skin was horrific. How could she think that and mean it? I don't know how you can say that. Those scars are a testament to your courage and will to live, even though life wasn't going to be easy. It takes no forethought, courage, or strength to walk through life when the world loves you. It's scars like yours that prove big battles can be fought and won. You give me hope that I can win mine. And whatever it took, she would win. He'd see to that. Holding her gaze as he stood, he said, you'll win yours, even if I have to carry you. He brushed her hair over her shoulder, thinking he should back away slowly before he lost his head. I should work tonight, but it's my birthday today. I hadn't planned to celebrate, but, if you'd like, we can have a picnic in the garden. I'll make sure the lights are turned on. 
What? That's not what he'd meant to say. He'd meant to say, I'll see you later, or something similar. Not to invite her to spend the evening with him so he could pick the shovel back up and dig the hole deeper. Your birthday? And you didn't tell me? It's nothing. I never make a big deal of it. I will. She clapped her hands and kissed his cheek again. Happy birthday. I'd love to have a picnic with you. But now that he'd opened his mouth and stuck his entire size 12 foot in it, he couldn't back out. Then consider it a date, between friends. I'll go tell Retta, she said and picked up the tray. You've made my day, Mr. Charming. He laughed. I'll meet you on the veranda. Say, seven? Isabeau pulled her bottom lip in between her teeth as she smiled. Okay. Rowan caught himself watching her as she exchanged her book and then danced out of his office. Why was he torturing himself? There was no way this could end well. But she'd held his gaze as she'd called him gorgeous and his scars lovely. She'd touched those perfect lips to his scars. And as strange as the sensation was, he didn't mind her doing it. Anyone else, and he'd have thrown them out. But her? He found himself wanting to show her the parts of himself he'd hidden away. Except, maybe she wouldn't think him so courageous if she knew how many times he thought of giving up. What would she say if she knew he'd locked himself away with a plan and the intent to be less courageous than she gave him credit for? A knock came at the door, and it opened. For a brief moment, he hoped she'd returned, but it was his uncle. You've made a certain young woman delightfully happy, Ulysses said. What are you talking about? His uncle rolled his eyes. Please. Izzy practically beamed as she told Retta that she was having a picnic with you tonight. It's just a picnic. I'm trying to be friends with her. That's all. Well, just so you know, she was glowing. She's always glowing. Always beautiful. He wanted to say, always in my thoughts, but Ulysses would never let him live that down. She is beautiful. Don't say that around her, please. She doesn't like that word. His uncle's eyebrows knitted together. She doesn't like the word beautiful? Why? Rowan shrugged. I don't know, but maybe over the course of this year, I'll find out. I could run another background check, his uncle said. Shaking his head, Rowan said, no. I want her to tell me. Whatever happened is big, and prying would be wrong. If whoever hurt her is still alive, I'll make them wish they weren't. I'll help. I'm sure Retta would too. Izzy is rather infectious. Bubbly, smiling, happy. She floats everywhere she goes. I've never seen sunshine on legs before, but the way she lights up a room, there's no doubting that's what she's made of. Rowan walked to the chair behind his desk and lowered himself into it. And she's out of my league. Does she share that sentiment? She doesn't have to share it. I know it, and I'll make sure to keep my distance. Ulysses crossed his arms over his chest and held Rowan's gaze. Somehow, I don't see that happening. She's good for you. She has a light that doesn't need to be hidden in this house. He leaned back in his chair and stared at the papers on his desk. Then go out with her. You're an adult. It's time to shrug off those old memories and make new ones. Rowan lifted his gaze, but his uncle was already gone. Shrug off old memories. It had taken years to get over his so-called friend's betrayal. Or what felt like betrayal at the time. In truth, he wasn't sure he would have behaved any different. Maybe it was time to forgive, let go of the past, and stop letting it control his future. It was also easier said than done, and he wasn't sure he could. Chapter 11 This was the best idea. Thank you for having a picnic with me, Izzy said as she popped a grape into her mouth. Even though it's your birthday, I feel like the one who got the gift. 
No, with his head in his hand as he reclined on his side, he smiled. I may have had the idea, but I'm the one who should be thanking you. Thank you for the cupcake. She couldn't put her finger on it, but something about him had changed since lunch. He seemed so much more relaxed. It was a good look for him too. He smiled more. Laughed more. Both of which she enjoyed. Retta and I just ran to the bakery and got one. You had to have something. Did you like it? It was very good. He smiled. Oh, those lips and that smile. All afternoon, her mind had been occupied with thoughts of kissing him, which she'd nearly done. He was looking up at her at lunch with those chocolate eyes, and never had she been so tempted to kiss someone in her life. She'd kissed him at their wedding, but that had been for the minister. What would it be like to really kiss him? No one but the two of them? Would there be fireworks and tingles? By the way, you look lovely tonight, he said. Their earlier conversation came to mind, and she couldn't stop the smile from stretching across her lips. No one had ever called her lovely and made her blush like Rowan. There was something in the way he said it. The lilt of his voice, the way he looked at her. When he said it, it wrapped around her heart and made her want to be closer to him. She touched her cheek. I think you just like making me blush. He chuckled. That is a delightful side effect. Charmer. About a foot away, she lay on her side, mirroring him. I've been meaning to ask you something. What's that? I've been all over this house, and I haven't seen any workout equipment. I know you do, because you're so fit, so where is it hiding? All those muscles coupled with his sweet nature, that's why she felt safe with him. He'd use his strength to protect her. After my father died, I had the second floor on the east wing remodeled. The entire floor on that side is my room, and the equipment is in there. She lifted on her elbow. That makes sense. Do you work out in the morning before you come downstairs? He nodded. Yes, it started as a way to stretch my body after the accident. Now it's a way of working out frustration or waking me up. I can see that. Did you have a lot of physical therapy after your accident? About six months with a therapist and another six months of following the directions for exercises she left. Mostly it was to keep me active because I was depressed. He cast his gaze down like there was shame in being depressed. She scooted closer. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Depression is common after a life-altering event. My friend Kelsey is a psychologist. I wasn't her patient, but we did talk a lot after I got out of the hospital. He lifted his gaze back to hers. Was she already living in Dallas when you went into the hospital? Izzy nodded. They thought Stephen was finally locked up. It had been a year of being paranoid, frightened, and isolated. Yeah, I got sick after she moved here. When she found out what happened, she flew in and stayed with me. And you moved here after you were released? Yes, I couldn't live in Portland anymore. Kelsey insisted I move in with her. It was good for me, having someone to talk to. Plus, the move had helped her with healing. Knowing Stephen was in Oregon and she was in Dallas helped with her peace of mind. And she kept her whereabouts from everyone except the DA so Stephen couldn't find her. He rolled onto his back. I bet it was. I had my father, Retta, and Ulysses, but I was so angry with the world. I wanted to die, and more than once, I tried. She sat up and moved closer, turning to face him as she leaned over him, bracing her hand in the grass. That breaks my heart, but I understand. I'm sure it was hard to adjust to a new normal. I didn't know how I was supposed to live like this. The people I called friends couldn't even stand to look at me. What were other people supposed to think? I was alone, and for months, I was in excruciating pain. I can't begin to describe that. I'm sure you were. 
I worked with a few burn patients. A little girl and an elderly man who'd accidentally set his kitchen on fire. She started to touch his cheek and pulled back. If they were going to make a friendship work, he needed to want to let her in. Forcing it wouldn't work long term and she didn't want him to become frustrated with her. He took her hand and pressed the palm against the side of his face. I've never done this before, but you don't seem to mind. His eyes slid closed as she moved her fingertips across his skin. Izzy smiled. I don't. I don't know that I'll ever be able to understand why. There are some things that remain a mystery in life. She laughed and slipped her fingers into his hair. He had to have the softest hair she'd ever touched. The temptation to kiss him hit, and it was even stronger now than it was at lunch. Every interaction with him was creating a need to be even closer. His eyes popped open. You are that. I'm really not. She smiled. I did tell you that you look lovely tonight, right? She nodded. Yes, you did. I guess it needed to be said a second time. How was she going to keep her lips to herself when he was being so sweet and vulnerable? Especially when she was so close. She should move away, take things down a step, but he was a magnet so powerful she couldn't resist the pull. In an instant, the air felt thick, and it was as if they were the only two people on earth. Her blood was rushing in her ears as her heart raced faster. Before she knew what she was doing, she leaned in and said, Stay still and don't move, okay? His eyebrows knitted together. Is something wrong? Izzy shook her head as she gathered her courage. Nothing was wrong. For the first time in as long she could remember, she was falling for someone, and not just any someone. A sweet man with a gentle spirit who was looking up at her with an irresistible pair of lips. She threaded her fingers through his hair and lowered her lips to his, brushing hers across his in a feathery touch. His lips were sweet and soft, and it was bliss wrapped in heaven. This time it wasn't for show, and the fireworks were just as colorful as the first time. Twice more, she brushed her lips across his, and with the last, she nipped at his bottom lip and deepened the kiss. She had no idea how long they kissed, but when she pulled back, her lips felt bruised. It was a good feeling too. I, she began. He shook his head, and she had to lean back as he sat up. No, I think, I think I need to go. What? But he kissed her back. You kissed me back, right? I did, and I shouldn't have. I've made things confusing. I can't be more than friends with you, Isabo, he said and stood. I'm sorry. Then he walked away so fast he was nearly a blur. She didn't think she wanted to be more than friends either, but with the way her heart was aching, it hadn't received the message. And, oh, how she hurt. She'd kissed him, and he didn't want her. He'd rejected her without even knowing her past. What would he do if he found out? Tears pooled in her eyes, and she touched her fingers to her lips. Izzy slowly gathered the picnic items and put them in the basket. As she walked back to the house, she decided she'd apologize. She didn't want to cause problems or make things awkward. They were adults and could talk about what happened after they had a moment to think. He'd understand, right? That she'd made a mistake and that it was okay. She wouldn't kiss him again. When she reached the kitchen, Retta stood at the sink and turned as she entered. Well, hello. How was the picnic? Izzy slid onto a stool as she put the basket on the island. I think I may have made a mistake. Retta picked up a dish towel and dried her hands. What kind of mistake? Izzy's cheeks heated. I'm embarrassed. Whatever you say will stay between us. Retta reached across the island and patted Izzy's hand. I promise. I, I kissed Rowan. Retta grinned. You did? That's nothing bad. He's a sweet man. Izzy nodded. 
He is, but I think I read things wrong. He said he can only be friends with me and that we shouldn't have kissed. I didn't mean to mess things up. I really like him, and I guess I got caught up in the moment. He said you shouldn't have kissed? She nodded. But I'll just talk to him, and I'm sure it'll be fine. I can apologize and assure him it'll never happen again. You think that'll fix it? Retta nodded as her eyebrows knitted together. I'm sure it will. He was probably caught off guard, and once he has a moment to think it through, he'll be more than happy to accept your apology. Hearing that made her feel better. She didn't want to lose her budding friendship with Rowan. She wasn't sure if she wanted more than that, but not being around him at all made her ache in ways she didn't think were possible. That's good to know. Sure, and I got the chamomile tea you asked for. Retta pointed to a cabinet above the sink. There's a huge stash in there, and you're free to drink as much as you need. Thank you. I appreciate that. Are you sleeping any better? Izzy shook her head. No, but the tea helps. That wasn't entirely true. Mostly it was something warm to drink when she woke up in the middle of the night. Well, if you need anything else, let me know. I don't mind. Thank you, and thank you for the picnic. The food was wonderful. Retta smiled. You're welcome, my sweet girl. With one last good night, Izzy slowly made her way to the stairs, pausing when she got to the top landing to glance to her left. Part of her was tempted to go to Rowan and fix what she'd broken right that minute. The other part, the one that propelled her feet in the direction of her room, knew he needed a moment. Izzy hugged herself as she went to her room and slipped inside. It was still so big and cold. Most women would have loved how big and spacious the room was, but it made her feel tiny and alone. She walked to the bed and dropped onto it. She should change, but she was emotionally drained and tired. Why had she kissed him? If she just kept her lips to herself, they'd probably still be in the garden talking. She'd mess things up so badly. Why did she have to do that? What made her think he wanted her anyway? Just because he was charming? He'd been kind to her, and she'd abused it. She knew what that felt like. How could she have done that to another person? Hugging herself tighter, she curled into a ball and let the tears flow. She'd managed to break the one good thing she'd found since her ordeal with Stephen. But Retta was optimistic that he'd be okay with time, so she'd cling to that hope. She and Rowan would be okay, and at the moment, that meant everything to her. Chapter 12 The door of Rowan's office opened, and he looked up. Retta? It was past the time that she should have gone home, so he was shocked she was still in the house. I've waited more than a month, hoping and praying you'd come to your senses and talk to Izzy. Retta stood statuesque at the door with her chin in the air. By her stance, he could tell he was in trouble. He hadn't meant to avoid her for so long, but in the days following their picnic, he'd been so out of sorts that he couldn't speak to her. Then a week turned into two and two into a month. It had been difficult to stay away from her at the beginning, but he decided in the last week that it was for the best. They'd both be better off if they stayed away from each other. Rowan leaned back in his chair. I know, but I'm sure she's fine. She has the run of the house, a large room to call her own, and enough spending money that she could shop until she quite literally dropped. Retta stomped over to him and took him by the ear. Ow. Oh. What are you doing? She hadn't done that to him in years. I've been hoping you'd speak to her on your own, but I've waited all I'm going to. He tried to pull away, and Retta gripped his ear tighter. Retta, you haven't done this to me since I was ten. Then you're about due for it. She pinched his ear a little harder. You are not behaving like the man I raised. You don't treat a woman like this. She let his ear go and crossed her arms over her chest. Do you have any idea how badly you hurt that sweet girl? Rowan knew, 
but it was better to have a little hurt now than a lot of hurt later. He stood as he rubbed his ear and walked to the couch. It's for the best. It keeps us both safe. Safe? There's no such thing as safe. She's leaving in less than 11 months. It's one thing to know you'll live your life alone. That's hard enough, but to know what it's like to be cared for and feel connected to someone, I won't survive that. I barely survived after the accident. Retta uncrossed her arms and took his face in her hands. She kissed you, Rowan. That doesn't say leaving. Why do you assume she will? He nearly laughed. The absurdity. Because she will. And if she doesn't, she should. If I care at all about her, I won't let her be tied down to someone like me. She needs to be on the arm of someone who can take her places and experience the world with her. That can't be me. She dropped her hands. Have you seen her recently? Even bothered to check in to see if she's okay? He shook his head and whispered, no he didn't have the courage to do that. She'd kissed him, and he'd run like a coward. Rowan, that young woman is haunted by something. She was already having difficulty sleeping, but since that picnic, it's gotten worse. I've been buying her chamomile tea, and she's drinking it like it's water, and yet, well, you'll have to gather some courage and see for yourself. The young woman who was full of life is not so full of life anymore. It's probably that she hasn't adjusted to living here yet. It's only been five weeks. But even as he said it, he knew that wasn't true. She'd allowed herself to be vulnerable, and he'd thrown her away. Something is troubling that sweet girl, but if that's what you want to convince yourself of, then there's nothing more I can do. Izzy is not doing well. And if you are half the man I think you are, you'll figure out how to fix this sooner than later. She turned slightly and then faced him again. What happened to the kind-hearted, gentle soul I raised? Rowan clenched his jaw tight. He was burned up in an accident, he ground out. That's not true. I've seen your sweet spirit since then. You're choosing to cut yourself off. You think doing so will save you pain. Is it? Do you feel safer holed up in your office with your walls and excuses? He turned away from her and walked to the chair behind his desk. I have work to do, Retta. I don't have time for a discussion of this nature. She crossed the room to the door. I've never been so ashamed of you in my life, and I'm not the only one who would be ashamed either. He'd never heard those words from her before. Harsh words, sure, but never that she was ashamed of him. Retta? She kept her back to him and held up her hand. Save your words. You look like my Rowan. Talk like my Rowan. But you, who, whatever you are, are not my Rowan. When you find him, let me know. In stunned silence, he watched her leave his office. Retta wasn't one to play nice when things needed to be said. She'd tell him what he needed to hear, but she'd never spoken to him like that before. He disappointed her in the past. He knew that. But this felt like more than that. As if he'd somehow shown the world she was a bad parent, and he hated that she might think that way. Yes, he'd hurt Isabeau, and at first, that hadn't been what he'd meant to do. He'd liked that kiss. He'd wanted to take her in his arms and kiss her so badly that it hurt, but he also knew that he didn't want to hurt her. Keeping her tied to him was selfish. It was better this way. Isabeau might have a few sleepless nights in the short term, but long term, she'd be better off. Still, the idea that she wasn't sleeping well and that it appeared she was haunted by something did grip him. Someone had hurt her, and it made him wonder if that was keeping her restless. He'd wanted to gain her trust enough that she'd confide in him. How exactly was he supposed to do that when he'd thrown her away? And avoiding her wasn't going to win him confidence points either. He raked his hand through his hair. What a mess he'd made, and all because he was terrified. That was the right word. 
she'd kissed him and he'd panicked. Why, though? He'd debated the answer to that question since the night of the picnic. The only conclusion he'd come to was that he was falling for her, and that scared him even more than the kiss. Isabeau deserved better from him. He could be friends with her, and he would despite the pain it would cause. Now that he had a taste of what being with her was like, there was no amount of staying away that would dull that ache when she left. Rowan stood and strode out of his office, and as his foot touched the top step, he heard a crash come from the kitchen. He hurried through the house and slid to a stop just inside. Isabeau was on the floor, surrounded by shards of a broken cup. Are you okay? he asked. She lifted her gaze to his, and his breath caught. Her eyes were covered with such dark circles that it looked like she'd been in a fight. I'm fine. Go back to your office. I'm sure you have plenty of work to keep you busy. He squatted down. Let me help you up. He reached for her, and she shrank back. I don't want your help. I was stupid to think I could trust you. Casting her gaze to the floor, she rubbed her nose with the back of her hand and sniffed. The first person I'd trusted since I was attacked, and you've avoided me for a month. Serves me right. Attacked? What do you mean attacked? I guess it doesn't matter. It's not like you want anything to do with me anyway. Oh, Retta was right. He'd hurt her deeply. More so than he could have imagined. I promise I will be your friend. She lifted her gaze to his again. And your promises mean what, exactly? So far, your word means nothing, so your promises don't hold a lot of value. I'm sorry I kissed you. If you had just let me apologize, but you threw me away without even speaking to me. The knives she threw were hitting him square in the heart. I know, and I deserve that. I should have spoken to you, and I was a coward. I treated you horribly, and I can't promise I won't be stupid again. I won't do it on purpose, though. I can give you my word on that. Why wouldn't you just talk to me? He hung his head. Retta wasn't the only one ashamed of him now. I don't know. I guess I didn't know how, and before I knew it, a month had passed. Isabeau pushed off the floor and grabbed the counter. I think I'll go back to bed. I'll see you, whenever. Rowan quickly straightened and caught her just as her knees buckled. I don't think you can make it to your room on your own. I can. She tried to pull away and nearly fell again. Isabeau, please let me help you. She pointed her face up at him and his chest tightened as her eyes locked with his. I hate that I feel safe with you. You hurt me, and yet I do. Something I haven't felt with anyone in such a long time. It's not fair, she said as her eyes turned glassy. His heart was breaking. I'm so sorry I hurt you. He slipped his arm under her knees and lifted her into his arms. You need some rest, and then we'll talk. You smell so good, and you're so warm. She took a deep breath and circled her arms around his neck. I really like you. I just wish you'd stop being such a jerk. He couldn't stop himself from smiling, even if it did seem wrong. I will do my best to refrain from being a jerk. Isabeau yawned. You should do that. Rowan chuckled, and instead of responding, he took her to her room. As he began to lay her on the bed, she tightened her arms around his neck. No. No, please don't leave me in here alone. Please. He scooped her back up and sat on the bed with his back against the headboard and her in his lap. I'll stay until you ask me to leave. Her body relaxed in arms and slid down until he was cradling her. You'll be here a while. She gave him a small smile. With a yank, he pulled a blanket from the bed and wrapped it around her. That's okay. I have a big blunder to make up for. She nodded as she sighed. That's true. 
You owe me another picnic too. Rowan chuckled. I do? Uh-huh. I promise we will have another picnic. She slid her hand up his chest and curled a lock of his hair around her finger. I'll hold you to that. I am so sorry I hurt you. It was wrong, and I can't tell you how much I regret it. This house is very big and empty. I like Retta and Ulysses, but they aren't you. I've missed you. She brushed the back of her hand along his cheek. I've missed all of you. How did she do that? What was even crazier was that he knew she was being sincere. He could see it in her eyes, and she was too exhausted to hide anything from him. She was walking sunshine. Pure and crisp and bright enough to reach every dark corner. He cupped her cheek. To be honest, I've more than missed you. Things are much more boring when you aren't around. Her eyes slid closed, and she went limp. Rowan's gaze roamed over her face, moving from one cute freckle to the next. He'd made promises he had to keep, and he knew it would rip him to pieces later on. But he'd made them, and he intended to keep them. He was going to go down in a blaze, and this time, he'd be a charred mess when the wreckage was cleared, with no hope of recovery. Chapter 13 Pushing against the wall, Izzy opened her eyes to find that it was Rowan's chest her hand was resting on. When had he come into her room, and why was he holding her? He'd been avoiding her for weeks. Every time she tried to speak to him to apologize, he'd sent her away, until she'd eventually given up. Rowan? He blinked awake. Hi. Are you okay? Why are you here? I found you in the kitchen last night after you broke a cup. You were exhausted, so I brought you to your room. When I tried to leave, you asked me to stay. She'd done that? I don't remember. I don't even remember going to the kitchen. You couldn't even stand. You nearly fell twice, which is why I brought you to your room. Most of the last few days are hazy. I haven't had this much trouble sleeping in a while. I have nightmares most nights, but they've been worse lately. She yawned. It feels like I haven't slept at all. There's nothing saying you can't go back to sleep. Why did you stay? I told you. You asked me to. She sat up. But it makes no sense. You've avoided me. He nodded. I know, and it was wrong. Why didn't you talk to me? You wouldn't let me apologize. I'm sorry I kissed you. I won't do it again. I promise. Stupid tears. She swiped at them and looked away. It was silly to be so weepy. He took her chin and made her look at him. I can't express how truly sorry I am that I hurt you. If I could take it back, I would, but I can't. All I have is my apology. You're the first person to get this close to me in a long time, and that's not easy for me. I took my insecurities out on you. You could have just said that. I would have, I do understand. I should have, but hindsight seems less blurry. She laid her head against his chest, hugged him, and breathed him in. I've missed you. He wrapped his arms around her and squeezed her to him. I've missed you too. You have my word that I won't try to kiss or be more than friends with you. She sat up and caught his gaze. I promise. That's. No, you're probably right. It's better that we stay friends, she said as her heart broke. It was true, but apparently, her heart wasn't in sync with her head. For a moment, she wondered if he looked as though he'd disagree, but then he nodded. My thoughts exactly. Friends. It had been a great word when she first met him. Now it felt like a noose. Did she want more than friendship? She didn't know, not when it was so easy for him to hurt her time after time, but knowing there was no chance for anything more made her stomach turn. She palmed her forehead and closed her eyes. 
I don't feel good. I don't think I'm sick, just tired, and my head hurts. How about I bring up some hot tea and something for your head? Maybe a little toast or something? And you'll stay with me? He nodded. I'm yours for as long as you want me. Forever, screamed a little voice in the back of her mind, but Izzy quickly shut it down. She knew what it felt like to have someone pushing themselves on her. She wasn't going to do that to Rowan. He was comfortable with friendship, so that's what he'd get. She forced a smile. At least for the day since I haven't seen you in so long. Will it take too much time away from your work? No, it'll be fine, he said and slid her out of his lap and onto the bed. I'll be right back. Will you be okay? I'll be fine. She waited until he left the room and curled onto her side with her back facing the door. At least he was talking to her. She'd given up hope that he'd ever speak to her again. Whatever brought the change, she was grateful. It wasn't until she'd woken up in his arms that she realized how much she missed him. It was disconcerting to know that she had no memory of the night before, but not completely shocking. Her nightmares were awful as of late. They'd cycle through with one where Stephen hurt Rowan, one where Rowan wanted nothing to do with her and Stephen would laugh like he'd known all along that no one would want her, and the worst one was Stephen finding her and finishing what he started while Rowan wasn't able to help her or stop him. They were enough to wake her up and keep her from sleeping the rest of the night. Of course, she'd catch little naps during the day, but they weren't enough to make up for the restless, sleepless nights. But Rowan had found her the night before, and she'd slept until daylight was pouring through the window. It had been peaceful and pleasant, and there had been no nightmares. She pulled the collar of her shirt to her nose and closed her eyes as the faint hint of his cologne filled her senses. It was him. She knew there was safety with him, but to sleep through the night? It was a gift. Is a bow? She sat up and blinked. I think I drifted back to sleep. I wouldn't have woken you, but you said your head was hurting. My mother's headaches would leave her bedbound if she didn't take something as soon as they started. Thank you. Rowan walked to the window and closed the curtains. He picked up a chair and brought it to the bed. Do you want to sit here or stay where you are? What she wanted to say was any distance from him was too much, but instead, she said, I'll just stay here. The tray he brought up was filled with fruit and toast. Although, she wasn't hungry. The awkwardness hanging in the air made what little hunger she had disappear. Rowan sat in the chair and picked up the teapot. Did you still want tea? No, just a little water. Are you sure you're feeling okay? She shook her head. Before she could stop herself, words poured off her tongue so quickly she didn't know how to stop them. I've broken this, and I don't know how to fix it. I liked how easy it was to be around you, and now I don't know my place. I did something I never thought I'd do. She put her hand over her mouth as tears spilled down her cheeks. I'm so sorry I pushed myself on you. I should have been more considerate. He set the teapot down and sat beside her. No, is the bow. I broke this when I avoided you. He took her hand and pressed it against his face. You haven't pushed yourself on me, and your place hasn't changed. Everything is fine. I promise you. And I will try to be better about communicating in the future. All of this was my inability to behave like an adult. You're sure? Rowan pulled her into a hug and kissed the top of her head. I'm positive. Please don't cry anymore. I'm a little pathetic, huh? No, you're lovely and full of sunshine. He was being nice, and she knew it. She could feel the bags under her eyes, and her hair was a mess. All of her was a mess, physically and emotionally. I don't think that applies right now. It applies to you all the time. She curled into him and closed her eyes. I think you're just being nice. We both know I'm not nice. 
I'm grouchy and grumpy, so if I say it, it must be true. Izzy leaned back. It's probably cold by now, but I'll take some of that tea and some toast. He pushed her hair back from her face. Of course, and if it's cold, I'll go heat it up, and we'll try again. Okay. She needed to get herself together before he decided she was too big of a basket case to deal with, and she was now certain she couldn't tell him about Stephen. She'd keep her secrets packed away, and when she left at the end of the year, she'd take them with her. In a way, it made her sad. She'd liked the idea of getting to know him well enough to tell him what happened. Kelsey was the only one she'd talked to about it. Well, other than police and hospital staff. But that was different. Sharing it with Rowan had an appeal because she knew he'd understand, unlike most. Now that she wouldn't be letting him in on that part of her life, it was a letdown. Like watching a birthday cake get dumped on the floor before getting to the table. All that anticipation, and just splat. No cake. No candles. Just a mess to clean up. And that's how she felt. She was a mess that needed to be cleaned up, only no one knew how. Chapter 14 With the push of his foot, Rowan rolled his chair to the window directly behind his desk. He hooked a finger along the edge of the curtain and pulled it back to stare out at the leaves changing color. It was already mid-October, and he'd already been married to Isabeau for over two months. I really think, his uncle's voice trailed off as Rowan's thoughts drifted. As much as he tried concentrating on work, it was becoming increasingly difficult because he was worried about Isabeau. Some two months ago, she'd kissed him, he'd panicked, and in the process, something in her had been doused. At first after he'd apologized, she seemed fine, but as the following month passed, the sunshine in her had dimmed until it seemed a hollow shell was residing in his home. No matter how much he reassured her that everything was okay, she grew more and more withdrawn. Most of the time, barely looking at him or being near him. She'd even stopped reading. Her nightmares were better. Of course, that was because he'd taken up sleeping in the chair next to her bed, despite her protests that she was fine being alone in the room. The times he'd relented, he'd come back later to find her tangled in the sheets and screaming. There was no holding her anymore, though. The closer he tried to move, the longer her arm grew. And that's when the sword-wielding frogs stormed Buckingham Palace. Rowan looked over his shoulder. What? You haven't heard a word I've said. Thames is expecting this by tomorrow, and we're still trying to work through the list of demands from Werner. I'm worried about Isabeau. I've tried everything I know to piece back together what I broke. I thought everything was okay once I apologized, but since then, something's wrong. I'm at my wit's end, and I'm no closer to repairing it than I was a month ago. Ulysses sank into the chair across the desk from Rowan. Have you told her why you ran? She said she thought it was best if we stay friends. I don't want to make it any more difficult than it already is, and telling her could push her even further away. I can't risk it. I understand that, but if what you're doing isn't working, perhaps being honest with her would help. Do you know why you ran away after she kissed you? Rowan glared at his uncle. Retta had shared that detail with Ulysses, and it had been a battle ever since. Isabeau and I are friends, and I intend to keep us firmly in that category. His uncle nodded. Yes, I can see that, but have you considered that she didn't want to be friends anymore? A woman doesn't kiss a man with the intent of remaining friends. It was a mistake. We were talking, and it happened. That's all. With a snort, his uncle stood. Yes, I'm sure the two of you were talking and her lips just happened to crash into yours. How convenient. Uncle, it's more complicated than that, and you know it. She's better off without me. I've hidden in this house for twelve years. I'm not the right man for her. I just need to find a way to break through her melancholy. Once I do that, she'll be back to her old self. Ulysses held his gaze. 
I'm tired of this argument, so this is the last time I'll say it. You don't get to decide if you're right for her. Only she can do that, and when she kissed you, that was a clue that she didn't agree with you. Rowan shook his head. No. I'm not even going to let myself go there. She said she agreed that we should be friends. I'll respect that. She knew she'd made a mistake too. Only that wasn't the whole story. She'd said that after thinking she'd done something wrong and before he could correct her. Fine. As I said, this is the last time I'll mention it. But you are a fool, Rowan Masters, if you let this woman get away. I know because I speak from experience, he said before he strode to the door and left. Yes, Rowan knew what his uncle meant. He'd let London go and realized he'd made a mistake. Ulysses had called her and begged her to give him one more chance. That's why Rowan was picking her up. His uncle was going to surprise her with dinner and then propose, but London and Rowan never made it. There were times when he still found it difficult to look his uncle in the eyes. Were there other routes he could have taken that night? What if he'd been paying better attention to the road? Would he have seen that deer sooner? Ulysses said he forgave him, but it had taken years to truly accept that forgiveness. He checked the time on his computer. Isabeau would be on the veranda about now, waiting for the sunset. The first time he'd found her out there, it had been a strange feeling. As a boy, he'd catch his parents sitting outside, cuddled together and watching the sun go down. Even stranger, he could picture himself and Isabeau doing the same. It had become a habit over the last four weeks for him to finish work and meet her out there. They wouldn't talk much, just sit and enjoy the evening. What disturbed him was watching the vivacious woman he'd met in July fade. He felt he was watching a star die. Rowan powered down his computer and strode out of his office, through the house, and into the kitchen. Retta? She walked out of the pantry and stopped in the doorway. Yes? I was wondering if there's any candy in the house or anything special. Maybe I can bring a smile to her face with that. He tried everything he knew to do, even getting her things out of storage and surprising her with them. Isobo's response was a small smile and a whispered thank you. Retta smiled. You asked me about that last week, remember? Oh yeah. So, did you get something? I did a little investigative work and found out her favorite is Sour Patch Kids. I've got a whole bag for you to take to her. Retta disappeared inside the pantry and came back out with the candy. Rowan smiled. Thank you, Retta. He walked to her and gathered her into a hug. I hope she smiles. Those do seem to be on the rare side, she said as he released her. He swallowed the house-sized lump in his throat. Those smiles were an endangered species, and he was desperate to see them again. They are. I don't know what to do to get them back. He hung his head. Be there for her. And when she opens up again, don't panic. If you do and you push her away again, you'll lose her. Yeah, he said softly. Don't give up, sweetheart. She's in there somewhere. You just have to keep digging. He nodded and then walked to the double doors leading to the veranda. There is a Boas, curled up in the chair with a blanket just like every night since she'd apologized. He took a deep breath, put on a smile, and stepped out. She didn't even move. Hi, he said as he sat in the chair next to hers. You look lovely tonight. Nothing in response, just, nothing. She'd even stopped telling him he was wrong. It was driving him insane. Look what I've got. He held up the bag of candy. She slowly turned those haunted green eyes toward him and gave him a small smile. That's my favorite candy. Really? Then I guess I'll need to share. He ripped the bag open and held it out to her. No, that's okay. And just like that, his heart was on the floor. She wanted to be friends. 
No, he hadn't corrected her, but he didn't look like a man she belonged with. Isabeau, please tell me what I can do to help you. All your sunshine is gone, and I'm freezing. I need you. Isabeau stood and stopped in front of him. I just don't want my broken pieces cutting you. You should have so much better. Better? Than her? He looked up at her. I will wear extra armor if you will let me be your friend. Her eyebrows drew together as she tilted her head. And being your friend means that I do what's best for you, and that's not me. She pulled the blanket around her shoulders and started to walk away. Rowan stood to follow her. Wait. I'm tired. I think I'll go to my room early tonight. I'm locking the door from now on. That way, you're not spending your nights in a tiny chair watching over me. I'll be okay. Her lips barely curved up. He should tell her. It was a risk, but to have her back, it was worth it. Isabeau, I was wrong about that night. I was scared and... Your first instinct was to pull away, and it was the right call. I just need a little more time, and then I'll be myself again. I know you're worried, but this isn't something you can fix. I'm in microscopic pieces, and I'm the only one who can find them all. No, she couldn't leave. In his gut, he knew that if she left, he'd have no chance of seeing her light again. He snatched the bag of candy out of the chair. Just eat one. I know you love them. Just one. Please, he said, pouring every ounce of desperation he felt into the words. For a brief moment, she held his gaze, and he held his breath. Slowly, she reached her hand into the bag and plucked a red one out. He wanted to pump his fists in the sky and give a victory cry. The corners of her lips lifted ever so slightly, and in the last bit of afternoon sun, he saw a flicker of light in her eyes. My favorite in one try. Inside, he was shouting on the rooftops. It was a small victory, but he'd take it. He took one out and popped it into his mouth. His jaw tightened with the sudden sensation. Oh, that's sour. She smiled and bit hers in half. That's why I like them. Stay with me and help me eat them. Rowan. I can't eat this whole bag, and I know I will if you don't help me eat them. His heart pounded. I have a sneaking suspicion that they're addictive. And then another shock for the night. She actually giggled. So you need me to save you from a potential candy addiction? He nodded, and he didn't care how desperate he looked. Absolutely. Who else is brave enough to do it? What with me being so pig-headed and stubborn? She took a step forward as she held his gaze. Is it okay if I hug you? Only if you let me hold you a while. He dropped the candy in the chair. That won't bother you? He knitted his eyebrows together and tilted his head. Why do you think that would bother me? She cast her gaze down and shrugged. I got to thinking about it and I realized I'd bulldozed over you. Touched you when you didn't want me to, did things that made you feel uncomfortable. I was ashamed I hadn't realized what I was doing and it was the same as what he'd done to me. It made me know better and I didn't like that feeling. All this time she'd been worried she'd hurt him? She thought she was the same kind of person who had hurt her? Oh, Isabeau, no, you didn't bulldoze over me. I needed that push. You weren't doing things out of malice. You were doing it because you cared. There's a huge difference in motivation there. He took her hand in his. You can hug me, touch my face, he wanted to say kiss him because he'd enjoyed it, but he was just getting her back. I'm more than okay with it. She lifted her head, and their eyes locked. You are? Yeah, completely and totally. He took her hand and pressed it against his cheek. You see me differently, and I know it. Or at least he wanted to. He was still coming to terms with it, 
but as far as she was concerned, he was thrilled to have her touch his face, especially if it brought her back. Isabeau smiled. Okay. Then she circled her arms around his neck. As he closed eyes, he wrapped his arms around her and lifted her off the ground. He was never so happy to hold someone in his life, and he sent up prayers of thanks at having the chance. It was like he could finally breathe as relief flooded him. I have missed you, Isabeau. She threaded her fingers through his hair and took a deep breath. I've missed you too. You said you'd hold me for a while. Is that still true? I think I should get to hold you all night long since I have some making up to do. She leaned back. I don't think that's a thing. My house, my rules. He smiled. Her lips curved into that smile that made him weak in the knees. Is that so? Yeah. I'd like that. She hugged him and buried her face in his neck. I'd like that a lot, she said as her lips moved against his skin. He had her back. She was smiling. She was in his arms. She'd giggled. If he'd known Sour Patch Kids had so much power, he'd have purchased a truckload weeks ago. He also knew this thing he had with her was fragile. More fragile than anything he'd ever had, and he would need to be careful not to shatter it. Being without her was no longer an option. He'd fallen for her, and he'd officially lost his footing on that slippery cliff, tumbling down with no end in sight. Chapter 15 It had been over a month since the night Rowan had brought Izzy Sour Patch kids, and things had never been better between them. She could kiss his cheek, touch his face, and get all the hugs she wanted. In return, he got to hold her. In her mind, she had the better deal. That night, he looked desperate as he held out the bag of candy, and she hadn't realized how her actions were affecting him. She thought she'd been doing the right thing by keeping him at a distance. That way, she didn't do things she shouldn't or things she thought she shouldn't. He'd been adamant that he'd never felt pushed or uncomfortable, even though they'd skirted around the issue of the kiss. Still, he'd convinced her they were okay, and she had to admit, being held by him again was better than one of those cozy blankets. The dark cloud hadn't disappeared overnight, but Rowan had helped. Unlike before, instead of holing up in his office and working all the time, he'd continued to spend each evening talking in the garden with her. Cuddling, watching the sunset, and talking and laughing with him had done more for her than she'd ever expected. She couldn't believe they'd already been married for over three months. In two days, it would be Thanksgiving, and Rowan had agreed to let Kelsey come to dinner. Izzy bounced down the steps on her way to the kitchen. Hi, Retta, she said as she stopped by the counter. How can I help today? Well, it's pie day, Retta said and wiped her hands on a dish towel. Her hair was pulled in a bun today, and her blouse and slacks were being protected by an apron that said, touch my quiche and it's on. Izzy lifted on her toes and clapped. Yay. I love pie. I didn't even tell you what kind of pie it is. It's pie. How can that be anything but good? What if it's mincemeat? Izzy grimaced. She wasn't sure what that was, but it didn't sound great. Uh, well, I'd at least try it. Retta tipped her head back and laughed. Honey, I missed you. This house is just a stone building without you. Rowan says that, which is strange. I'm just me. We know and that's the best part. Izzy waved her off. Oh, stop it. She scrunched her nose up. So, really, is it mincemeat pie we're making? We're making cherry, pumpkin, and pecan. Her eyes widened. Yum. I like all of those. Retta chuckled. So does Rowan. You think we could make one extra so I could take him a piece in a little while? I bet he'd like warm pie with ice cream. I think we can manage that. Did I hear someone say pie? Rowan asked as he walked into the kitchen. Jeans and a black t-shirt? Her mouth went dry. 
He was amazing in slacks and a button-up. She loved it when he wore them, but this new look was even better. Those jeans hugged him in ways that set her thoughts on a path that should have been stamped dead end. Only, she was barreling past it Thelma and Louise style. I thought you'd be working, Izzy said. He'd hidden in his office the past week, so she just figured he'd be busy right up until Thanksgiving. No, that's why I was working so hard this week. I usually help Retta cook the pies. Can't steal bites if you don't help. He grinned. Those lips, that grin. But she wasn't going to let herself be tempted again. She'd keep her lips off his and in their own corner. Retta crossed her arms over her chest. You know what? I forgot we're out of cinnamon. Rowan, why don't you start by teaching Izzy how to cook the cherry pie, and I'll run to the store and pick up the cinnamon. Cinnamon? Izzy asked. It's the secret ingredient in her pumpkin pie that makes it so delicious. Retta scoffed. Not so secret if you go around telling everyone. Rowan laughed. It's is a bow. She won't tell anyone. Will you? He asked as his gaze caught hers, his eyes holding a mischievous glint. Nope, she said, running her finger over her lips. Secret's safe with me. Okay, well, you two get started, and I'll be back in a while. Ulysses is out trying to find a turkey. I'd call him, but the man couldn't pick a good quality spice if it bit him on the nose. And with spice, quality is everything. Retta walked toward the pantry and reached inside to pull her coat out and slip it on. Then she reached for her purse. No messing up my kitchen, or I'll put you on kitchen duty for a week. She eyed Rowan before leaving. Izzy turned to him. Why do I get the feeling she had a reason for giving that warning? He shrugged. Paranoia? She poked him in the side. You made a mess in here before. It wasn't my fault. The blender exploded. A giggle popped out, and soon she was laughing so hard her stomach hurt. You're laughing entirely too much. I'm just picturing you standing in front of a blender and then completely frozen as the contents fly everywhere. He chuckled. I wasn't frozen. I was shocked and momentarily in a state of stunned immobility. Also known as frozen. Are you ready to learn how to make a pie, or are you going to just stand there and make fun of me? She chuckled as she held his gaze. I'm an excellent multitasker. His lips quirked up into a smile that made her pulse rocket, and he stepped closer. Before I forget, which I doubt I could, you look lovely today. I'm in old jeans and a shirt. So, even more lovely than normal? Her cheeks warmed as she kissed him on the cheek and circled her arms around his neck. Thank you. He wrapped his arms around her and lifted her off the floor, something he'd started doing every time she hugged him. Most of the time, she could swear she heard him sigh too, but it was so soft that it was more likely she was hearing things. After a few heartbeats, he set her down. Okay, we don't have to make the crust. Retta usually does that the night before because no one can make a crust like her. I'm 30, and I've never gotten the hang of it. Crusts are difficult. Got it. Next. He walked to the fridge and grabbed a bowl filled with dark cherries. We need to cook the cherries before we make the pie. She tilted her head. Really? Otherwise, it's not so good. Trust me. You tried? She chuckled. Rowan nodded and made a face. Yeah, and it was awful. How old were you? Fifteen, but in my defense, the importance of cooking the cherries first was not stressed. Izzy covered her mouth with her hand as she laughed. I would love to have seen Retta's face. She was not happy with me. He pulled the cover off the cherries and snagged one, popping it into his mouth. Would you get the sugar and cornstarch from the pantry? We'll need those while the cherries are still hot. Why? It thickens them. 
Oh. She walked to the pantry and peeked in. It was the same size as her bedroom at the apartment. What continent is this stuff on? She asked as she looked over her shoulder. He pulled a pan out of one of the cabinets and caught her gaze. What? This pantry is huge. I'm not a cook. I don't even know what cornstarch looks like. Rowan lifted an eyebrow. You know, I thought you were kidding about being a horrible cook. She laughed and shook her head. I wasn't. I'm a believer. It should be with the baking supplies. Flour, sugar, spices. I think on the left, middle shelf. Izzy stepped inside, grabbed the sugar and cornstarch, and returned to Rowan who was already at the stove working on heating the cherries. She glanced up at him and smiled. You aren't going to put on an apron? He shot her a glance. Pink isn't my color, and the one I used as a kid is too small. Plus, I'm a lot more careful now. You could use Retta's until she gets back. I'm okay. I'm wearing an old shirt and jeans. If they get dirty, it's fine. She leaned her hip against the counter. And you look great in jeans and a t-shirt. Casual is your friend. Isabeau, he said in that reproaching tone he used when she complimented him. Please believe me. Please. How could she explain it? What could she say to make him understand how utterly desirable he was? She twisted her fingers in her shirt as she cast her gaze to the floor. I'm not blind. I know you were burned. I don't care. You are gorgeous, and anyone who can't see that isn't seeing you the way they should, and their opinion is stupid. You have incredible eyes and kissable lips and, she stopped short as she realized what she'd said and covered her scorching cheeks with her hands. Um. Thank you. She jerked her gaze to his, and a smile curved on his lips. You believe me? He nodded. I'm beginning to. Izzy blinked back tears. Good. Because I mean it. I know. And from anyone else, it would mean nothing to me. Her heart picked up speed. Oh, she wished she could kiss him. Charmer, she said as she gently bumped his shoulder. He shook his head. We've talked about this. I'm not charming. Yeah, we talked, but I disagree. The corners of his eyes crinkled as his smile reached his eyes. Do people ever win arguments when you're the opponent? She grinned. Sure, but only when I'm wrong. You don't admit you're wrong much, do you? She pulled her bottom lip in between her teeth. No. Because I'm not. I see, he said as he held her gaze and stepped closer. I'll remember that for the future. Oh, he was making it so hard. Being this close and smelling amazing. One little lift on her toes, and she'd be kissing him. No. She wasn't doing that again. She liked how their relationship was currently, and she wasn't going to ruin it again. Izzy stepped back. So, what next? And like a spell being broken, he cleared his throat as he put even more distance between them. These need to a cook a bit. We'll go ahead and measure out the cornstarch and sugar. That way, we can add it as soon as they're done. Phew. That had been so close. If she'd kissed him again after promising not to, there was no telling how he'd have reacted. Would he have just flat out kicked her out of his home? He would have had every reason to, and it would have crushed her. Just thinking about leaving him when the year was up was causing all sorts of havoc on her emotions. The longer she was around him, the more of him she wanted. If all she was going to get was a year, she didn't want to do anything that might jeopardize her time with him. She'd cross her T's and dot her I's and make sure she got to stay as long as possible. Chapter 16 Sweat dripped from Rowan's forehead as he pushed himself harder on the treadmill. Every time Isobo's face came to mind, he worked to shake it away. 
Two days ago, he'd nearly kissed her, and since then, he'd hardly been able to keep his mind off her and her perfect lips. It didn't help that she'd taken a step back, like she knew he was about to kiss her and wanted to save him the embarrassment it would have caused. So not only was he analyzing the situation and his actions, but he was picking to pieces her reaction. A knock came from the door, and he slowed his treadmill and jumped off. Usually, Ulysses showed up on Thanksgiving to work out with him. It was his uncle's way of excusing the disgraceful amount of food he would eat. Rowan opened the door, and his eyes went wide. Is a bow. He'd not worn a shirt, and now she had a full view of how badly he'd been burned. What was she doing in the East Wing? Her eyes were wide, and her cheeks blushed pink as she took in his bare torso. Hi, I hope you aren't upset that I came into the East Wing, she said. She slowly lifted her gaze, and her eyes locked with his. She smiled so warmly that his pulse ticked higher. I thought maybe I could start my mornings by exercising with you. Maybe getting some energy out will help me sleep at night. Ulysses said he thought it might be good for me too and suggested I start today. She beamed. He was going to kill Ulysses. I see. And you decided to start Thanksgiving Day? No time like the present, right? I guess. He looked away. Go ahead and say something. Say what, exactly? We've established that you aren't blind. This is why I asked that you stay out of the East Wing. We've also established that I think you're gorgeous. He jerked his gaze to hers. How can you say that? His torso looked as though it had been eaten and spit back out. Because I think you are, and there's more to you than how you look. Yes, you are scarred, and yes, it is hard to see, but not because it's difficult to look at, but because it breaks my heart to know you suffered something so awful. She lowered her gaze, reached her fingers out, and brushed them across the scars running around his ribs and across his chest. I can't imagine the pain you were in. How agonizing it must have been. She lifted her gaze to his, and her eyes were glassy. I hate that you went through this. I don't know how you do that. She sighed. I care about you. I have more scars than that one I showed you. Would you think less of me if you saw them? You call me lovely every day. Would that change if you knew what's hidden beneath my clothing? Not in the least. Her sunshine, incredible smile, and the joy that radiated off her everywhere she went wouldn't be changed by anything, including scars. He shook his head. No, scars are not, you are lovely, and you are lovely every day. How do you do that? He lowered his gaze and smiled. Your point is made, he said as he stepped aside, waving her in. I have an elliptical, treadmill, and recumbent bike. You may take your choice. Thank you. She strode past him and stopped in front of the bike next to the treadmill. I think this will be good. I liked biking before, I got sick. You've never explained how they figured out what was wrong. He snatched the shirt off the handle of the treadmill. Typically, he'd start with one on and take it off after he got warmed up, but if his elbow was going to be working out with him, he didn't feel comfortable leaving it off. As he pulled on his shirt, he stepped on the treadmill and started it up again. Isabeau slid onto the bike seat. It was just an immunity thing. A few tests while I stayed in the hospital, and I was fine. By the way she said it, the tremble in her voice, he knew there was more to it. She said she'd been attacked, that she had more scars hidden beneath her clothing. He wondered if maybe that attack is what landed her in the hospital, but he wouldn't push it. When she was ready to tell him, she would. Or at least he hoped to gain enough of her trust that she'd open up. I guess it's good they were able to treat it, then. She nodded. Yeah, she said, grunting as she tried to pedal. Do you actually ride this thing? I can barely move the pedals. He laughed. Yes, but I've had a lot of years riding it. I can tell. 
How do I ease the tension? She glanced around the bike. Pausing his workout, he jumped off the treadmill and kneeled next to the bike so he could change the tension to make it easier for her. Try that. Isabeau pushed the pedals with her feet and smiled. That works. Thank you. You're welcome, he said as he went back to his workout. You never did answer me. Do you mind if I work out with you of a morning from now on? That is, if it helps me sleep. He shook his head. No, I don't mind. But he'd be wearing a shirt from now on, which he didn't like. The fabric rubbed against his scars and made them hurt. Her smile widened. Thank you. The next hour, they exercised in companionable silence, and he found that he liked having her with him. No, they weren't having a conversation, but having her close was nice. He could see himself getting used to having her around during his workout and then missing her when the year was up. When he'd run as far as he could, he slowed the treadmill and swiped his arm across his forehead. Do you always run that hard and fast? Isabeau asked. Typically. I think I'd pass out. She stopped pedaling and stood, her knees buckling as she did. He caught her around the waist and pulled her to him. Are you okay? She laid her hands on his biceps and nodded. Yeah, but I might die of embarrassment. I haven't worked out in a long time. You'll need to take it easier tomorrow. Maybe 15 minutes instead of an hour. I think you're probably right. Just as she lifted her head, her eyes locked with his, and if air could sizzle, it would have. The little lift of her lips in a smile, the way her eyes twinkled, and the blanket of pink on her cheeks, she was joy in female form, and he was a moth in her flame. Before he could stop himself, he said, I want to ask you something, but I'm afraid to. The risk, I, I can't go another two months without your sunshine. Her eyebrows knitted together. You won't. No matter what it is, I won't do that again. Ask me whatever you need to ask, and I'll do my best to answer. In an instant, a bubble formed around them. The world fell away, and it was just them. His heart pounded in his ears, and just when he thought he'd lose his courage, the words tumbled out. I want to kiss you. I've never wanted to kiss anyone as much as I want to kiss you. Would you, would you let me kiss you? Isabeau blinked a few times and nodded. Yes. Why did he feel like he was in high school again, crushing on a girl? But he did. It had been so long since he'd felt anything for anyone that he wasn't even sure how to start a kiss. Yes, he'd kissed her, but she'd instigated it. This was different. As his pulse raced higher, he touched his lips to hers, and the same zaps of electricity coursed through him as the last time. With the next brush of his lips across hers, he deepened the kiss and lifted her off the floor. She circled her arms around his neck, threading her fingers in his hair, and a soft moan escaped. He loved the feel of her in his arms, the way her body molded against his, and how soft she was. Holding her with one arm, he slid his other hand up her back, letting it come to rest on her cheek. The more he kissed her, the faster he barreled down the cliff. If he did fall for her, how would he survive without her? Would she want to stay with him? He pulled back, gulping air, and set his forehead against hers. We should probably get ready for lunch. Mmm, she murmured as she touched her lips to his, and he was lost again. He shouldn't be kissing her. What he should be doing was keeping his distance so he didn't get his heart broken, but she felt so good in his arms, and her lips were so sweet. Everything about her called to him. He felt whole when she was with him. When she broke the kiss her gaze locked with his, and she pushed his hair back from his face. I guess I'll go get ready for lunch now. See you in a little while? He nodded as he set her feet on the floor. Kelsey is coming, right? Yes. She smiled. Thank you for letting her eat with us. I know it's not easy for you to let someone you don't know come over. As long as you're happy, I'll be fine. 
Her eyes twinkled like he'd given her a gift, and she said, I won't be long. Rowan walked to the door with her and shut it as she left. If he wasn't confused before, he was now. She wasn't staying, so why had he kissed her? Why was he making this worse on himself? Then again, what if Ulysses was right? She did kiss him back. What if that meant there was a chance she wouldn't want to leave when the year was up? No, he was letting his mind run down a rabbit hole of what-ifs. She was, well, he didn't know why she would kiss him back. Maybe she was lonely, and he was available. It wasn't like she had her choice of guys now that she was stuck with him. He pulled his shirt off as he walked to the bathroom and turned the shower on. There was no point in dwelling on any of it at the moment. Her friend Kelsey would be arriving soon, and he needed to be preparing himself for that. The last time he had anyone over as a guest was right after his accident. His father and uncle had talked him into having a party. It was meant to celebrate him surviving the crash, but it had turned out a disaster. What his family didn't know was that not only had he found out his girlfriend was seeing his best friend, but he'd overheard them talking and found out they'd been going behind his back long before the accident. When he confronted them, not only were they not sorry, but Cora laughed in his face. As if I'd be seen with you now. Those words haunted him for years. They were the reason he'd hidden away. If his high school sweetheart thought of him that way, what would a random stranger think? But hadn't Isabeau proved she was different? From the second she walked into his office, there had been something different about her. The way she looked at him, talked to him, touched him. All of it pointed to her, at least, caring for him. If nothing else, they had a friendship, and he wanted to protect it. Kissing her, developing feelings beyond what was already there, would be a good way to ruin what they had. He needed to back away slowly and not kiss her again. It wasn't what he wanted, but it was what he should do if he wanted to keep her in his life beyond the year. Chapter 17 Touching her fingers to her lips, Izzy paused inside her bedroom door after getting ready. Rowan had kissed her. Not just kissed her, lifting her off her feet in a fairy tale romance kissed her. It was magical and wonderful, and she could live on those kisses. Just thinking about it made her lips tingle and her pulse race. Would he do it again? Oh, she hoped so. What she wouldn't give to feel his lips against hers again. She was falling for him so hard she was going to be broken and bruised by the time she got to the bottom, especially if he didn't feel the same. He had kissed her. Did that mean he felt something for her? She shook her head. That could wait until later. Kelsey would arrive any minute, and it had been forever since they'd seen each other. They'd talked during those couple of months when she'd felt like she could splinter. Kelsey had offered to let her move back into the apartment, but Izzy hadn't wanted to be a burden on her again. Her phone rang, and she answered it. Kelsey! Hey, you're a chipper. I'm excited you get to have Thanksgiving with me and that you finally get to meet Rowan, she said as she opened her door and made her way to the stairs. He's so sweet. Well, how about you let me in, and I will. You're here? Izzy bounded down the steps to the door and flung it open. She ended the call and hugged her friend. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I'm glad to see you too. It's been too long. Kelsey pulled back. Iz, you look great. It's like I'm seeing you for the first time since. Izzy nodded, pulling Kelsey inside and shutting the door. I know. I feel like me again. Kelsey linked her arm in Izzy's, and they walked to the sitting room to the left of the entrance. Ulysses must have opened the drapes, because normally they were shut. Now, Izzy could see the front lawn and the trees that filled the space. Her friend smiled as they sat on the large couch facing the window. I can see that. You're practically glowing. I was really worried when you decided to do this, and talking to you those couple of months, that bothered me too. I'm glad you worked it out with him. This has been good for you. 
I feel safe here, but it's more than that. It's given me a chance to put my energy and thoughts into someone else. I think more than anything that's helped. Rowan hid in this house for 12 years because he was afraid. I don't want to hide from the world, and I don't want him hiding either. Kelsey, he's, the world needs him. His kindness, his gentleness, his smile. Kelsey narrowed her eyes. Izzy knew that look. That was the look Kelsey gave her when Izzy liked someone. We're friends. Right. Because you're not floating on air when you talk about him. Izzy's cheeks warmed. Stop it. And you're blushing? Oh, you've got it bad, Kelsey said and pulled her into a hug. I'm so happy for you. She leaned back. See? There is life after Stephen. He was just one bad guy, and your heart is too big not to share it with someone. I don't know about that. I do. When Stephen attacked you, he did so much more than hurt you. He stole your spirit. But I can see it in your eyes. You've regained what he took, or at least a good bit of it. Kelsey smiled as she dropped her arms from around Izzy. Izzy nodded as she considered Kelsey's words. He's so ugly. I don't know how anyone can be like that and expect someone to care about them. I don't think I'll ever understand why he is the way he is, but I know I can't dwell on it. I have to live in the here and now. And as your not official therapist, I agree, she said and bumped Izzy with her shoulder. Have you told Rowan? No. I think that's a secret I need to keep for now. Is a bow? Rowan called from the hallway. Izzy stood. In here. Rowan walked in, and butterflies fluttered in her stomach. He looked incredible in his dress slacks, button-up, and with his hair pulled back, which surprised her but also tickled her pink. I see your friend has arrived. His voice was tight. Kelsey stood and turned. Hi. For a moment, he stared and then stuck his hand out. It's nice to meet you. She didn't tell you I lost my hand, did she? He shook his head. No, she didn't mention that. My apologies for staring. I wasn't. Kelsey eyed Izzy. She has a habit of doing that. Izzy pulled her shoulders back and held her head high. She's a therapist who works with others who have lost limbs in accidents. It's much easier to talk to someone when you know they understand, and Kelsey is the best. She smiled. Just because you've been through something doesn't mean that one thing has to define you for the rest of your life. Kelsey is perfect just the way she is. Rowan held up his hand. You don't have to convince me. Kelsey, you look lovely. That he used lovely with Kelsey made Izzy's insides turn gooey. She left Kelsey to stand next to him. Red is her color. And teal is yours. You look lovely as well, he said as his jaw clenched. Something was off, but Izzy had no idea what. Maybe he was just nervous to be meeting someone new. She tangled her fingers in his. Thank you. Retta sent me to find you. Lunch is ready. He pulled his hand free and waved them ahead of him. Isabo will show you to the dining room. I'll be there shortly. Izzy caught his arm. You're not coming? He gave her a hard look. No, but tell Retta you can start without me. Oh, okay. You won't be long, will you? She couldn't keep the disappointment out of her voice. Rowan shook head and turned away. No. Not long. What could have happened now? Why was he so upset? And why did it seem that it was directed toward her? She hadn't even spoken to him since that morning. I guess we'll see you in a bit. Yes, he said, a sharpness to his tone. Izzy linked her arm with Kelsey's and looked over her shoulder as they walked to the dining room. 
For the life of her, she couldn't figure out what had him so upset. It was possible he didn't like being caught off guard with Kelsey, but Izzy didn't think anything of her missing hand anymore. She was just Kelsey, and Izzy loved her. Kelsey shot her a glance. Is he okay? I don't know. I think he's upset by something. Why didn't you tell him my hand was missing? He probably thought you were trying to be funny by not mentioning it. Your hand is a small part of you. It's the whole that people should see. Besides, I've known you since grade school. Honestly, I don't even think about it anymore. I love you, and that's all there is to it. Only you would say that. Kelsey chuckled. They reached the dining room, and Kelsey's mouth dropped open. It's huge. I know. Izzy laughed. The first time I saw it, I was blown away. Ulysses and Retta walked in and smiled. I see your friend made it, Ulysses said. Retta shook her hand. It's so good to meet you. It's nice to meet you too, Kelsey replied. Where's Rowan? asked Retta. Izzy shrugged. I don't know. He said he had something to take care of and to tell you to start without him. Ulysses and Retta looked at each other as if they were having an unspoken conversation. I'll go see what's keeping him, Ulysses said. Why don't you ladies go ahead and sit? He smiled and left the room. Retta motioned for Izzy and Kelsey to sit. Take any seat you two want. Where does Rowan typically sit? Izzy asked Retta. Usually, he sits at the head of the table. And you and Ulysses sit on either side? Retta nodded and then sneezed. Are you okay? Izzy asked. I'm fine. The dust was blowing when I went out for cinnamon. I'm sure my allergies are just flaring. Oh, okay. Izzy and Retta took a seat. Kelsey can sit across from me. As Kelsey pulled her chair out and sat, Ulysses returned with Rowan in tow. Did you get finished? Izzy asked Rowan. Yes, with help from my uncle, he ground out as he glared at Ulysses and took his seat. This looks and smells fantastic, Retta. Thank you. Izzy touched Retta's arm. It does, and I bet it tastes even better. Between the turkey, dressing, mashed potatoes, gravy, rolls, and the three pies, there was enough food to feed an army. Yes, it looks amazing, Kelsey said. Then we should eat, Rowan said as he caught Izzy's gaze and held it. There was something in his eyes that she couldn't put a finger on. Was he angry with her? What could she have done since their morning exercise? All through the meal, tension hung in the air. Anytime Izzy caught Rowan's gaze, he'd glare at her and then his lips would tighten into a thin line. What in the world was going on? She wanted to demand answers right that second, but not in front of everyone. This was a conversation they needed to have once they were alone. This time, though, she wasn't going to let him get away with not talking to her. Once they were finished eating, she and Kelsey offered to help with the dishes, but Retta refused to let them. Since they weren't wanted in the kitchen, Izzy took Kelsey outside to show her the garden. She had the same reaction Izzy had when she first saw it. This is incredible, Kelsey said. I know. I love it. Izzy smiled as she looked around and took a deep breath of the fall air. It's so nice out here. When Rowan and I got married, he had what looked like a million lights out here. It was magical. He seemed upset this afternoon. I think springing me on him bothered him. I don't know what was wrong. I can't see why he'd be so upset about that. Your hand is missing. You don't have the plague. Kelsey laughed. We both know people don't always react as they should. I know, but I really don't think it's you. I'll talk with him and find out what's going on. He can be really sensitive. After his accident, his friends were awful to him. It's almost like he's waiting for me to throw him away, 
but I could never do that. I care about him too much. Kelsey lifted an eyebrow. You more than care about him. I think I see the big L in your eyes. Izzy rolled her eyes. No. We're friends. I haven't even told him what happened with Stephen yet. I can't think about that when I've kept something that big from him. But you've kissed him. I could see it in the way you looked at him. Her cheeks burned. Stop it. Kelsey gasped. I was shooting in the dark, but you totally have. I never thought I'd kiss anyone ever again, but he's different. When he touches me, I feel safe and secure. He asked if he could kiss me. Most men would have just done it, but not him, and he doesn't even know what happened. You sure that L word isn't wedging itself in there, whether you want it to or not? Izzy stopped walking and touched her fingers to her mouth. I don't know. Maybe. Kelsey took Izzy's hand in hers. You need to tell him. You need to tell him now before either of you go any further. What happened to you is huge, and it will reverberate throughout your life. I'm not saying you'll never be free of it, but he needs to be aware if something happens. I know, and I want to tell him. But, Kels, what if I tell him and he doesn't want me? I think it would crush me. And that's why you need to tell him now. Before you get your heart broken or break his. Izzy nodded. I know you're right, and I promise I will. Kelsey linked her arm in Izzy's again and pulled her into a walk. As much as Izzy wanted to talk to Rowan, she hadn't realized how desperate she was for Kelsey's companionship. Before she knew it, they'd talked well into the night, and there was no way Izzy had the energy to tell Rowan what happened to her. When she did that, she wanted to be able to tell him all of it without stopping. To get it all out and hope that he didn't hate her for keeping it from him this whole time. It terrified her to think that he might not want anything to do with her once she told him. She certainly wanted him. The Big L, as Kelsey called it, was also frightening. While she was stalked, that word was stripped from her vocabulary. The very idea of being that close to a man again had made her skin crawl, but with Rowan, it wasn't like that at all. He made her smile while just thinking about him. Butterflies when she saw him. Lip-tingling kisses, and they'd only shared three. She could picture spending her life with him. The very idea that the year could end and she'd have to leave made her ache in ways she didn't think possible. But telling him about being stalked and Stephen attacking her was priority now. Kelsey was right. She needed to tell him. The sooner the better, especially since her feelings for him had gone from falling to fallen. Hopefully, he'd understand and give her a chance to show him how much she cared about him. Chapter 18 In the week after Thanksgiving, Rowan hadn't exactly avoided his elbow, but he hadn't gone out of his way to be sociable either, even with her constant insistence that he talk to her. He'd overheard her tell Kelsey she thought he was ugly. Which, granted, was true, but it hurt hearing it come from her lips. He knew she had been lying to him from the beginning. Still, he'd promised not to avoid her ever again, and he was going to keep his word despite what she thought of him. He'd even tolerated her working out with him. Although, instead of enjoying his time with her, he dreaded it. He'd even decided to start waking up earlier so he was done with his workout before she ever knocked on his door from now on. Rowan, his uncle said as he opened his office door. He was dressed in slacks and a button-up. Not unusual for him, but the coat hanging over his arm was. I'm just stopping by to let you know I'm headed out. That merger we've been working on is unraveling, and I want to make sure we have signed contracts before Christmas. I'm headed to New York to personally mediate terms. How convenient. First Retta calls in sick, and now you're leaving. His uncle huffed. Retta is sick. You heard her yesterday. She was barely able to speak. That was true. Retta had sounded terrible. I know, but you both leaving me alone with Isabeau is interesting timing. 
While I don't agree with the arm's length you've decided to put up in regard to Izzy, this has nothing to do with her, and you know it. You said yourself that the deal is fragile and the best way to handle it is to be there in person. Since we both know that won't be you, it has to be me. Rowan exhaled sharply. Fine. When will you be back? I'll stay as long as I have to. Their employees deserve that much, Ulysses said. I'll see you when I get back. All right. He coughed and touched his neck. Are you sick? His uncle asked as he stepped farther into the room. Rowan waved him off. No, just a tickle in my throat. I'm fine. Ulysses eyed him. You don't look fine. He didn't feel fine either, but he'd also not been sleeping well since overhearing Isabeau. Most likely, he was just tired. I am. Get to New York and keep this deal moving in the right direction. His uncle held his gaze a moment and then nodded. See you when I get back, he said, closing the door as he left. What was he going to do now? He and Isabeau were the only two people in the house. There'd be no buffer or anything. He'd have to interact with her, and he didn't want to. He wasn't so much angry with her as he was, disappointed and hurt. He'd begun to believe that she saw him differently. That she didn't care that he was burned. But overhearing what she'd said to Kelsey. It had made her a hypocrite. The woman he'd fallen for had lied to him. How could he take anything she said at face value now? Nothing she said was true, and he knew it. It wasn't like he could change anything, and it was stupid to dwell on it, so he pushed it from his mind. The merger his uncle was flying to New York to oversee was what was important at the moment. Thames and Werner each had thousands of employees, and Rowan felt compelled to keep as many of their jobs as possible, especially this close to Christmas. And for those who would find themselves unemployed, Rowan was working to secure them a reasonable sum as a severance package. A knock came from the door, and then it opened. Isabeau peeked her head in. It's late, and I noticed you haven't eaten. Are you hungry? No, he wasn't hungry, and now that he thought about it, he was actually a little sick to his stomach. I had something earlier. You must have missed me while I was in the kitchen. She stepped just inside the door and twisted her fingers in her shirt. I was wondering if we could talk. I. Talk? Not right now. Not when he felt sick. He knew his temper would be short, and he didn't want to hurt her, no matter what she thought of him. No. I can't talk right now. I'm in the middle of something that needs all my focus. Once I'm done, I might have time, but people's jobs are dependent on me finding a solution to this, and I can't be distracted at the moment. Oh, she said softly. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you weren't angry with me. That I hadn't done something to upset you. Whatever it is, I'm sorry. Isabeau, please. Not right now. She nodded, and just before she shut the door, she said, I guess I'll see you later. Good night. Her voice held a tinge of sadness to it, and he hated it. Not that he should care, especially when he knew how she truly felt. Why did he have to overhear her? Why couldn't he have walked in at any other time? Then again, did he want to be blissfully unaware of what she really thought of him, or did he want to know the truth? No, he'd rather know the truth and where he stood with her. Hot, tired, and feeling none too great, he pushed away from the desk and stood. What he needed at the moment was a good night's sleep. He shuffled out of his office, walking through the empty house to his room, and collapsed on the bed. Normally, he'd change clothes, but with the last few nights of restless sleep combined with how terrible he felt, he just didn't care. The next morning, he groaned as his alarm went off. He'd tossed most of the night. Not just thinking about Isabeau, but he'd been too warm too. He took his time showering and dressed in pajamas. Something he never did. 
Just because he worked out of his office didn't mean he could spend his life dressing like he stayed home. Only, for today, it would have to work. The shower had helped, but he still felt off, though he was still convinced it was because he'd not slept well in days. Exercising was definitely off his morning list. As he opened his door to leave, Isabo stopped in front of him mid-knock, dressed in her exercise clothing. Hey. Hi, I'm not exercising today. And the longer he stood there, the more concrete that decision became. He felt awful. She stepped closer. You're sick. I'm fine, and even if I am sick, I can take care of myself. He hadn't meant it to come out so harsh, but he didn't want her taking care of him. Her shoulders sagged. Would you please just tell me what I did? You, you didn't do anything. I just want to be left owl, his stomach flipped, and he held his midsection. It flipped again, and he ran to the bathroom before he could throw up on her shoes. He barely made it to the toilet before he emptied the contents of his stomach. He caught sight of Isabeau as she entered, and he tried to wave her out before he threw up again. I don't need you here. Well, unless you plan to physically remove me, tough. I'm staying. She walked to his linen closet, pulled out a washcloth, and wet it in the sink. He sighed as the cool cloth touched his forehead, and he closed his eyes. Just as he was about to thank her, he threw up again and continued to throw up until his body trembled. All the while, he expected Isabeau to grow tired and leave. Instead, she held his hair back, kept the cloth cold, and held it against his forehead when he wasn't throwing up. Sitting back on his heels, he tried to catch his breath, waiting to see if he was done. He couldn't remember the last time he'd thrown up so violently. His stomach cramped, and the muscles ached. Whatever was making him feel so terrible, he was pretty sure he'd caught it from Retta. He hoped she was okay. Once he could hold a conversation without wanting to throw up, he'd call and make sure. He groaned. You don't have to stay. I think I'm done. I know I don't. I want to. You're sick. I believe that was in the vows we exchanged. He shot her a glance. I'm not holding you to them. He rocked back on his heels, leaned against the wall, and rested his head against it. Do you think you can make it to your bed? Not yet. He slid sideways, and his head landed on Isabeau's shoulder. Sorry, he said as he tried to push himself into an upright position. Come here. She maneuvered him until she was cradling him against her chest as she leaned her back against the wall. You're running a high fever. Should we call your doctor? No, it's just a bug. I'm sure I'll be fine in just a little bit. If you aren't feeling better by this afternoon, we're calling a doctor. Deal? All right. He held his hand in front of his mouth. I doubt you want my breath hitting you in the face. Bad breath isn't going to run me off. She slipped her fingers into his hair and pushed it back from his face. Now, you've got nowhere to go and nothing to do. Will you tell me what I did to make you so upset? This was why he didn't want her to stay. Now he was trapped with her. I don't feel good, and I don't want to talk about it right now. Well, tough. I do. Tell me. He closed his eyes to keep from seeing the pity. I overheard you talking to Kelsey. Calling me ugly. Isabeau chuckled, and his eyes popped open. You're laughing? She smiled down at him. One, it's rude to eavesdrop, and two, I wasn't talking about you. What? She wasn't talking about him? Then who was she talking about? I was talking about someone else. Why would you think I was talking about you? He shrugged. Because, because I'm stupid. She sighed. I've wanted to tell you something, but each time I think I've gathered enough courage, you do something stupid like avoid me or get angry and refuse to tell me why. You want me to trust you, but it's a two-way street. 
Talk about nailed. He'd wanted to gain her trust, but she was right, he kept doing stupid things. You can tell me now. After you've not spoken to me in a week. She shook her head. I don't want to tell you when you're not feeling well. But I swear I wasn't talking about you, you silly man. There is nothing ugly about you. You mean the world to me, and I would never hurt you like that. I'm sorry. Isabeau touched her cool fingertips to his cheek. Please start talking to me instead of hiding. This could have been cleared up Thanksgiving Day if you just talked to me. He nodded. I know. I'll try to be better. And he would try. He drew in a long breath. I should have known you wouldn't say anything like that. I'm sorry I didn't trust your character. Thank you, she said and smiled. He should have spoken to her. Should have believed in her as a person to not say anything like that and hurt him. Why was it so easy to believe? Whatever the answer, it would have to wait until his head stopped swimming. Until then, even sick, he'd happily lie in her arms and soak in her comfort. Chapter 19 We've waited hours, and you still don't feel good. I don't think this is just a bug. It's time to call a doctor, Izzy said as she sat beside Rowan, placing the newly wet cloth on his forehead. That was the deal, remember? He'd thrown up all morning, and she'd barely been able to help him make it to the bed before he collapsed. She'd looked for a thermometer and had been unable to find one, but she knew hot skin when she felt it, and his was blistering. The only good thing to come out of it was finding out why he was so upset with her. She'd been talking about Stephen, and he'd overheard her and automatically assumed she was speaking about him. If only he wasn't sick, she could tell him everything. He nodded. I know, he whispered, sucking in a deep breath and touching his throat. It's in my phone. Dr. Liggett. He does house calls. I haven't had to use him in years. He covered his mouth and coughed until his face turned red. My throat is raw, he rasped. Izzy grabbed the phone from the nightstand and made a quick call. It would be at least two hours before the doctor was able to get to Rowan, but that was better than nothing. Okay, he's on his way, but it'll take a little while. In the meantime, we need to work on keeping that fever down. I just want to feel better so you'll tell me whatever it is you need to tell me. You may not like me very much afterward. I think that's what's kept me from telling you. I, well, that's for another time. She plucked the rag off his forehead and re-wet it again. Instead of replacing it, she wiped his face, re-wet it again, and pressed it against his neck. He took her hand in his. I doubt very much that you could tell me anything that could change how I feel about you. Well, get well, and we'll see. She smiled, hoping that was true. Do you think you could handle ice chips or something to drink? Your fever is so high that you're going to get dehydrated. No, his eyes slid shut, and she let her gaze roam over his face. Never had she wanted to take something from someone as badly as she wanted to take this from him. He was so miserable, and she loved him so much. Her heart pounded, and her breath caught. Loved him. That was a huge word with depth and meaning and forever attached to it, at least for her it was. She'd never used that word before. Oh, she'd thought it, but she'd never said it to anyone before. But when she thought of those things, Rowan was who came to mind. She could see spending her life loving him. She'd never thought she'd be able to feel that way about anyone, but her heart swelled when she pictured the two of them growing old together. The idea gave her peace. The only worry she had was telling him about Stephen and what had happened to her last year. There was so much he needed to know, and it hurt to think Rowan wouldn't understand. What if he blamed her? Her friends did. Well, except Kelsey, and she'd quickly closed down the notion that Izzy was somehow at fault. It had gone a long way in helping her press charges and file a restraining order. She brought her attention back to Rowan and swept his hair back from his face. 
Never had she been struck with such an overwhelming sense of love for someone. Over the next few hours, he would wake a moment and then drift back off. By the time the doctor arrived, well after the initial two-hour time frame, Izzy was more than just a little worried. She ushered him into Rowan's room and stood back as the doctor examined him. Well, good news. I don't think it's the flu, but the tests I'm running will confirm it. Right now, I'm thinking it's strep, the doctor said. The thermometer beeped, and he checked it. 103. Not great, but not the worst I've seen today. She chewed her thumb as she watched the doctor. It's not as bad as I thought it was. No, and you've done a great job keeping it down. He checked the tests sitting on the nightstand. It's strep, which will make him feel terrible for a few days, but it's much easier to get over than the flu. I guess that's good. I feel horrible, Rowan groaned. The doctor nodded. And you will for a few days. I'm going to give you an antibiotic shot and follow with a round of azithromycin. The shot will give the oral antibiotics a boost and get you feeling better pretty quick. Dr. Liggett pulled out a syringe and filled it, and Rowan looked away as it pierced his skin. As the doctor pulled it out, he pressed a cotton ball to the spot and then stuck a bandage on it. When he was finished, he put all his things away and stood. Make sure he stays in bed. If he's anything like his father, the second he feels okay, he'll try to be back to work, he said, looking at Izzy. She smiled and cast her gaze to Rowan. I'll make sure he rests and stays hydrated. I'll call in this prescription and tell them it needs to be delivered. Thank you. He nodded. I'll see myself out. Rowan, feel better. Rowan nodded. Thank you. She waited until the doctor left the room and then sat beside him. You hear that? No getting out of bed until you've taken every drop of that medicine. I heard, and it's good to know that I'm not, in fact, actually dying, because it sure feels like it. He chuckled and began coughing. When he stopped, he pressed his hand against his throat. I have to stop doing that. It hurts. Izzy leaned over him and braced her hand on the bed. I'm sorry you feel so bad. I shouldn't have let you stay. You've been exposed to it. I don't want you to be miserable like this. She grinned. It's not like you could have made me leave. His eyebrows knitted together. I could have. Was that before or after you barely made it to the bed before passing out earlier today? His lips quirked up in a small smile. You're kicking a man when he's down. Well, you're in bed. Your covers are very cushy. The fall will feel like nothing. She laughed. His smile stretched a little wider, but the tired look in his eyes grew. That's not funny. Then why are you smiling? To save your feelings. Even sick, he was sweet and charismatic. She loved his smile and his dark eyes and all the wonderful things that made him Rowan. You can't turn off the charm, can you? Can't turn off what you don't have, he said as his eyes closed. Izzy laughed. You have charm in spades, Mr. Masters. With his eyes still closed, he covered her hand with his. I've found I'm not only slightly addicted to Sour Patch Kids and crave them, but also your smile as well. Addicted, huh? Only all the time. He paused and opened his eyes a fraction. Have I told you how lovely you look today? She rolled her eyes. I'm wearing a tattered shirt and cut off sweats. He was fighting to stay awake as he caught her gaze and held it. In an instant, the mood shifted and became serious. I'm really sorry I was so stupid, again. I should have known you were better than that. I should have talked to you. I guess, it's easier to believe the bad than it is the good. She could understand that. It had taken her months to believe that Stephen was finally going to jail, and even months after that, she kept waiting for the call that he'd found a way out again. 
that his father had been able to pull strings and help him out of jail. And with Rowan's history, she could see it being so easy to believe she was being two-faced. She could almost picture a young Rowan, hesitant to throw a party, being convinced that people would love him no matter what, only to find out that wasn't true. He'd been badly hurt by it, and with that as his only experience, it wouldn't be a stretch that she'd treat him the same way. It's easier to believe the bad because believing the good gives us hope, and that's dangerous, Izzy said. It gives us the chance to get hurt, and no one wants to be hurt. I suspect you're right. He yawned. I'm wondering if that shot was supposed to make me sleepy. I think it's your body trying to fight off this bug. Rest. I'll be here when you wake up. He exhaled softly and nodded. Thank you for taking care of me, even though I was a jerk. His eyes closed, and in seconds he was breathing evenly. At his worst, he was still better than anyone she'd ever met. Enough so that he changed her too. He taught her that she didn't want to squirrel away her life because of what someone else did. How much different would his life be if he had friends who'd loved him beyond just skin deep? What would his life look like if he let her love him for the next 12 years and beyond? Would he still hide in this house? Would she be okay with that? Maybe she needed to find the answer to that before she told him how she felt. Perhaps it was better to tell him what happened with Stephen first, and then she could delve into what life could be like with Rowan. Chapter 20 Rowan rubbed his face with his hands as he leaned his back against the headboard. For the last three days, Isabeau had hovered over him, keeping him planted in his bed and making him drink until he thought he'd float away. Although he hated to admit it, he enjoyed having her attention. The shot had helped him, and backed up with more antibiotics, he was feeling more like himself every day. I feel much better, and I need a shower. I can smell myself, which means you have to be close to holding your nose when you come near me. The doctor said to stay in bed until all the medicine was gone, and that's what you're going to do. Just because you feel okay doesn't mean you are. Do you always follow orders so strictly? She nodded. Yes. Well, I don't think he meant I couldn't bathe. Just that I couldn't work. That I needed to continue resting. And he did need to bathe. If nothing else, he'd feel a hundred times better with a simple shower. He felt disgusting. She crossed her arms over her chest as she stared down at him. Give me your word that you won't take a shower and then try to go to work. Just because you're clean doesn't mean you're well enough to work yet. He crossed his finger over his heart. I promise. I will take a shower and come directly back to bed. If he was honest, it was the first time since he'd first thrown up that he felt like he could even stand up long enough to shower. Holding his gaze, her lips were set in a thin line, as if she was debating whether he was telling the truth or not. Okay, but if you try to go to work, you'll have to get past me. As he braced his hand on the headboard, he stood and towered over her. Oh, I will, he asked, unable to keep from smiling. She narrowed her eyes, but he could see she was fighting back a grin. Yes. I'm small. Not weak. And incredibly cute when her mind was made up. Well, you've certainly terrified me. I'll come right back. As her cheeks turned pink, she rolled her eyes and smiled. You think you can smooth-talk me? You're wrong. I have no charm. You have buckets of it, and you know it. He took a deep breath. This was an argument they'd been having since day one. She insisted he was charming, and there was nothing about him even remotely so. I have no idea what you're talking about. With a huff, she pointed in the direction of his bathroom. Go take your shower before I change my mind. Rowan grinned. Yes, ma'am. He strode to the bathroom and shut the door, and after he peeled off his clothes, he stepped into the shower. The second the hot water hit his skin, he let out a long breath. It was amazing how a little water could help him feel human again. 
As it poured over him, he let his mind wander to the last few days. If Isabeau had wanted to, she could have left him to fend for himself, but she hadn't. The only time she'd left his side was to change out of her exercise clothing. She'd even brought clothes with her so she could shower in his bathroom, just so she could stay close in case he needed her. What he wanted more than anything was to know whatever it was she was keeping from him. They'd agreed, though, that she'd tell him the second he'd taken his last dose of antibiotics, and that was still another four days away. Between now and then, his imagination as to what it could be was going to drive him insane. The only thing he'd pieced together so far was that she'd been frightened and hurt by someone, but the extent of it was unknown. He was absolutely positive that her hospital stay had something to do with it too. The way she spoke of it, though, like he'd change his mind about her, did give him pause. He couldn't fathom anything she could ever do to change how much he cared about her. She'd upended his life and given him hope that he might not spend it alone. Once he finished showering, he dried off and quickly dressed. When he opened the door, his gaze landed directly on a pile of linens by the door. Izzy lifted her gaze and smiled. I changed your bedding. I figured if you showered, you wouldn't want to get back into a bed with gross sheets. As he towel dried his hair, he walked to her and stopped. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you feel better? Immensely. Although, tired. Guess I won't have to wrestle you to keep you in bed. Her eyes widened as her cheeks turned deep crimson, and she looked away. I didn't mean that how it sounded. Rowan chuckled. I know what you meant. Isabeau covered her mouth with her hand and yawned. I'm sleepy. He didn't doubt that she was. She'd slept in a chair next to his bed the whole time, and he knew it wasn't the most comfortable way to rest. What he had noticed was that she hadn't had nightmares the last few days. Any time he woke up in the middle of the night, she had been resting peacefully. It was an interesting thing to learn. You could lie down and sleep. This bed is plenty big enough. When I was first burned, I had difficulty sleeping, so I had it custom made. For some reason, changing directions helped me sleep. It's wide enough and long enough that you'll be in a completely different atmosphere than me. Her gaze landed on the bed. It's very tempting. Stop being tempted and just lie down. She hesitated less than a second before climbing on and sighing as she stretched out. Oh my goodness. I need a custom-made bed in my life. Rowan lay down a couple feet away and faced her. The company came here three different times to let me test it before I signed off on the design. It's incredible. Tired eyes locked with his. It's so squishy and comfortable. Do you still hurt from the accident? No. My skin can be sensitive, but that's it. She chewed her lips a moment. Did you lose hearing in your left ear? It was so strange to have a frank discussion about his accident, and with anyone else, he would have shrunk away, but he felt peace while talking to her. No. She scooted closer, leaving roughly six inches of space, and curled on her side with her arm under her head. Did you keep your hair long before the accident? No, but after, well, after the disastrous party, I grew it out. I felt it helped by not only giving myself a buffer against people, but for them as well. She reached out and ran her fingertips along his cheek. My dad was a firefighter. My parents were older when they had me, and before I was born, he was caught in a house fire, trying to rescue someone. He was horribly burned. Much worse than you. What? Your father was burned? Why didn't you tell me? It never felt like there was a right time, and because I didn't want you to use that as an excuse for the way I see you. She pulled back her hand. He was horribly disfigured. So much so that he looked nothing like the man I saw in pictures from before he was burned. When I was 13, I asked my mom why she stayed married to my dad. Rowan tried to keep his breathing steady. What did she say? She said, 
Your father was good-looking when I met him, and I got butterflies every time I saw him, but I didn't marry him because of that. I married him because of his generous heart, his selfless nature, and the way he loved me. If the only thing you see when you look at someone is their skin, you need to look harder. I never saw my dad or other people the same way after that conversation. He swallowed the lump in his throat. I can see how that would change someone. My parents were married over 20 years. When my dad died, my mom died only a year later. She died of heart failure, but I think it was mostly because her heart was broken. She loved my dad until her last breath. There was such sadness in her voice that his heart broke for her. I'm sorry. I know how that feels. Isabeau shrugged and gave him a small smile. It's okay. I still miss them, but it gets better as time passes. Minutes ticked by as they lay there. He'd been so stupid to let silly things dictate his actions. Things that could have been fixed so easily with a simple adult conversation. He cared about her, and she deserved someone she could trust with her heart. How could he ask something of her that he wasn't willing to do himself? Isabeau, I need to apologize to you for the childish way I've behaved since you got here. I let my fears and insecurities lead me by the nose and allowed misunderstandings to dictate my actions. You gave me no reason to doubt the person you are, and yet I chose knee-jerk reactions instead of coming to you like a man. I know, and I understand. He cupped her cheek. I've made and broken so many promises to you, and I hesitate to make another, but I will do my best to be a different person from now on. I'm sorry it took me so long to gain a little wisdom. He touched his lips to her forehead and then leaned back. But all I have is my word, and I know it's not worth much. She wrapped a lock of his hair around her finger. I'll trust you, if you'll trust me. I trust you. Her eyes locked with his. And I believe you. Rowan brushed her hair over her shoulder, and she closed the little bit of distance left, her nose nearly touching his, and wrapped her arm around his waist. I'm so comfortable. I feel like I'm floating, she murmured, and a breath later, she was asleep. Her strawberry blonde hair spilled over his arm like a waterfall, and the texture was like silk against his skin. It was a sight he thought he'd never see, a woman in his bed, snuggled flush against him. And an incredibly sweet and caring one at that. Not only was she kind and caring, but she was so beyond lovely that it was hard to find the right word. He loved that her freckles disappeared into her hairline. How her eyes sparkled when she was excited. The smile she'd flash when she called him charming, which he was not, but it made him happy that she thought so. All of her made all of him happy, and he loved her with a depth he never thought possible. His mouth dropped open as he realized the thought that had just sipped in his mind. Loved. He could only speculate that this was what it felt like, and the sensation should have scared him witless. But he wasn't panicked or frightened at all. The idea of loving her and growing old with her filled him with such peace that it was better than just being alive. It was fully living and wanting to be beside her, whether it was in this home or in the middle of Times Square. Now he just needed enough courage to risk telling her. It wasn't like his heart wasn't already on the line. If she rejected him, it would hurt just as much as keeping it from her and watching her leave. He was invested. In her. In them. In a future he thought he'd never have and he wanted her with every ounce of his being. Whatever she told him, however awful it might be, would not change how much he loved her. And if it was what he was beginning to suspect was true, the man who hurt her would be dealing with him. That man would never touch her again, and Rowan would make sure of it. Chapter 21 Izzy ran her palms down her jeans as she walked with Rowan in the garden. He'd taken his last dose of medicine that morning and was back to normal, thankfully, and she'd given her word that she'd tell him what happened. Not that it was easy to tell him, but because she knew she needed to if there was any chance that they could be together. She stopped and tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. 
It was so hard to talk about, and she was more nervous than anything because she loved Rowan and wanted him to love her. Just tell me. Start from the beginning, Rowan said softly. I'm so nervous. I've only ever talked to Kelsey about it. Everyone else blamed me, and when my life became so messy, they kind of dropped me. He pushed her hair over her shoulder. I think we've established that true friends don't abandon you when you need them the most. No, they don't, but, she cast her gaze down. You have my solemn promise that no matter what you say, it will not change anything. I will not toss you aside just because your life isn't tied with a bow. Lifting her gaze to his, she nodded. I was stalked. Okay. His name was Stephen Welch, and he was a therapy patient of mine two years ago. He'd been injured after pulling some stupid stunt that involved jumping off a cliff into the water. He crushed his right leg and arm and needed help getting mobility back. She took a deep breath, trying to calm herself so she didn't talk too fast. At first, he was really sweet. Always had a smile, didn't complain when I pushed him, and we'd talk. It was innocent. Nothing I hadn't done with other patients. It helped make it easier for them to see me as a friend and know that I was there to make their lives better. Rowan nodded. For five months, he came in three times a week. Her heart pounded in her chest as she recalled how it started. It had been almost a year since the attack, and she still felt nauseous when she thought about it. It's okay. You don't need to rush. Take your time. Rowan smiled. Why don't we sit over there? He motioned to a bench surrounded by a trellis and ivy. Okay. They walked to it, and he sat. Izzy was such a bundle of nerves that she remained standing. Let me finish, and then I'll sit. Whatever you need. Rowan stretched his arm across the back of the bench and looked at her expectantly, waiting for her to continue. Izzy fidgeted with her fingers and then began again. About two months into his therapy, he began showing up when we didn't have a scheduled time. He'd tell me he mixed up the days or whatnot, and at first, I believed him. It was flattering, and it didn't feel threatening. Sometimes, he'd show up twice in a single day. He began bringing flowers and chocolates and all sorts of gifts. Then once his therapy was over, he continued to show up. Her breath caught, and she balled her fist in her shirt. Rowan quietly waited while she pulled herself back together. She put a shaky hand to her mouth and swallowed hard. He found out where I lived, and he began showing up there. That's when it became scary. A man just showing up at my home. It was my parents' house that I'd inherited. All hours of the night, he'd call or ring my doorbell. Leave gifts overnight. It progressively got worse, but I thought it was my fault. That I'd somehow let him on. I tried to explain that I wasn't interested and that I was sorry if I ever gave that impression. That I never meant to hurt him. She rubbed the tears from her eyes. Rowan leaned forward and caught her hand. You're doing great, and if you need to take a minute, it's okay. She nodded. Rowan really was the sweetest man she'd ever met. I appreciate that, but I need to get it out. Okay, he said as he kept a hold on her hand. It only got worse. He would show up all over the place. Dinner with friends, the movies, coffee shop, everywhere and my friends couldn't understand why I let it go so long. Why I hadn't filed a restraining order the second it started, but I didn't know what was happening. Oh, is a bow. It wasn't your fault. None of it was. The relief she felt at hearing that made her appreciate Rowan even more. My friends thought it was. Everyone except Kelsey. Did you file a restraining order? Oh yes, I filed one, and I'd press charges when he'd break it. Which he did a lot. He'd get booked and then released. He'd back off a second, just long enough to make sure he could get away with it. But he did end up going to jail, right? 
You can't disregard an order like that. Yes, but it wasn't that simple. I'd taken self-defense classes because he'd become violent. The last time he was arrested for violating the restraining order, he threatened me. I thought for sure there was no way for him to get out of it, but he did. Tears flowed hot and fast, and she slowly sank to the bench. Rowan put his arm around her and pulled her close, dropping a kiss on the top of her head. Instead of telling her it was okay or not to cry, he just held her while she sobbed. It was without a doubt the most comforting thing she'd experienced since being attacked. No one was telling her to control her emotions or fight against them. Rowan was letting her cry, and the release felt freeing. Not that Kelsey hadn't allowed her the same leeway, but having someone besides Kelsey give her the okay to be hurt was wonderful. He wasn't asking anything of her. He wasn't blaming her. And he wasn't throwing her away, which gave her hope that he could handle the last part of her ordeal. When she'd cried what she thought had to be her last tear, she continued. I didn't know that his father was a city councilman. They had different last names. His dad pulled favors and got him released. Only no one warned me. She leaned back and looked up at Rowan. Somehow, he'd gotten past my security system and he waited for me to come home from work. He was hiding in my pantry. I didn't hear the door open. I woke up in the hospital several days later. Kelsey said it's my mind working to protect me. I have no memory of what happened. Rowan's lips parted, and his eyes turned glassy. I have no words. Kelsey won't tell me what happened, and to be honest, I'm not sure I want to know. I already have horrible nightmares that stem from what happened before the attack. She did testify about my condition at his trial. I testified as well, but remotely. I couldn't handle being in the same room with him. Did someone find you or... My neighbors are the ones who called the police. They heard me scream. He pulled her into a hug, cupping the back of her head. As long as I live, he will never put another finger on you. No matter what I have to do. She wrapped her arms around him and melted into him. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. I should have told you from the beginning, but... Rowan pulled back. No. You shouldn't have. I did nothing to deserve to know. I still haven't, but I'm glad you trust me enough to tell me. On the tip of her tongue. Telling him she loved him was on the very tip of her tongue, but he needed a moment to process everything. She wanted to tell him when she was sure he understood that being with her wouldn't be easy. There would be times that she struggled. Not that she didn't think he would struggle too, but she knew his story, and she had plenty of time to accept it. As hard as it was to tell him, though, dredging up all those memories and feelings of helplessness, she still felt peace while being in Rowan's arms. He hugged her to him again and kissed the side of her face. You are incredible, and I owe you an apology for thinking you could never understand what I've been through. I am in awe of your strength. Strong? When she felt so weak. You're just as strong. No, I'm not. I hid from the world just because a few people were mean to me. You went through something no one should ever have to endure, and you not only faced life, but you charged through it. She leaned back and shook her head. No, that's not entirely true. It wasn't until I started working here that I felt normal. Her phone rang, stopped and then rang again. It chirped as a second call came through. What was going on that her phone was so lit up? She pulled it out of her pocket. Let me take this, and we'll finish our talk, okay? With a nod, he released her, and she stood. Before taking a step, she bent down and pressed her lips to his. Thank you, she said and quickly walked away as the phone rang again. She put it to her ear. Hello? Ms. Daniels? The Portland DA? Hi, Mrs. Ortranto. The woman paused a moment. I'm sorry, Ms. Daniels, 
but something has happened. I just got word of it. An icy chill rippled through Izzy. What? First, are you somewhere safe? Somewhere other than your friend's apartment? Yes, why? Only she had a sinking suspicion she knew why. A few days ago, Stephen Welch was being transferred from the county jail. There was a mix-up, and somehow he was released. Released? How could that have been a mix-up? We've launched an investigation into that. At this point, it looks as though his father may have had something to do with it. Police have taken him into custody. Tears clouded her vision, and she gulped air. Dee Dee, does he know where I live? That I moved? I called you as soon as I got word. Detectives have interrogated his father, and we think he took a bus to Texas. She turned and caught Rowan's gaze. She'd told him everything. He thought Stephen was in jail. That, like her, the whole thing was over. What would he say when he found out it wasn't? Would he want her then? What if he didn't? Thoughts swirled in Izzy's mind, and her head swam. Every breath was a fight. Her heart was hammering against her ribs. Ms. Daniels? The attorney's voice sounded so far away. Then Rowan called her name, and in what felt like slow motion, the phone slipped from her hand. Her body trembled, her knees wobbled, and before she hit the ground, darkness pulled her under. Chapter 22 Rowan didn't think he could move so fast. He'd known the moment she caught his gaze that something was off, and he was already walking in her direction when her face drained of color and her knees buckled. He'd caught her just before she touched the grass, lifting her limp body into his arms. Isabeau, he said as he palmed her face. A voice filtered from her phone, and holding her with one arm, he scooped it off the ground. Hello? He sandwiched it between his shoulder and ear, walked to the bench, and sat down with his elbow laid across his lap. Where is Ms. Daniels? Whatever you said to her scared her. She passed out, he said as he held her to him. Who are you? What's going on? I'm sorry, I'm not able to dis. I'm her husband. For the first time, it didn't feel odd rolling off his tongue. He liked the sound of it, the way it felt to be attached to her. The woman on the other line paused a moment. Her husband? She said nothing of being married. It was recent. I'm sorry, but without some sort of documentation, I can't give out information. Rowan growled. If she's in danger, I need to know. That's the only way I can protect her. Who are you? My name is Marianne Ortranto. I'm the Multnomah County District Attorney. Okay, now what's going on? Has she told you anything? A man named Stephen Welch stalked and nearly killed her. The woman took a deep breath. A few days ago, he was released. We believe he's headed to Texas now. Does her friend Kelsey know? She does. Does she have somewhere safe to go? We told her to pack a bag and stay somewhere until we caught him again. I need to go so I can phone Kelsey and let her know she's welcome to stay at my home. I have a gated entrance, and I'll be calling for more security as soon as I know Kelsey is safe. The woman sighed. Please tell Izzy I'm sorry. Rowan wanted to tell the woman to save her apologies and just do her job, but instead, he said, I will. He hung up and found Kelsey's number, hoping she'd answer. Izzy! Oh, thank goodness. Did they call you? No, this is Rowan. Where is Isabeau? Panic laced the words. She's okay. She collapsed after finding out about Stephen. Oh, I can't imagine how frightened she is. Rowan pulled Isabeau closer. Are you safe? I'm getting a bag together now and trying to find a place to go. You are welcome to stay here with Isabeau. In fact, I'd really like to insist you stay here. 
I don't want this man to hurt Izabo again, and if something happened to you, she'd be devastated. Oh, thank you. I had no idea where to go that wouldn't put someone else in danger. I'll be there as soon as I can. Would you like me to send a car for you? I think I'm okay to drive. It'll probably be best if he thinks I'm gone so that he doesn't hurt anyone. Rowan nodded. All right, but if you change your mind or feel like you're being followed, call me. I'll have someone come get you. Okay, thank you again. Rowan nodded as he looked down at his elbow, you're welcome, he said and ended the call. He slipped his arm under her legs and stood, debating the entire way into the house whether he should take her to her bedroom or his. Since the beginning, she'd never seemed comfortable in her room. By the time he reached the stairs, he'd made his choice and took her to his room, hoping it would help her feel safe. Either way, he'd be staying with her until her stalker was found and behind bars again. When he reached his room, he gently laid her on the bed and then turned his focus to acquiring a security company to guard the property. He punched a number on his phone and waited. Rowan Masters, Pamela Williams said. To what do I owe the pleasure? He'd known her since he was a kid. His father and her husband were fraternity brothers in college. His father was the one who had kept the secret about the large fortune James Williams had amassed. He was also the one to guide Pamela toward using the money to help people after James was killed in a drive-by shooting. She'd taken the money and started the Guardian Group with a group of ex-army rangers. They took on cases that regular law enforcement couldn't. From what Rowan understood, the elite team she'd assembled was the best, and at the moment, that's exactly what he needed. I need your help. Well, you and your team. Give me the details, and I'll see what I can do. He started from the beginning, telling her everything he knew. I need security. This man has already tried to kill her once. He will not get a second chance. I will pay you whatever you need to make sure this property is secure and Isabeau feels safe. Pamela laughed. You know I don't need the money. Rowan knew. He didn't know how much wealth she had, but he knew it was enough to make a difference in the lives of everyday people. I know, but in the future, should you need anything, I'll owe you. I don't deal in favors, love. If I need your help, I'll ask, but I'm not doing this to gain obligation. Rowan smiled. Thanks. Who all will be at the house? Me, Isabeau, and her friend Kelsey. Retta will be in tomorrow. Ulysses is in New York at the moment. Pamela chuckled. I might have to come just to see Retta. I'm sure she'd like that. I'll have a team there in 30. Do you have a room they can call base until this guy is caught? They can have my office. I'll send out a notice tonight that I've had a family emergency and will be out until further notice. That'll work. Thank you. See you soon, Rowan. He ended the call and then dialed his uncle to let him know what was going on. They decided that Ulysses would stay in New York for the time being. During the call, his phone chirped, alerting him to Kelsey's arrival at the gate. He gave her entrance, and on his way to fetch her at the front door, he ended his call with his uncle. As she stepped inside, she said, Thank you so much for this. I can't. He held up his hand. Isabeau loves you. That's all I need. He took her bag and motioned for her to follow him. She's in my room. When I got the call, I knew she wasn't going to take it well. No one would. Rowan shot her a glance. No one should have to. There's no excuse for him being released. Allowing his father to manipulate the system for as long as he did shows gross incompetence. They'll be lucky if I don't sue the county. She grinned. I really like you. Well, he did appreciate that. Her friend liking him was a point in his favor. I care about her, and I'll do everything I can to make sure she stays safe, he said as they entered his room. 
Kelsey quickly walked to Isabeau and sat beside her. Oh, she's white as a sheet. I barely caught her before she hit the ground. Some of her color has actually come back. With her gaze on Isabeau, Kelsey asked, has she told you the whole story? She did today. Which was a good thing, otherwise, the DA would have told me nothing. Kelsey pulled her gaze from Isabeau, it's been horrible. He's terrorized her for over two years now. I've got a private security company on the way. It shouldn't be long before they're here. Do you think you were followed? Her mouth dropped. I don't think so. I was in such a hurry to get here that I didn't pay attention. He hadn't meant to stress her. It'll be fine. I was only asking because I'm sure the security team will ask me. I know this company, and they're thorough. Kelsey's shoulders rounded. Okay. Silence stretched a moment before Rowan said, Isabeau doesn't remember what happened. I know. She pulled her phone from her pocket, touched the screen a few times, and then handed it to him. This is how she looked when I walked into her hospital room. I'd taken the first flight out, so it hadn't been long when I saw her. Rowan covered his mouth with his hand as he took in the picture. His heart broke. His Isabeau was so beaten she was unrecognizable. So many tubes and wires. Stephen turned off her alarm system before she got home from work and hid in the pantry, waiting for her. He hit her from behind, beat her, and then stabbed her multiple times. I don't even know how she survived. Taking his gaze from the phone, he handed it back to Kelsey. The image wasn't something he'd soon forget. If he tries to touch her again, I'll kill him. I've never cried so hard in my life. Izzy is the sweetest, kindest person I've ever known. And she's always been like that. She pushed Isabeau's hair from her face and took her hand. I moved to Portland after my accident. Most kids avoided me like I was diseased. Not Izzy. She just marched right up and declared us friends. She never treated me different. Yes, I'm keenly aware of how special she is. His phone chirped, and he straightened as he allowed them entrance. That's security. I'm going to get them settled in, and I'll be back shortly. If either of you need anything at all, just let me know. Kelsey stood and walked to him. I can't thank you enough. For her, me. She said you were sweet. His cheeks burned. Yes, well, I'll be back shortly. He took one last look at his elbow and left the room, quickly reaching the door and opening it to a group of men that made him glad he was the one asking for the help. Pamela's team? That's us, the guy in front said. Mind if we come in and get things set up? Rowan waved them in. Follow me. He took them to his office, and they filed in. You're free to use this space, or any space, for that matter. Thanks. The same guy shook his hand. I'm Noah Wolf. He pointed as he introduced the rest of the team. That's Ryder, Gunner, Isaiah, Mason, and Colby. Each of the men shook Rowan's hand as Noah introduced them. Thank you for helping, Rowan said. Will more be coming? Noah grinned. We're all you'll need. I believe you. Ryder tapped Noah. I'm going to get started on the cameras. Noah nodded. Is the target upstairs? Her name is Isabeau, and yes, she's upstairs with her friend Kelsey. Right now, there are only three of us here. I told Pamela that Retta, my, he paused. Retta wasn't just some cook. This man needed to know she was just as important as the two women upstairs. Mother, will be in tomorrow. Kelsey just arrived, didn't she? Rowan lifted an eyebrow. Yes. Noah grinned. There's steam still coming from the engine. Do you think she was followed? I asked. 
She said she didn't think so. Okay. Good to know. We'll get to work, Noah said. Thank you. Rowan left his office. It wasn't until he was at the base of the stairs that he realized he hadn't hidden from those men. When had he become comfortable in his own skin? When was the last time he even thought about hiding his face? It had been weeks. Even after overhearing what he thought was Isabo calling him ugly, he hadn't hidden from her, not his face, at least. He smiled as he took the stairs two at a time. Yeah, he could definitely say she'd upended his world, his thoughts, and more than anything, he hoped she would upend his future, because he wanted nothing more than to spend his life with her. As he walked into his room, his gaze landed on Isabo, who was now awake and sitting up. Are you okay? Her smile hit all the right notes for him. Yes, I'm okay. She took Kelsey's hand. Thank you so much for letting her come stay here. I thought you'd feel better if she was here, and this way I can keep her safe too. Kelsey patted her hand. Do you mind if I make us some tea? She asked Rowan. My home is yours. Feel free to go wherever and use whatever you need. Thank you, she said and glanced at Isabo. He didn't miss the sly smile she shot in Isabo's direction. I'll be right back. She stood and left the room. Rowan waited until she was gone and then took a seat next to Isabo. Your color has returned. That's a good sign. Kelsey told me you hired a security firm? She pushed up and kneeled on the bed. I have a friend of the family who works with a group of men who provide security for people in need. I called her and told her what was going on. That's why I wasn't here when you woke up. I was downstairs talking to them. She hugged him around the neck. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'll never be able to say it enough. You just have. Isabeau leaned back and took his face in her hands. You mean the absolute world to me, Rowan Masters. I just want you to feel safe. I do. She touched her lips to his and pulled back slightly. Just as she leaned in again, Kelsey said, Hey, I'm back. Isabeau held his gaze. This isn't over. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt something? Kelsey asked. Rowan stood. No, but I think this is my cue to leave. Isabeau's cheeks bloomed apple red as she smiled. Do you want us to go to my room? He shook his head. No, you stay here. You don't like that other room. Where will you sleep? I'll be fine. Enjoy visiting with Kelsey. If you need me, I'll be downstairs. Okay. With one last look, he strode out of the room with a smile on his face. He loved her. It was desperate and deep, and nothing less than forever would work anymore. Chapter 23 Kelsey tipped her head in the direction Rowan went and smiled as she sat next to Izzy on the bed, setting the tray on the nightstand. He is sweet. Izzy nodded. Without a doubt, the sweetest man I've ever known. And you're in love with him. Totally and hopelessly. She caught her bottom lip between her teeth. I haven't told him yet. I was going to tell him once he had a chance to process the fact that I had a stalker and I was attacked, but now that Stephen is free again, I don't know if I should. At least, not until he's recaptured. Maybe that won't take long. Rowan seemed to have a lot of faith in the security team he hired. It's almost Christmas. I don't want this hanging over me anymore. I want this man caught and imprisoned. Izzy held out her hand. Could I see your phone? Why? Just trust me. Inside, Izzy was a nervous wreck. She was about to do something she thought she'd never have the courage to do. Look at the aftermath of Stephen's attack on her. Kelsey handed her the phone, and Izzy quickly found the photograph. She put her fingers to her lips. 
The person lying in the hospital bed in no way looked like her, but she knew it was. It's not okay that he did this. Did you look at that picture? Izzy nodded. Yes, because I needed to confront what happened. What Stephen has done to me is wrong. It wasn't my fault that he did this. None of it was, and I'm tired of feeling shame for something I had no control over. Kelsey smiled. What brought this about? Rowan called me courageous, but I'm not. My scars are hidden behind clothing. The emotional and mental damage is something no one can see. I've used that anonymity to make myself seem fearless when I'm not. I want to be the courageous person he thinks I am. I want my peace back, and I want Rowan. The only way I'll have that is by taking control. That's really good, Izzy. I think that when he's caught again, if you tell the judge how he's personally impacted your life, letting them see you and put more than just a face with what happened, but a whole person, that it will help you and influence how long they sentence Stephen. Izzy stood. I want to help catch him. What? I want to help. I have an idea. It's scary, but I think it'll work. Izzy waved for Kelsey to follow her. I need to talk to that security team. Kelsey followed her out of the room. I have a feeling this idea isn't going to go over well. Probably not, but I'll risk it. They reached the office and found the door open. Two men were sitting at Rowan's desk while one was talking with Rowan, who stood in the middle of the room with his arms crossed over his chest. He turned his head just as she and Kelsey walked in. Is everything okay? He asked. Yeah, everything's fine, but I think I might have a way to catch Stephen. Rowan dropped his arms and motioned to the man by him. This is Noah Wolf. He stepped aside and waved to the two behind his desk. That's Ryder and Colby. The two men waved and continued with whatever they were working on. Noah stuck out his hand. It's nice to meet you. As Izzy shook his hand, she said, this is my friend Kelsey. He shook her hand and smiled. Two beautiful women in the same house. He winked and glanced at Rowan. No wonder you don't like leaving your home. Kelsey turned six shades of red, and Izzy couldn't help but laugh. Noah was incredibly attractive. The two behind the desk weren't bad either. One had movie star looks, and the other looked like he just jogged in from the beach. Rowan cleared his throat. What idea did you have? He was going to hate it, and if she was honest, if the roles were reversed, she'd feel the same way. Use me as bait. Rowan's eyes widened. Absolutely not. He's already tried to kill you. Hear me out. Rowan shook his head. No. I will not let you put yourself in danger. How could she make him understand? I have lived with crippling fear since this whole thing started. I have been afraid of my own shadow. Afraid to even get in my car because I didn't know if that man would be hiding in it. I can't live like that anymore. Actually, it's a great idea, Noah said. If we're there, she'll be completely safe. Rowan pinched the bridge of his nose. It's not safe. Noah touched his arm. But she needs this. I've worked with women who've been assaulted like this. They need to have the ability to take their power back. Exactly, Izzy said. I want my power back. I want my face to be the last thing he sees before being shoved in a police car, knowing it was me who did it. Rowan looked from Noah to Izzy and back. We'd all be there? More than likely, he thinks she's staying at my apartment. That's where her mail was being forwarded before she moved here, Kelsey said. I could act like I was leaving for a conference or something and let him think she's alone. Noah nodded. That's a great idea. A contained space. We'll all be close, and the second he makes an appearance, we'll grab him. List the things that could go wrong, Rowan said. 
Any number of things can go wrong, but if we plan well, even if something does go wrong, she'll be safe, Noah said, maintaining eye contact with Rowan. I will not allow anything to happen to her. See? This is the best chance I have of being free of him, Izzy said. Rowan nodded, but she could sense his unease. I don't like it, but this is your call, and I'll support you. Are you sure you want to do this? Izzy nodded. Yes. All right. We'll get working on it, Noah said. Kelsey, would you mind giving us a rundown of your apartment complex? I'll do anything I can to help, Kelsey replied. Izzy took Rowan's hand. Can we talk in private a minute? I think that's a great idea. They left the office, shutting the door behind them, and stopped at the stairs. Izzy turned to him. I know you hate it, and I'm sorry. Rowan cupped her cheek. I hate it because the idea of you being in the same room with him terrifies me. I know, but it's almost Christmas. I want to drink hot chocolate, sit by the fire, and not have to worry that somewhere in Dallas is a man who wants to hurt me. I know. Well, I don't know, but I'm trying to understand. Izzy smiled. It's only because of you that I've got this opportunity. I think you would have found a way, regardless of me being in the picture. She hugged him around the neck, and he took her by the waist, lifting her off the ground. Pulling back, she slipped her fingers in his hair. You know what I did notice? What? You weren't hiding from those men. I'm so proud of you. You think that I'm sunshine, but you don't realize just how bright you make things for me. He chuckled. I think I have you to thank for that. He was everything she wanted. His laugh, the sparkle in his eyes, the way he cared for her. She brushed the back of her hand along his cheek and touched her lips to his. No, she didn't just want him, she needed him. His heart was beautiful. Stephen had taken that word and twisted it, and Rowan had given it back to her. Squeezing her tighter, he deepened the kiss. His kisses were so sweet they made time stand still. Her heart pounded in her ears as he left her lips and trailed feathery kisses along her jaw. She threaded her fingers through his hair, and goosebumps lined her arms. A soft moan escaped from her as his lips parted and brushed across her neck, stopping at her ear, and he pressed a kiss just behind it. Uh, guys, I think we have something worked out. I thought you'd want to know, Noah called from the office. We'll be right there, Rowan replied, his voice low and unsteady. Izzy smiled as their eyes locked. People are bound and determined to interrupt us. I'd say that was a good and proper kiss. She shook her head. Not nearly as good and proper as I want it to be. He plunged his hand into her hair and kissed her again. Pulling back slightly, he said, as much as I'd like to continue this, I think they're waiting on us. Pressing light kisses on his lips, she nodded. I think they are too. Let's get this monster locked up. Izzy smiled. She couldn't agree more. Getting Stephen out of her life for good was what she needed. Even more, she needed Rowan. She'd face whatever fears and doubts she had in order to be with him. No, she'd do anything and everything to be with him. Chapter 24 Over the course of the next week, Noah and his team moved into the apartment next door to Kelsey's. The occupants were eager to help once they understood the situation. Noah explained to Rowan, Isabeau, Kelsey, and Retta that it was better to move slow so that if Stephen was watching the complex, he wouldn't get suspicious and flee. Retta had been visibly shaken when she returned and found out what had happened. She hated the idea of Isabeau being alone as much as Rowan did, which is why he was now pacing the small apartment next door to the one Isabeau called home prior to moving into his. He hated feeling so confined, but he was also unwilling to leave her alone, and next door was as much space as he was willing to give. Can you hear me? Isabo's voice filtered through the listening device hidden in the apartment. They'd set up those and sensors to notify them if or when he broke in. 
Today Isabo had made a big show of moving back in, hoping to entice the creep to make a move. Rowan hated it. He supported her desire to face her fear, to gain her power back, and confront her attacker, but he hated that he wasn't with her. He stopped stone still in the middle of the room, ready to present an idea he'd been working on. What if Stephen thought she was dating someone? Would he be more inclined to try something? While Noah and his team were setting up in the apartment, Rowan had planned a date for Isabeau in the hopes that they'd agree with him. If they said no, no loss, but he didn't want to be in a lurch, trying to figure out what to do if they went with it. He'd even purchased a Maserati two days prior, just so he could take her somewhere. With him not leaving his home in so long, he had no need for a car, but if she decided to stay with him, he planned to make dates with her a habit. He was thankful Texas allowed online driver's license renewal and that he'd had the frame of mind to use it. Gunner bobbed his head. Based on his personality profile, I don't think he'd be able to resist. I suspect the second you left, he'd be trying to get to her. He considers her his property. The idea that another man would touch her would drive him insane. But you guys are here. Once I drop her off, the instant he shows, you'll grab him, right? They'd tried to ease his worry, but it wasn't something words could squelch. He loved her, and the very thought that she might get hurt tore him to pieces. Then a better thought hit him. What if I waited and doubled back around? I don't like the idea of not being there when he's taken into custody. No one nodded. You could do that. You'd need to be really careful. We don't want to spook him. If you're going to do that, Gunnar said, you need to park far enough away that it looks like you've left. He stood and grabbed a bag that he handed to Rowan as he stopped next to him. These binoculars will allow you to watch from a safe distance. Rowan hadn't expected that from Gunner. The man struck him as someone who didn't take things seriously too often. Thank you. My sister was stalled briefly. I know how you feel. Gunner shot Noah a glance. These guys helped me. I appreciate it, Rowan said. Gunner and I will follow you to the restaurant too. That way, if he tries something, we'll be there. I like that idea even better. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a date to attend. He left the apartment and stopped in front of his elbow's door. Nervous energy bubbled through him. He couldn't remember the last date he went on, and this one meant more to him than just some date. He knocked twice before it opened. His elbow smiled. Rowan, hey. What's going on? I thought we'd go on a date. Her lips parted, and the corners tipped up. A date? His heart skipped a beat. What if she said no? He hadn't thought of that until just that moment. If you would do me the honor. I'm not really dressed for a date, but I'd love to. So she thought. Her little white jeans fit her like a glove, and her off-the-shoulder flower print blouse showed off her soft skin. Her hair bounced around her shoulders in soft waves that fell to her collarbone. She couldn't have been more stunning. You look lovely, Isabeau, as always. Her smile stretched wider. Okay. She tangled her fingers in his, shut the door, and locked it. Is there something you're craving? he asked. Other than time with you? No. The answer caught him off guard, and his cheeks heated. And you call me charming. Because you are. I was only answering a question. Charmingly. She giggled, and it was like bubbles in a champagne glass. So, where are we going? You'll see, he said and winked. When they got to his car, Isabo gasped. This looks brand new. Rowan smiled. It is. I haven't had a desire to drive a car since the accident. Let's just say I have a renewed interest. He held her door, and she got in. He jogged around the front and slipped into the driver's seat. He'd been a nervous wreck the first time he sat behind the wheel. 
It had been so long since he'd held a steering wheel in his hands. It brought back painful memories, but he was also learning that he couldn't continue to live in the past. When they arrived at the restaurant, he handed the keys to a valet, and Isabeau linked arms with him as they walked in. Once they were seated in a quaint booth located in the back of the restaurant, she turned to him and said, I'm underdressed for this place. No, you're not. You are dressed perfectly. I'm in jeans and a simple blouse. All these other women are in fancy dresses. Laughter erupted from a small group sitting not too far away, and Rowan glanced over, catching one of the women staring. Or at least it felt like she was. Isabeau covered his hand with hers, recapturing his attention. It was a small gesture with immense relief. Just keep your focus here, she said and smiled. Nodding, he took her chin in his fingers. All of them wished they were as lovely as you. You are perfect just as you are. Isabeau moved in like she was about to kiss him when a waiter stopped at their table to take their drink order. Isabeau muttered something about interruptions under her breath, and it took work not to chuckle. As soon as the man left, she circled her arms around his neck and kissed him. Man, he wanted to tell her he loved her. He wanted it so badly he ached, but not when she was dealing with so much already. Plus, he didn't want to add to that the weight of a commitment and thoughts of forever. The waiter returned with their drinks and left again. He didn't take our orders, Isabeau said. Rowan smiled. Because I called ahead and spoke to the chef. He's making us something special. Kelsey said your favorite meal is seafood risotto and your favorite dessert is strawberry pie. Her mouth dropped open. You did this all for me? I know you've been stressed, and I wanted to give you an hour or two of enjoyment. Tears pooled in her eyes. He tilted his head as his heart sank. Did I do something wrong? We don't have to stay. She shook her head. No, this couldn't be more perfect, but how will I ever be able to do something like this for you? Why would she think she needed to? Isabeau, haven't you realized already? You do every time you walk in the room. Before she could respond, the waiter stopped at their table again with their food. Once he left, she palmed the spot over her heart. I don't think I can express just how overwhelmed I am right now. You are the sweetest, kindest, most thoughtful man I've ever met. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. Only because you're here. Her eyes twinkled, and the smile she gave him was soft and sweet and tempting to taste. Dinner was filled with stolen glances, sweet smiles, and laughter. The conversation topics ranged from her favorite painting to his favorite baseball team. At first, when he was planning the date, he'd been a little worried about being in public, but then he realized it was stupid. And if anyone was staring, he didn't care anymore. He was burned in a car accident. There was nothing he could do to change it and not living was wasting his life. It made him wonder why he'd allowed people to take away his confidence and his ability to enjoy life. But he had to admit, he wouldn't change a thing. He'd met a woman he could see himself loving for the rest of his life. Twelve years was nothing if it meant he got to be with her. Chapter 25 Isabeau didn't want dinner to end. Rowan had planned something so special for her, and he'd even stepped out of his comfort zone to do it. Until tonight, she didn't think she could love him anymore, but somehow, he'd managed it. If you'll excuse me, I need to use the restroom. But this conversation isn't over. I haven't had this much fun in so long. Rowan stood and took her hand as she stood. The night doesn't end until you say it does. How about never? I hope you're ready to stay up late. He chuckled. I'll be here when you get back. As she walked to the bathroom, she covered her cheek with her hand. She'd smiled so much that her face hurt. After she finished using the restroom, she started to unlock the stall, just as she heard the door open and a faint click as it shut. Immediately, she knew without a doubt Stephen had found her. 
Is he? he said in a sing-song voice. For a second, fear gripped her. This man had caused her immeasurable grief, and she was done being a victim. She pulled out her phone and quickly sent a text to Rowan. As she opened the stall door, she stepped out and found Stephen standing near the bathroom door. His blonde hair was stringy, his eyes were bloodshot, and his clothing reeked of alcohol. There's my girl. I am not your girl. But we're destined to be together. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught the bathroom door opening and Noah quietly easing inside. Before he could pounce, she held her hand out. Izzy needed to say a few things to Stephen, and now that she knew for a fact she was safe, she wasn't going to hold back. She crossed her arms over her chest. You tried to kill me. That's not love. He raked his hand through his hair. That was a mistake. I'm sorry. I was just so mad, and you filed that restraining order and hurt me. Hurt you? She pinched her lips together. Her blood boiled. Have you lived in fear for over a year? Do you have scars where someone stabbed you three times? Did you have your cheeks surgically remodeled because you'd been beaten so badly that it was crushed? I did. You hurt me. You terrorized me. Made me afraid to leave my home. Cost me my job and my license. Took my dignity. Stole my peace. I have nightmares because of you. But, honey. Don't you ever call me that. I am not your honey, darling, or beautiful. Nothing to you. And the next time you're in front of a judge, I'm going to be there. I'm going to tell them what you did to me. I won't allow you to steal anything else from me. Stephen clenched his fists. We'll see about that. You're mine and always will be. Isabeau, Rowan said as he pushed through the door. Stephen started toward her, and Noah moved to grab him. No, Noah, Izzy called out. I'm ready for him this time. Rushing the rest of the distance, Stephen grabbed her by the wrist. It was like a switch went off in her. She pulled away from him, grabbed his hand and twisted his arm behind his back, and smashed his face into the wall. He stumbled back and fell to the floor. As he tried to stand, she slammed the flat of her hand into his nose and heard it break. If you get up, the next time I hit you, it won't be your face. She lifted her gaze and found Noah, Gunner, and Rowan standing there. A moment passed, and then all three clapped. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you beat down a creep, Noah said. The sound of a ripping shirt filtered through the room as Gunner yanked him off the floor. Come on, I have some friends who'd like a word with you. Noah followed Gunner out, leaving them alone. Rowan walked to her, wrapped his arms around her, and picked her up. We heard everything. Gunner recorded the whole thing. You were fantastic. She tilted her head. You did? He nodded. Yeah, didn't you mean to have your phone on speaker? No. I didn't even realize I'd called you after I sent the text. Well, you did. You were so great. Do you feel any different? She circled her arms around his neck. I feel, she wanted to say, I feel wonderful because I can tell you I love you, but she didn't want to tell him that in the middle of the women's bathroom. She wanted it to be as romantic a setting as Rowan had given her. I feel free. I got to tell him all the things I've wanted to say. With one last tight hug, Rowan set her feet on the floor. He's not getting out this time. I know. You won't let him. He committed a crime in Texas, and I have some very powerful friends. By the time he returns to Portland, he'll wish he'd never stepped foot in this bathroom. A policeman stopped at the entrance of the bathroom. If you wouldn't mind stepping outside, we have some questions for you, and we need to get your statement. Izzy nodded. Okay. She was free. 
she was free to live, to love, to walk down the street without fear. And as soon as things settled down, she was going to tell Rowan that she wanted to live with him and love on him for the rest of her life. Chapter 26 With a yawn, Rowan shuffled down the stairs and into the kitchen. Now that Stephen was in jail, Noah and his team were gone, and Isabeau had moved her things back to his house. At night, after Retta and Ulysses left, it was just him and Isabeau again. The last week and a half had been so different with her. Something had changed, and she'd been quiet since Stephen's arrest. He'd taken to sleeping in of the extra bedrooms so she could stay in his room. The stiff mattress had given him a new appreciation for his bed. It was middle of the night on Christmas Eve, and he'd been tossing and turning since he'd lain down. He'd come to the kitchen, thinking maybe some hot tea would help him sleep. Hi, Isabeau said as she sat on a stool. He startled and took a deep breath. I wasn't expecting you to be awake. I couldn't sleep. Obviously, I can't either. He smiled. She nodded. I can sleep in my room so you can have your bed back. You will not, but I'm wondering why you're having trouble sleeping. Are you having nightmares? No, she pulled her bottom lip in between her teeth, and it looked as though a war was raging in her. I have to tell you something. He'd yet to confess his feelings for her because he wanted to give her time and space to deal with the emotions from the night at the restaurant without adding anything extra to her plate. Okay. I wanted to plan something special and wonderful, but I can't wait anymore. She slipped off the stool and walked to him. Casting her gaze to the floor, she said, I've been racking my brain, trying to think of something to get you for Christmas. You don't. I do, though, and this is going to sound arrogant, maybe, but I'd like, I'd like to give you me. She lifted her head, and their eyes locked. I'm in love with you. I've wanted to tell you, but... She loved him? She loved him. His pulse rocketed. Isabeau loved him. He wrapped his arms around her, lifted her off the ground, and kissed her. I love you. I've been waiting for the right time to tell you. I love you with all my heart. I'd like to rip that contract to shreds. I don't want you to ever leave. Circling her arms around his neck, she brushed her lips across his. I have never loved anyone as much as I love you. Every piece of me loves every inch of you, inside and out. I think I would fall apart if I had to leave you. I couldn't ask for a better Christmas present. As she touched her lips to his again, she palmed the side of his face. This is what he wanted, and the only one he wanted to hold forever was her. She was soft and sweet, and he loved her more than anything. He pressed light kisses from one freckled cheek to the other, breathing her in as he did. She buried her hands in his hair, brought his lips back to her, and instantly deepened the kiss. He tightened his hold on her and enjoyed the comfort of her warmth. The sweetness of her lips. The soft moans coming from her as she kissed him. When it felt like his lungs would explode, she broke the kiss and nuzzled his neck. I'm sleeping in a very large, very comfortable bed, and I was wondering if my husband might like to join me. She leaned back. I love you, Rowan. I love you so much. And I love you, my lovely, sunshine-filled Isabeau. Epilogue. One Christmas later. Isabeau giggled as Rowan hugged her from behind, pressing a kiss to her neck. Oh, that tickles. I know, but I can't resist that laugh. Rowan had planned something special and secret, and she just finished getting dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, which seemed odd for something special. The past year with him had been incredible, and every day she loved him more. His smile, his sweetness. Every day she fell deeper in love with him. He'd held her hand in the courtroom as new charges were brought against Stephen. She told the judge how he'd made her life a living nightmare. How badly she'd hurt after he'd attacked her, and that he turned her childhood home into a place she struggled to look at. 
The best part was the judge who lit into him Judge Judy style. She'd sentenced him for as long as was legally possible. His father was also recalled and found himself not only in trouble for helping his son escape, but he was charged as an accessory to stalking. And while she still struggled at times, Rowan was patient and kind, giving her the time and support she needed to deal with the trauma she'd suffered. She'd also joined a support group. It helped to talk about what happened with other women who'd shared a similar experience. Overall, the time they'd spent together had helped them heal, and Izzy couldn't imagine being happier. Will you please tell me what you have planned? She asked. Rowan shook his head. You'll see soon enough. She turned and palmed his chest. I can see by the twinkle in your eye that you are positively ecstatic. Because it's not just for you. What does that mean? His laughter filled their bedroom. You'll just have to wait and see. All right, I'm ready. Rowan's laughter died, and he took her face in his hands. You are absolutely lovely today. I've told you, you can use beautiful. No, lovely fits you. It's light and graceful. He touched his lips to hers. And you are lovelier today than you were yesterday. Take me to this surprise, Mr. Masters. He dropped his hands from her face and tangled his fingers in hers. They left their bedroom, walked through the house, and out onto the veranda where Retta and Ulysses were waiting for them. Her mouth dropped open. Kids were running everywhere. The children from the hospital burn unit? Rowan had taken to visiting them regularly. In the past year, he'd grown so comfortable that he'd cut his hair, and he didn't shy away from anyone any longer. He used what happened to himself to help others, and it made her love him even more. Then she gasped when she saw several of the ladies from her support group. And my support group? I wanted the kids to have a special Christmas. But I also wanted the ladies from your group to be able to enjoy their Christmas without fear. They know my home is gated and no one is getting in. That's when she noticed Noah and his team standing guard around the garden. You hired them just for my group? I wanted them to feel safe. Izzy hugged him around the neck and kissed him. To her, Rowan Masters was beautiful inside and out. Thank you. No, thank you. You gave me something I thought I'd never have. A life with someone. And you helped me fulfill my mother and father's dream of filling this house with children. He smiled. She cupped his cheek. Maybe next year we could add one more. I would love that. He winked. Me too. A home filled with their children made her heart skip a beat. Merry Christmas, Rowan. Merry Christmas, my love. This has been Marrying the Beast. Written by Bree Livingston. Copyright 2023.